Star Wars The Clone Wars The Movie is the opening introduction to the massively popular Star Wars The Clone Wars TV show, but the film setting up the show is trash, it's garbage, and after watching it myself, I can see why. Now since this is an animated movie, I'm going to change up my segments quite a bit. Story, cinematography slash editing, and music slash sound are going to stay the same. But the middle segment will be replaced with animation, slash visual design, slash models, and acting will be replaced with voice acting. Now that I've clarified this, let's get on with the review. Well, this movie is a classic representation of mistakes TV showrunners make when making a movie. This didn't have to be a movie. Because this feels like a four episode arc cut together to give the illusion that it's a movie. I'll talk about this later in the next segment, but how it relates to story is that it doesn't feel like a movie plot wise. This story should have just been split into episodes on TV. But I'm figuring Dave Filoni wanted to maximize profits, so he released the first four episodes as a movie in theaters. Everyone was desperate for Star Wars on the big screen again after all. This is set between the underrated Attack of the Clones and the masterpiece that is Revenge of the Sith. And of course, this feels like a side quest if anything, which is further reason why this should have been made into a TV show arc. I think something more important should have been the plot for this movie. Let me describe it. First, there's the narration, which is an alternative way to give us a recap, but I'm not a fan of it. I would prefer a short but sweet title crawl. The show is presented like American propaganda during World War II. It's very on the nose with its inspirations. Basically, Jabba the Hutt's son has been kidnapped by an unknown party, and both the Republic and the Separatists are aiming him to bring him back to Jabba to form an alliance. Right off the bat, I don't like how Jabba is depicted. Jabba the Hutt is a greedy slug. It doesn't seem in character for him to have a son, or at least one that he cares about. Because I think based on how he's portrayed in Return of the Jedi, it would have been better if Jabba neglects and treats his son like dog shit, and he only had him because he needs an heir to his criminal empire. Which is also why he physically and verbally abuses him, to toughen him up like his father before him. Kingpin from Marvel Comics killed his son and then told his wife that they'll make another one. That's what I feel Jabba would do in this case. I mean, he is an organism that can reproduce by himself, so right off the bat I don't buy this overarching plot. Jabba would just make a new one. Now there is something I must address. Characters change a lot over the years, that's why Master Yoda in the prequels was different from the original trilogy Yoda, so one may argue that the same would happen to Jabba, but I doubt this. Jabba the Hutt was in the exact same position he was in Return of the Jedi, head of a criminal empire where playing dirty is where he's going to be on top. He's not in a different position than what he was in Return of the Jedi, so I want to make my case that this seems out of character for Jabba to care about his son. So we get the request from Jabba to Chancellor Palpatine, and Mace Windu says that there's only two Jedi they can spare for this, Anakin and Obi-Wan, something I don't buy because as it seems, both he and Yoda could do it. I don't understand why they can't do this. There's also a mention of a Padawan learning coming down to Christophus, so feast your eyes with spectacle. Well, it's nice to have more of the Clone Wars, as it should be with an introduction movie to a show about it. The Battle of Christophus does not tie into the plot about Jabba's son being kidnapped, which goes to show how this should have just been an episode arc, because I feel like I'm having my time wasted. I also don't particularly like Anakin and how he's portrayed in this movie, and the following show. Given how it's less than three months after Attack of the Clones, I think they matured Anakin way too quickly. There's no way he went from this, to this in the span of three months. However, it's not as bad as it could have been, because we still got the arrogance there still, but it feels this is what he would be like midway through the Clone Wars, not a short while after Attack of the Clones. It's here where we are introduced to General Kenobi, who is portrayed a lot better than Anakin, because it feels like an Obi-Wan short off Attack of the Clones, so that's a plus. And then there's the fan favorite Captain Rex. I remember a kid in primary school who was obsessed with Captain Rex. He had a toy gun modeled after his and everything, and he'd play Star Wars at recess and lunch. Even back then, Rex felt out of place somehow, and I turned out to be right. 
This film is the start of retcons and contradictions with previous Clone Wars material. Clone Wars was given its own spot on most of the expanded universe, so Dave Filoni could do whatever the hell he wanted. It's important to judge this from a lore perspective, because Star Wars had a unified continuity, and Clone Wars screws it all up. It's not a good idea to ignore the Clone Wars series that came out five years prior, which was clearly the inspiration for this, given the art style. But that'll be a discussion for a later segment. Point is, it might have been harder for Disney to decanonize the expanded universe if this show retained continuity. Although Disney probably would have scrapped that show along with everything else too. But that's the start of it. After the spectacle, the story and the continuity breaks itself once more when we are introduced to Ahsoka, a character with the worst introduction in the Lucas era. Ahsoka, no matter how good she may have become later down the line, is a Star Wars afterthought. It's clear Anakin did not and never did have an apprentice, thus why George didn't like her. I never did get attached for Ahsoka. She feels like Filoni's wet dream character. When I first saw that Anakin had an apprentice, my first thought was, wait, why wasn't Ahsoka in Revenge of the Sith? Surely she would have accompanied Anakin or Kenobi wherever they went. Maybe she was doing something else, I thought. But hey, you need to wait till the whole show till season 7 to get that answer. Which is why giving Anakin an apprentice is a problem. Starkiller makes story sense. Ahsoka does not. And I have wondered what would happen if Ahsoka and Starkiller met actually. Of course, Anakin isn't interested in taking an apprentice. Which seems in character, but he changes his mind later. I really also don't like their interactions at the start. It's corny. So the Separatists pull up a shield generator, and they have to find a way to deactivate it. So Anakin comes up with the stupidest idea to hide under a crate to the shield generator. This is so contrived. Also, we have Obi-Wan stall the Separatist general by breaking common ethics of war, by fake surrendering. This is too much for me. Obi-Wan is arrogant, but it doesn't feel right to have Obi-Wan commit something like this, because surrender is a very serious rule of war, and if Obi-Wan abuses it, he'll never be allowed to surrender again. The Separatists won't let him. Or at least I hope. I can't remember the whole show, so we might have done it again, which would make things worse. Oh, so it reminds me of The Last Jedi, where Poe Dameron is clearly wasting General Hux's time. And of course, it's too late. Anakin and Ahsoka deactivate the shields, and the Republic wins. We're finally back to the Jabba's son stuff. Of course, they find a lead to a son on a jungle planet named Teth to where they continue fighting the droid army. So eventually, we get to the top after an admittingly cool sequence of a walker going on a 90 degree slope. We are also introduced to Asajj Ventress, who as we'll see in the following show, is retconned from her previous counterpart, and no mention of Dooku's dark acolytes. So we finally get to Jabba's son, who of course is an infant. And Anakin says exactly what I'm thinking when he tells Ahsoka that the Hut will most likely be a disgusting crime lord one day. So Ahsoka takes Rodder the Hutlet, and they try to escape. We've also got this part where Ventress captures the clones and mind tricks Rex to contact Anakin, but of course, Rex doesn't address him in a way that Anakin realizes that it's Ventress trying to trick him. It's also here where Obi-Wan's role is scaled back. Now he's just a side character, which I mean, he should have had more to do at this point, but he's only there for the first act. They find a ship and fly off, and afterwards, they try to fly into a hangar, but it doesn't work. So Anakin and Ahsoka go into hyperspace. It's here where we have the first of many of Ventress's failures. That's another thing with the show in general. It's very akin to what Disney does with Star Wars. Simplify things and have the bad guys lose all the time. Anyways, they crash land on Tatooine and they go on a long hike. And then out of nowhere, we are introduced to Padme Amidala. Since Dooku deceived Jabba into thinking the Jedi killed his son, Padme decides to investigate when she goes to Zero the Hut's place, who's currently on Coruscant. Why the Huts have influence on Coruscant makes no sense to me. I thought the Huts operated out of Republic jurisdiction. 
whatever. So Padme decides to confront Zero and she gets captured, but she escapes and spies on Zero, who, as it turns out, conspired with Count Dooku to kidnap Jabba's son. So anyways, Padme contacts C-3PO to send help whenever her captors discover her communicator. C-3PO ends up sending a clone force to arrest Zero. Back on Anakin and Ahsoka's side, they decide to split up, so they fool Dooku in a way that breaks law. Anakin and Dooku should not have met again until Revenge of the Sith. The fight is okay, I guess. And it of course ends with Anakin taking Dooku's speeder. So Ahsoka and Anakin manage to get Jabba's son back to them, with Padme proving their innocence, and thus, the day is saved and the Republic is victorious. The end. Yeah, I'm disappointed. My grievances come down to continuity issues and how simplified things are, among other reasons. This feels like Disney stuff without it being Disney stuff, because this was made in the late Lucas era. I'm going to give 1.5 points to the story. It's much easier for an animated movie to put its camera in any direction but it isn't used to its full advantage. There aren't a lot of times we observe the world, and the directing style is nothing like George Lucas, although I will say that they try with the colors, although the lighting is really off a lot of the time. Since this is no Pixar movie, the budget obviously wasn't on the lighting, or anything else. I noticed once that the lighting on Cody or Rex was really off. As for shots, I don't like it. I've said previously that any moment in Revenge of the Sith can be turned into a picture frame. That's not the case here. I really don't like the cinematography and it's not utilized to its full advantage given how an animated movie can put the camera anywhere. I don't like how this film is so different to the style of George Lucas, despite being made in his territory. As for editing, of course it's not edited like a movie, it's structured like an episode arc cobbled together, which is so lazy. I think whoever wrote the script needed a co-writer for just this one movie where they would sit down and actually structure it like a movie instead of a TV show. If we pretend this was an episode arc on TV, this would simply make the editing okay, maybe? It's hard to tell how it would have been since it wasn't edited that way, but it's bound to be better than what we got. I'm going to give 2.5 points to the cinematography slash editing. The animation is so disappointing. Transformers the movie as an example amped up the animation for once since it was a big deal to put it out in theaters. This doesn't. First impressions matter a lot, and this movie can't look more impressive than season 1 of the show itself? Disappointing. The animation needed some more refining. The movement isn't realistic enough. This feels like an art project made by an ambitious animation student, rather than a professional work by a branch of Lucasfilm. I've loosely studied what makes good animation, and basically it's a sense of authenticity. There has to be believability to the movement depending on how it's done, otherwise it's not good animation. There's a clear difference between this and a well animated movie like any Pixar film. For example, the humor doesn't hit the mark because of the underwhelming and kind of bland expressions the characters make. Let's take Hello There as an example. Not only was there a lot of build up leading to the punchline, but Erwin McGregor's expression really sells it. The animation, to put it short, feels a lot like a director DVD animated movie. Let's talk visual design. I have mostly negative thoughts. Since this is an animated movie, you have more freedom on how an animated movie looks. I like a lot of the set designs, it's better than the sequel trilogy, but it still doesn't hit the mark on how Lucas created and presented planets. Plus, Tatooine and Coruscant don't exactly look like environments from the films. While I think the art design is very ambitious, it doesn't work very well. This ties into the models, but the designs of the characters and set pieces are very cartoony in nature. This was clearly inspired by the original 2003 Clone Wars show, but there's a problem with adapting this art style. Bringing a 2D design show to 3D generally doesn't work very well, while vice versa, there's no problem. In this case, it just makes the movie look wrong. Plus, there's inconsistencies of how things are designed. Lasers are straight out of the films, and I notice that planets are just art paintings, and effects like fire and explosions are very realistic in nature, and it makes the whole thing look inconsistent. Honestly, this should have been 2D with the intended art style. I'm going to give two points to this segment. Matt Lanta voices Anakin Skywalker. This guy almost hits the mark, but he just doesn't sound enough like Hayden Christensen. 
I'm not sure if the guy in the original Clone Wars show would be a good fit either. Hayden Christensen played the role in the film so well that whoever the voice acting replacement is would really need to channel Anakin's angry nature. And I've seen Matt Lander try to be angry as Anakin, but it wasn't convincing. Matt Lanter is passable otherwise. Ashley Eckstein is Ahsoka Tano. An adult voicing a younger character is nothing new. And Ashley does just that. Her voice is really annoying and I cringed out just listening to her for the first half until I got used to her voice again. I'm not really sure how you can make this voice not annoying given her character, but the solution's out there. Find it. James Arnold Taylor is Obi-Wan Kenobi. This guy is a great impressionist. He gets Ewan McGregor's mannerisms right, and while you can tell it's not the same guy, he's the perfect replacement for voice work. Taylor recreates the charm Ewan McGregor has. Of course, Ewan McGregor is more quotable with delivery, but if The Clone Wars was more mainstream to the casual fan, it would be memed all day. D. Bradley Baker voices every clone character. I don't like this guy's impression. He tries to sound like Tumera Morrison, but fails. If you're from New Zealand, you'll be offended because Baker puts an over-the-top Australian accent done by an American, and as we all know, it's always horrible. If you're from Australia like me, you'll be offended because his accent is so stereotypical and stupid, and it's an insult to our country. Also, I don't like that the narrator and Yularen are voiced by the same guy. So the voice acting's underwhelming. I'm going to give two points to this segment. The music is fantastical and great. Although I know it's not composed by John Williams, it surpasses the Rogue One soundtrack because it's very Star Wars in nature. I wonder if George approved the music before it went into the show. That has to be the explanation. You can do a soundtrack without John Williams, as Knights of the Old Republic proved. The music does really feel 1950s if we're being honest instead of 1970s, but that's forgivable. This is the recurring music for the show, so they have to get it right. I also don't like the opening and closing themes to be honest, I wish they had something else. It wouldn't hurt to have the actual Star Wars theme with it. As the sound, it's all of the same stuff than in the films, and I've said my piece on that. I'm going to give 8 points to the music. Well that was underwhelming. The rocky start wasn't the end of the world as the show picked up later, but really, this shouldn't have started off as a movie, and the roots of how Disney treats Star Wars is present here, but not in its ugliest form. The Clone Wars movie has earned a total of 16 points out of 50, equaling a 3.2 out of 10 score. I know why this film is so underwhelming now. I'm likely to review The Mandalorian Season 1 and Season 2 at some point, and I also want to give my impressions on The Bad Batch, because that's coming out soon. I would also like to give a special thanks to my younger brother's girlfriend for letting me use her Disney Plus account, so now I can keep up to date on Star Wars. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories about mystery boxes? Hello there, I'm the Serial Plagiarist, and since you guys wanted it, I'm going to review Star Wars The Clone Wars 2008 with every season reviewed individually. If you want my thoughts on the Clone Wars as a whole, well, the Clone Wars is overrated as hell. There I said it. The people who touted it out the most are people who don't even like the films that inspired them, the prequel trilogy. I'm so sick and tired of coming across a prequel hater that says the Clone Wars redeemed the prequels and it's the real reason the prequels are appreciated, blah 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 blah. Of course those statements are completely ignorant because to assume every prequel fan has seen the Clone Wars is insanely lazy. Like with me, I didn't see the Clone Wars until the entire show popped up on Netflix. I was still mostly oblivious to prequel online hate. So I watched it and enjoyed it. You know, if I didn't know any better, I would have thought The Clone Wars was made because the prequels were more popular than the original trilogy. You know, I somewhat think I'm right, and the prequel hate was smaller than Plinkett liked to make it out to be. I've heard the prequels are very popular in countries like Russia and other ex-Soviet countries because they didn't get the original trilogy first, and they more fairly judge the prequels and love them. Which sort of just kicks the everyone but children hates the prequels narrative in the nuts. Hell, 
My parents saw The Phantom Menace back in 1999 and enjoyed it. And just like Red Letter Media, they grew up with the originals and weren't the biggest fans of Star Wars to begin with. The Clone Wars is proof against the prequel hate and is not to be used for it. Haters are simply twisting this show to suit their narrative now that the prequels are being appreciated more than they already were. Plinkett was obviously not a big Star Wars fan to begin with. To those who want to make the false equivalence that me hating on the sequels is just like Red Letter Media hating on the prequels, reflective of comments I've actually gotten, I want to point out that people like those only saw the movies and said Star Wars was ruined. Unlike me, where I saw the actual state the sequels put Star Wars in, where the games were helmed by EA, the books were grounded and boring, the spin-off films were completely pointless, Plinkett at best saw the three prequel movies and said Star Wars is ruined, fuck George Lucas, while I have a more clear idea of what state Star Wars is in given I've consumed way more than the films. I can guarantee you most hardcore Star Wars fans who were invested in the universe, whether they read the books or not, love the prequels. And in case you're wondering, Cosmonaut Variety Hour does not fall into that criteria because he just references the books when it suits his points, but then completely forgets about them when making cases against the prequels or for the sequels. As an example I will bring up is him relying on books for his Last Jedi review, like making the very presumptuous statement that everyone who didn't like Luke in The Last Jedi didn't like him because he wasn't like he was in the old Legends canon books or whatever but then makes the criticism that only the books explain why the Separatists are leaving the Republic in Attack of the Clones, despite him sourcing a book to explain the Holdo maneuver in The Last Jedi. He's extremely contradictory and hypocritical, and it's the reason why so many people, including me, are criticizing his lack of care in his arguments. Because viewers are very impressionable and can be coerced into buying someone's BS if they have a million subscribers. So no, Cosmo is not a hardcore Star Wars fan as he claims. He just pretends to when it suits him and goes intentionally ignorant when it suits him. Shit like this needs to be called out. Anyways, we should probably talk about the Clone Wars directly again. People say it redeems the prequels, when in actuality the Clone Wars just panders to them and contradicts the films to make these people happy. They don't explain so-called plot holes, rather they create plot holes that prequel haters like because it doesn't line up with the films. I'll discuss this as I go through. Now, I want to address something from the Clone Wars movie review. Apparently, I made the false assumption that it was Dave Filoni who wanted to theatrically release that crappy Clone Wars movie when it was actually George Lucas. Whoops. I fully acknowledge my mistake, although I assumed it was Filoni because I wasn't sure if George was that invested in the show. From what I hear, he mostly just paid for the show and let Filoni do his thing, so long as it didn't contradict his vision or whatever. But I still think a lot of what I said about the Clone Wars movie applies here. Season 1 has very cookie cutter animation that looks low budget in general. The art style is weird given how it's a 3D hybrid of the original Clone Wars show. Honestly, I think they should have had the original Clone Wars show creators supervise this one at the very least. Because this show is very strange on the animation and art style front. Plus, there's the fact that there's a lot of continuity errors. For one, almost everything in the expanded universe is contradicted. Not a good start so far. The very first episode, Ambush, was a strange way to open the show after the Clone Wars movie. It's literally the most campy thing ever, where Yoda and some clones compete with Asajj Ventress and her droids to win the favor of the Toydarian King or something. The best part of the episode is probably Yoda sitting down and talking to the clone troopers about how despite their identical looks, they are all separate beings. It's basically the themes of this show for beginners, but they had to start somewhere, right? Well anyways, Yoda defeats Ventress and she escapes. That's a literal trope of this show. The bad guys run away and lose. And believe me, it happens so often, it's a fucking joke. There's literally a line from Obi-Wan somewhere in the show where he's like, How is it we can win almost every battle but still be losing the war? Because the Republic wins quite a lot in this show, and true defeats are few in number throughout the whole show. That's the definition of campy. 
From what I've heard, Generation 1 Transformers is a lot like this too, where it's essentially Megatron comes up with a plan, he tries to pull it off, the Autobots show up and stop it, and Megatron and the cons retreat and repeat. I'm still in the middle of watching G1, but it's strange when an 80s cartoon shares the same formula as a show from the late 2000s. I would assume there'd be some sort of standard by then, especially for the guy who made Avatar The Last Airbender, which I didn't watch aside from the Ebb Night Shyamalan adaptation. But people suck Filoni off for that show, and I need to make a video someday on why Dave Filoni is overrated, because he's not a god among men in the slightest. He's a heavily flawed showrunner who should have a change in career to a game writer. Plus, why does he wear a cowboy hat if he's not even from the South? Anyways, The Clone Wars Season 1 is campy and gets carried away so often. In the Malevolence arc, General Grievous is given access to a ship with the power to disable ships and other crap. While Grievous is a lot like he is in Revenge of the Sith, even played by the same voice actor, I think Grievous was too dumbed down. Like he has the traits he had in Revenge of the Sith 211. He gets annoyed constantly and he destroys his own battle droids, which I'm actually willing to accept because battle droids are mass produced and disposable, so he can afford to destroy them. It's not like it's going to lower the droid's morale anyways. I guess he doesn't destroy his droids every time he's annoyed. It's basically the ones that push him over the edge. But I think Grievous is too over the top and he doesn't make for an imposing or threatening villain as much as he did in Revenge of the Sith. Well, the upside is that we get the characterization of the clones and background Jedi. Plo Koon is apparently Filoni's favorite background Jedi, and it shows given how he's probably the most pure Jedi out of them all. Plo Koon is a compassionate, caring Jedi who expresses support towards the clones who are with him, and given how we don't properly see all of his face, I applaud this characterization. Plo Koon was the one who brought Ahsoka to the Jedi Temple because of course he did. Speaking of Ahsoka, I probably said this in the Clone Wars show movie review, but it's hard watching Ahsoka. Not just because she's annoying and the voice actress puts on a really kiddish voice, but also she's underdressed. Like seriously, if I didn't know any better, I would say that some sick fuck put Ahsoka into an underage strip club and exploited her for profit. People usually forget that she's 14 to 17 throughout the entire Clone Wars show, so she's literally too young to be a fetish character, unless you're a pervert. And in Rebels, she's a bit too old so there's no balance. Kinda like the Force. I'm dead serious when I said that Ahsoka is literally just Filoni's wet dream character. I never thought Ahsoka really as a character was suited to be Anakin's apprentice. If anyone but Filoni came up with an apprentice for Anakin, I can guarantee you the results would be way different. And I really hate an Ahsoka shippers too. Maybe Anakin's apprentice should have been male, but then again we just have gay shippers so that wouldn't do much. You know, there was this standout comment in an interview with Ahsoka's voice actress that I'm too lazy to find, where she basically questioned why Ahsoka was a girl as well, because she was confused when she was asked to play the role or something. And George apparently didn't like Ahsoka either. I wonder why. In the first season, Ahsoka is literally an annoying girl who underdresses and it makes me uncomfortable because I want to be invested in the story and look at the screen, but I can't. I wonder if this was intentional so I wouldn't notice Ahsoka's fault as a character that much. Also, given the timeline, I think Anakin himself is way too mature. I think I can see why Ahsoka was the kid appeal character. Because it could have been Anakin, but Filoni toughened him up. Anakin is literally Revenge of the Sith Anakin right off the bat. And while he has traits like his arrogance, his risk taking, and his one line is intact, he's literally too much like he is in Revenge of the Sith. And the whole show suffers a bit because he doesn't get that much character development. He mostly goes through these big moments where he taps into the dark side, but that's about it. It's not exactly an arc or a journey he goes through. During the Rising Malevolence arc, which is where we first see him after the Clone Wars movie, he's not a bad character. What I'm criticizing is that Filoni pandered to prequel haters and made him more mature way too quickly. Obi-Wan is probably the most faithfully written of the main cast. His banter with Anakin is engaging and it shows them as friends, but also them arguing from time to time like they did in Attack of the Clones. Cosmonaut tried painting this as Obi-Wan being written faithfully, 
but it's just expanding on what was there in the prequels. I've said that given what was happening in Attack of the Clones, they didn't really have much to do other than argue. Anakin from beginning to end was stressed and troubled, but that wasn't like we didn't see their friendship. The Malevolence is also a textbook example of what was wrong with Clone Wars episodes. The characters get into cartoony shenanigans. Like Padme gets captured by Grievous, and when Anakin and Obi-Wan board the ship to save her, Anakin and Padme are not subtle in the slightest about their relationship. Granted, Anakin also did a terrible job in Attack of the Clones of concealing his relationship, but at this point, there's not a lot of room to screw up. Although it is possible the Jedi overlooked his marriage, which I wouldn't be surprised if that was the case. They were in the middle of a war after all. Another problem is having Obi-Wan and Grievous fight before Revenge of the Sith. Like, unless it's directly stated in the films, the show has characters meet before they're supposed to. It wasn't directly stated that Grievous never fought Obi-Wan before, but given the interaction between the two of them in the film, it's clear that this is their first proper confrontation. Dave Filoni probably wanted the two to have a rivalry, but it doesn't work because he put the rivalry he made up over continuity. This is what people consider fixing the prequels, while well, at least Anakin never meets Grievous as that would have been a huge retcon. Anyways, we then transition to an episode called Rookies, which by the way, the Clone Wars episodes are out of order, but since they were packaged that way, I'm going to watch it as it released. Rookies is a pretty solid episode, although like the rest of Season 1, I have issues with it. First, the clones with their helmets off have the same haircut, so it's hard to tell them apart. I guess it's just a nitpick though. Second, a lot of Echo, Fives, and Heavy Squad dies, but they don't talk about them much after the fact. Like seriously, your teammates just died. And in case you're going to say that these are soldiers that put aside deaths of friends to complete missions, my counter argument would be that the clones in this episode were literally inexperienced with war, and that it make more sense to do so, because they just talk casually about the clones that died in this episode. Like when the clone Gallop dies, he's only mentioned once afterwards, and it's a casual remark about his death. Like seriously? This show treats death like a passing thought sometimes. Now you could say this is somewhat fixed in the prequel episode Clone Cadets, where it's shown that the squad barely made it past graduation and didn't get along that well, but you wouldn't know that until season 3. The show as a whole really dramatizes deaths of the big characters. This episode sort of reminded me of the Terminator, given how the droids can mimic voices. Well anyways, the episode has Heavy sacrifice himself because the detonator shortened out, and he dies in the very episode he's introduced in, and they only backtrack when it's telling his story to shove in characters like 99. It gives the impression that Filoni was making it up as he went along, which would explain the plot holes created, given Filoni didn't look that hard at the films. The next arc we have is the R2-D2 arc where he goes missing, and a separatist spy droid serves as Anakin's replacement. I don't really see the wider purpose of this arc beyond how much Anakin values R2, because this arc is pretty self-contained, and never comes up again later in the show. You know, now that I think about it, just like The Bad Batch, this show feels like a video game. Like it isn't as blatant as The Bad Batch, but the influence is certainly there, and given how there was a tie-in game for the first two seasons in LEGO, that makes me wonder why this wasn't a video game. This arc is pretty goofy, but it's mostly inoffensive. Then we've got the filler episode that does absolutely nothing, the Jar Jar episode. Jar Jar is voiced by Armored Best here, as Jar Jar accompanies Padme to the Rodian homeworld, where a colleague betrays her to the Trade Federation and Newt Gunray. This episode is the basic Jar Jar plot, and it nails his character although it's less amusing than he was in The Phantom Menace. I somewhat wondered the first time watching if they give Jar Jar an arc to be more intelligent or something. Guess he's just a static character. Well, what results of this episode is Newt Gunray getting captured and leading into the next episode, where Ahsoka and Luminara, the green-skinned Jedi, face off against Ventress, where Ventress is ineffective and useless, going to show that this series has the Republic win too often. This episode is basically an escape episode for Newt Gunray, to line up with Revenge of the Sith of course, and Ahsoka is never killed ever in the series, aside from that one arc that is, and Filoni keeps her alive through contrivance. Her going against Ventress, there should be a clear winner, 
but there never is. Realistically, Ahsoka would have died in Season 1, let alone the Clone Wars movie. The third episode in the arc has Kit Fisto, the Jedi that smiled in Attack of the Clones meet up with his former apprentice, who is also a fish, as they explore the Lair of Grievous. I personally think this episode is good, not great, because it has yet another expanded universe continuity error, where Grievous says he chose to be a cyborg, which while making it for an interesting twist to Darth Vader, it goes against the established lore for his character. Other than that, the horror aesthetic is excellent, and Grievous shows more competency than Ventress, as he actually manages to kill a Jedi in a very brutal fashion. So brutal, that even the Lego game depiction of it gave me chills. Then there's this arc where Dooku is captured, which the main positive is Hondo Anaka is a great character, charismatic and amusing to watch. The arc has Anakin, Obi-Wan and Dooku interact before Revenge of the Sith, which is not something that should have been done. Doing this once again changes and recontextualizes things. The main problem with the show are continuity errors, because they lead to bad writing. It's ridiculous how many plot holes are created. The real reason prequel haters tat out this show to death is because it pandered to them. The next two episodes have Ahsoka, Anakin, and Ayla Secura crash land on Maradin, if I pronounce that correctly, where they have to hold out among Separatist forces. Ayla Secura has a French accent for some reason, because George wanted Twi'leks to be French and well. And well, what I can say about this show is that it characterizes all the background Jedi at least, the episode has Star Trek legend George Decay voicing an Armoidian general for the Clone Wars, which surprisingly, Star Trek actors in Star Wars are few in number. I would have liked to see more actors from Star Trek and Star Wars to be honest, because a good thing about The Mandalorian are the guest appearances from famous actors. Well anyways, we have a one-off episode where a blue-skinned idiot decides to provoke natives on an ice planet. The episode as a whole is not memorable, and has a conflict that ends just as soon as it began. It literally started because he was arrogant, and thought it was a good idea starting a skirmish where the Republic least needed one. Thankfully, he dies, and is replaced by a god among men, George Lucas. The episode really doesn't have that much to do with the Clone Wars as a whole, it's just a skirmish happening during the Clone Wars. Sometimes this show has the sin of not focusing on the actual war. Given there's a lot to talk about, like how different characters in different positions see the war, the politics behind the war, worlds and why they joined or stayed out of the war, and how the war was fought, the destruction of the war, etc. Like sometimes when there's a filler episode, it's also an episode that doesn't touch on the actual war in any respect. Like obviously you gotta have more personal character driven episodes, but those episodes tie into the war somewhat, or give interesting insights. This really doesn't. The episode known as The Hidden Enemy has an interesting story. It's basically an episode where Obi-Wan and Anakin discover a traitorous clone has made a deal with Ventress, which turns out to be a soldier named Slick, a sergeant in the clone army. Rex and Cody uncover Slick, and he gives an insightful look into the clones, where they're basically just a slave army bred for war, so you can see that Slick is not totally wrong to hate the Jedi, although if he knew the whole story he would be blaming the Sith. While Slick seems to be a rare case of clones rebelling, it goes to show the idea of clones having no free will of their own. The two episodes after that have the Republic heroes contain a virus that kills everything it touches, re-engineered by some stereotypical mad scientist with a German accent or something. His voice was so stereotypical and cartoonishly bad that I wasn't threatened by his presence at all. The tension isn't really there, and I don't really feel a sense of urgency in the virus being contained. Maybe that's because of COVID, because that's a realistic pandemic and this isn't. Of course, given the predictability, the Republic contains and cures the virus, and the German scientist is arrested. Hooray! Then there's the Ryloth arc, which has the planet of Ryloth contested over by the Republic and the Separatists. The episode doesn't start off well given we see Anakin, like he did in the Clone Wars movie, commit a war crime, in which he fakes surrender and rams a fire ship through the Separatist blockade. An issue with the show a lot of the time is that Anakin and Obi-Wan are essentially war criminals for many offences during the war, and someone who knows more about warfare is going to point this out. 
Like, I'm no expert, but do you guys seriously not know anything about war crimes? Granted, what Anakin and Obi-Wan do are not overtly cruel, but they're still bad because they don't respect the rules of war. I get so annoyed when characters who are supposed to be the good guys do something wrong like this. Like, obviously the characters can make mistakes and can do some bad things, but when they do one of the oldest wartime sins ever, aka fake surrendering, and both the characters and the show just shrug it off like it's nothing, that's not exactly a good lesson to teach the kids watching the show. This is something the villains would do. The whole arc has the Republic win again, which is really annoying given how if one side keeps winning, the war will be over sooning. Mace Windu is utilized in one episode assisting the Free Ryloth movement, and capturing Wat Tambor, the Techno Union dude. Which, if there's one thing I should criticize about this show, it's that it fails to portray war correctly on many surface level areas. Like, obviously this is a Star War, but the fact that the Republic wins all the time does not make me buy that the war lasted three years. This is a problem I have with the Clone Wars as a whole, and it annoys the hell out of me. I don't think the writers properly understand how the basics of war works. Well anyways, we're on to the final episode, with the introduction of Cad Bane, who is a fan favorite Clone Wars character with a hat larger than that of Dave Filoni, with him being the cool bounty hunter of the episode, and it shows that he can match his own against Jedi, and the criticism I had about Padme and Anakin's hidden relationship applies here. Padme gets a hold of Anakin's lightsaber, so Anakin literally just has to use his fists most of the time. And I guess this arc ties into the Clone Wars movie, with Zero the Hutt being freed, but this arc wasn't continued until season 3, leaving a big cliffhanger there. Like, I think this show as a whole relied too heavily on future seasons. Like, the show never would have made it past Disney finances. This show didn't actually do that well at the beginning, but George didn't mind and continued to invest in it because he was cool with that, because he just wanted to make good entertainment and didn't care about financial prosperities. It's pretty damn disappointing how lackluster the Clone Wars Season 1 was. The animation was weak, plot holes were rampant, the arcs were questionable, although buried under all the problems, is a gem. And I sometimes think maybe season 1 should be remade to fully capture what the writers probably wanted, especially with the hindsight of what the show would become. The Clone Wars season 1 doesn't really do much beyond the basics, it's very simplistic and never aims to blow you away with the storytelling. It was pretty safe in general, in fact had the execution been a bit worse, I would have called this show a lackluster imitation of the prequels, but it narrowly avoided that just barely. Like there's this movie called Space Chimps that I saw way back when, that pretty much had the same quality of animation than the Clone Wars did. And that was a theatrically released movie with a budget of 37 million dollars. Now Space Chimps was a lackluster movie in every respect, but I was heavily reminded of it because the animation of the Clone Wars Season 1, the characters are stilted, they are all robotic and you can quite clearly tell that they're animated. Nothing is fluent and immersive. As the season reviews go on, I'll make the case that this show is highly overrated. Because I'm sick of having people in my comment sections act like this is a masterpiece of a show when it's really just the best of Dave Filoni Star Wars shows that people blew way out of proportion. Especially prequel haters. If Kenobi, for example, is not executed well, I will make the same case towards that too, although people will probably say it redeems the prequels, regardless of how many stuff was or was not retconned. I am dreading the Kenobi show, because it'll probably be a pandering and miswritten mess. Having Obi-Wan and Vader fight in between episodes 3 and 4 when they're not supposed to, so that they can pander the prequel hate, a narrative that has since been dismissed at this point. So yeah, I don't have that much good to say about Season 1. It was a relatively weak start to the series, and thankfully the problems got less and less, but many problems still persist with the show. As a whole, I'd like to give this season a 5.5 out of 10. That's the most I could give it, honestly. It's such a broken foundation, but it wasn't bad per se. It was just very meh. So now that I've reviewed Season 1 of The Clone Wars, expect subsequent review videos to be about every individual season. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories by mystery boxes? So my Clone Wars review series continues. <laughs> Season 2 makes some improvements and a lot of unimprovements 
from season one. I'll get into that. The Clone Wars season two upped the animation budget, or at least the quality because practice makes perfect, and the quality of animation improved immensely. Although it's far from what I've come to expect from, say, Clone Wars Season 7 or The Sad Batch. It's a step up the stairs. Just one step, though. Still, though, this show continues to demonstrate how little Dave Filoni understands the universe, and how much he continued to make shit up as it went along. I was actually expecting to think more highly of this season, but revisiting it and doing my analysis, just like the rest of Dave Filoni's shows, it's immensely overrated. So let's talk about it. So, obviously, the first arc consists of Cad Bane being contracted by Darth Sidious to steal a holocron from the Jedi Temple, to which Cad Bane agrees to. For some reason, the Jedi sense that someone is going to raid the temple, which is super convenient. I was never sold on this convenience, it's shown that very personal future events, or wounds in the Force or whatever, cause Force clairvoyance and whatnot, but here it kind of feels like they had this vision, not because it was important, but because it made for an easy explanation to have the Jedi aware that an infiltration was happening. It's kind of lazy. We've also got Ahsoka's role in this arc. We see her command troops and fighting on the battlefield, which I'm going to use on one of my prequel defending rants as I tend to do. You know how Anakin is 9 in The Phantom Menace and people complain about Qui-Gon Jinn bringing him along to the Battle of Naboo and leaving him unsupervised, yet when discussing TCW, they never bring this up. That an underage girl is fighting a bloody war. It's absolutely hypocritical. Just like every other big prequel complaint, people continue to fail to understand the prequels, yet don't care to stay consistent with their arguments. I'm guessing that people think given Ahsoka is five years older than Anakin and the Phantom Menace, that being a soldier at 14 is A-OK, -okay. but if it's 9 years old, nah, that's where they draw the line. I'm seriously baffled by the sheer stupidity of prequel haters. Where are your standards? Give me an answer because yes. I'm shitting myself. Yes. Yeah, this show definitely redeems the prequels and is the reason everybody thinks more highly of them. Which is pathetically lazy if you're going to assume every single prequel fan saw this show. Couldn't it just be that we love the prequels on their own through re-evaluation? That's just some food for thought. Anyways, because Ahsoka was a crappy soldier on the battlefield, she's assigned to become an assistant to Jedi Librarian Jocasta Nu. Meanwhile, Cad Bane hires a Claudite to take control of a Jedi Master that Cad Bane had killed. I didn't know that Claudites could shapeshift into the dude's species, especially with an anatomy that is complex and different than a Claudite. But maybe they can do that? Going off Attack of the Clones, I got the impression that Zam Wessel could mostly only mimic beings that closely resembled her anatomy close enough, and that's why she couldn't just change into a radically different being because she couldn't. Well, anyways, the Holocron heist has Cad Bane and his charismatic and hilarious droid, which is probably the only thing I liked in the Bad Batch, helps Cad Bane break in. I can say that this episode isn't badly made, but it has a couple of iffy things that prevent it from being S or even A tier content. The episode afterwards that continues the arc, Cargo of Doom has Cad Bane attack some planet and capture a Jedi and force him to open the holocron. This is because Sidious said only a force user could open it. I do wonder why Dooku or Ventress couldn't open it, but ah oh well, we need a reason for the Jedi to have a chance at retrieving the holocron. So the Rodian Jedi is tortured to death and doesn't give in, meaning Cad Bane still needs someone to open the holocron. Now, something that doesn't exactly correlate to the episode, but I think I should bring up at some point is Wolf Yalaren. That random white Imperial dude from A New Hope that the casual fan probably didn't even realize was the same guy. I found it kind of distracting how Tom Kane used the same voice for both the narrator and Yularen. I don't think it's as bothersome to have repetitive voice actors in, say, a video game, because you can stretch the encounters with the countless voice actors out, but in a show or movie, you don't have the same luxury, so it's a bit more odd. But a more important problem, I spoke about how I would talk about Expanded Universe retcons, and well, I'm a man of my word.
Wolf Yalaren was not an admiral during the Clone Wars prior to 2008. In A New Hope, he was the head of the Imperial Security Bureau, or perhaps the CIA or KGB of the Empire. Dave Filoni saw the white uniform and without research, thought, Uh, he's a Grand Admiral. I have to make him an Admiral in TCW to show how he progressed through the system. Which was incredibly stupid, because now his story makes less sense in the overall story. Seriously, was Dave Filoni given that much freedom to do whatever the fuck he wanted? Or did no one tell him about what was law accurate and what wasn't? As someone who intends to read the external source material prior to 2008 to see what the original Clone Wars looked like before all those stupid changes were made, I'm not very inspired. I'm going to be very lost given the two Clone Wars timelines are way different. Well anyways, Anakin comes up with an idea to use an ATTE to board a Separatist ship. Now I wanted to talk about Anakin some more. I've discussed how his portrayal is very pandery to prequel haters, but on top of that, his internal struggle is practically non-existent. All throughout the first season, I don't remember a distinct moment where he embraces the dark side to a heavy enough extent. He's the same character throughout the whole show. He's a static character, which in the case of Anakin Skywalker, is not appropriate for the fucking story. Despite the fact that Filoni is a prequel fan, I think, he still didn't persist with how George wrote the character. He changed it. Like, Anakin is arrogant and cocky, but perhaps his biggest character trait, his anger and hot-headed nature, is nowhere to be seen. Anakin is closer to Superman, a character you're supposed to idolize and a shining beacon of righteousness and morality, than the actual Anakin which is a conflicted, troubled, unstable person. Superman was designed as a Larry Stew in a time where in the 30s it made sense to have a character who was perfect given, you know, the Great Depression and the following Second World War. You can quite clearly tell that Anakin in TCW was written with the parts that prequels didn't like thrown out the window. This is why I cannot fully get behind TCW, because it does a sizable disservice to the prequels. Well anyways, with that being said, they board the ship. And basically the whole episode has the Republic scour the ship for the Holocron. Ahsoka is captured and held hostage by Cad Bane, and Anakin of course concedes and gives Cad Bane what he wants, access to the Holocron. All the good Anakin does is in line with his character, but he does way too much good in this show. It doesn't really represent Attack of the Clones Anakin given the timeline. Like, on its own, it's enjoyable, but when you consider this is supposed to be the in-between between episode 2 and 3, it's stupid. To be honest, given what I said about how Dooku or Ventress could have just opened the holocron, I don't know why this episode couldn't just be skipped. Well, I guess it was supposed to show Anakin saving Ahsoka. And, well, what this episode does do effectively is show Cad Bane's quick thinking. He kills a clone trooper and then poses as him. And the episode after that is set back to back when Ahsoka sees that Cad Bane under the clone trooper armor is wounded and tries to help him. But he's revealed given his blood color is different to clones and he manages to escape. Once off the ship, Sidious orders Cad Bane to choose four random kids from the Holocron and bring them to Mustafar. I only think they chose Mustafar to reference the movies. I guess it does explain why Anakin knew about Mustafar, given it looks like a random hideout planet in the film. On the Jedi side of things, they decide to connect their force powers to try and tell where Cad Bane will strike. I don't know if this breaks any rules, but I don't really buy that the Jedi would be able to sense every location Cad Bane would go to. I think it would have been more likely if they only detected one location. They went there and they either caught Cad Bane in time, or he leaves a trace on where he went. Yoda even says in this episode that it's a small chance they'll detect where Cad Bane is going. So it's kinda strange. Also, a classic example of power level inconsistency happens, where Ahsoka and Anakin confront Cad Bane on Naboo. Ahsoka at first is the only one that confronts him, and I found it completely stupid that she didn't die. That's the thing, Dave Filoni is essentially stretching her lifespan out, and it's fucking annoying. This kinda just goes into the reason why Anakin having an apprentice 
wasn't the best idea. It was because the council would never give Anakin an apprentice, because that apprentice would die within five minutes of meeting Anakin. And keep in mind, they're in the middle of the war too. Dave Filoni really did not write Anakin faithfully. He wrote him in the way that would please the OT fanboys. And while on its own it's fine, in the context of the larger story, Anakin as he exists in TCW is inconsistently written. While in the following scene, Obi-Wan, Mace Windu, Anakin and Ahsoka all decide to use the Force to influence Cad Bane to take them to the Holocron. They decide to combine their powers to influence Cad Bane, and before he gets his mind destroyed, Cad Bane agrees to take them to the Holocron. This scene goes on for around 30 seconds, which is kind of far from a convincing amount of time before Cad Bane gives in. I mean, the way it's put together, it's like he had one tumor and he's done and he's given up. That doesn't give me the impression that he's strong-willed. Well, point is, Obi-Wan and Windu retrieve the Holocron from somewhere, and Anakin and Ahsoka find out Cad Bane went to Mustafar, and how it's out of range to all the other places he went. Even though I looked at a galactic map and it isn't that far from Naboo. I know I'm probably nitpicking, but on top of the Expanded Universe retcons, I also heard that the show doesn't pay that much attention to galactic geography, which basically means it doesn't keep a consistent track of where what is and how far away it is. It's nitpicking, but it adds to the overall point that Filoni didn't pay attention to the lore. The climax of the episode happens and I guess it's good for showing Anakin's heroism, but I didn't really get that much out of this episode. And well, what do you know? That's the end of the arc. Next episode, we get a filler episode that doesn't really have a real purpose, especially on expanding on the Clone Wars. An episode that wasn't continued until season 6, and was just cut off for several years. So this is the episode with Rush Clovis, if that's a name you haven't heard of in a long, long time. He's basically the other guy who Padme pursued a relationship with. Basically in this episode, Rush Clovis is suspected of working with the Separatists and the intergalactic banking clan. Given Padme knows Clovis from their early years as Senators, she is asked to spy on Clovis, but of course she refuses. It's not until Anakin speaks to her about it, and she basically told all the information that Yoda refused to tell her. So of course she instantly changes her mind about spying on Clovis. Clovis, just like a ton of other things, is a retcon. Clovis wasn't mentioned at all when Padme spoke to Anakin about people she had crushes on and whatnot. Instead it was a guy named Palo and stuff. Second of all, Clovis just sucks. I know we're not supposed to like him, but his voice actor sounds like a sleazy con man, making it ridiculously obvious that something is going to happen. My memory is faulty because I remember him having a much more charismatic voice. Anyways, what I was going to say is that the whole episode is basically reflecting Anakin's jealousy, which is appropriate with the character, but knowing Anakin from the films, they never really go far enough with it. It's the same kind of jealousy anyone would have after some guy constantly hits on your girlfriend or whatever. I say this because of the absolutely mental dark side nature of Anakin that would happen if anyone tried to touch Padme. I think we actually get a scene of this when this arc is continued in season 6, but that doesn't say much. Also, I have to say that it was a hassle going through a lot of these episodes again. I think a lot of them are only as entertaining the first time you see them. And me having a more critical mind, let me say that the show so far just doesn't hold up as well. Of course, the Separatist poisoned Padme, and Clovis having feelings for Padme is forced to save her, and the episode ends with Anakin stepping in and leaving Clovis with the stick in his hand as he ditches him. I'm not against Anakin having an episode that represents his jealousy, but is that the best you could do? For the longest time, this was a one-off episode. It feels nowhere near like a satisfying ending. Anyways, next episode arc. The Second Battle of Geonosis. This is probably one of the most forgettable arcs in the entire show. I barely remember a thing from this arc, and boy, now I remember why. I never thought it was a good idea to go back to Geonosis, because we've already seen a battle on Geonosis. It was episode 2. 
Do we really need to go back to Geonosis? Couldn't they come up with a new planet to attack? I always got the impression that Geonosis lost tactical relevancy after the Battle of Geonosis, and the conflict was put into other worlds in the galaxy. Also, I do have something to criticize here that spans over to the entire show. Kiandi Mundi. We don't see much of him as a whole in the entire show, which is strange given all the other Jedi characters at least have one arc to shine. Kiandi Mundi has as much of a role in this show as he does in the films. In the films, he was basically the, he is a political idealist, not a murderer, and what about the droid attack on the Wookiees? Anyways, episode 6 is just a filler spectacle episode as far as I could tell. It's uninteresting. Thankfully, the episode after that actually has something to it. It is something that would be immediately invalidated in season 5, that being the friendship between Ahsoka Tano and Barriss Offee. It's all based on the invasion of the Body Snatchers, except it's the family-friendly version. The biggest problem with this episode is that there's not a lot of atmosphere. While the parasites pose a good threat, they aren't scary. They don't even shut off the lights in this episode. And given both Ahsoka and Barriss are the main Jedi of this episode, as they are preparing a supply run, they seem to be not as intimidated as they should be. Also, there's a scene where Anakin interrogates Poggle the Lesser, who was captured in the previous episode. He refuses to talk, so Anakin uses physical force to strangle Poggle to give him the information he wants. The animation is still too primitive, to get the movement and expression off effectively, but on the upside, this is probably one of the most in-character moments for Anakin in this entire show. Then we've got another Filoni retcon in the next episode, when General Grievous captures Eeth Koth, who died in Attack of the Clones. Apparently the story goes that Filoni wanted to use Eeth Koth in this episode, and both Lee Lin Chi and Pablo Escobar Hidalgo told him he couldn't use him, but George said it was okay. Given Eeth Koth was shot down and likely died in G canon, I have to give George Flack for his inconsistency. When I came across something that's actually worth flacking George over, I'll say it. So this episode heavily relies on a large retcon and it doesn't work. Again, especially since Eeth Koth's death was originally G canon, aka the highest level. As Tad Larkin pointed out, they could have used Aiken Kolar instead, but Filoni didn't because reasons. Basically, this episode is the general formula of General Grievous doing something bad and the good guys have to stop him. The formula this show uses is getting old by this point, especially in the earlier seasons. I didn't find this episode very interesting because it's another episode where they board a fucking ship. That is extremely old and the variety is nowhere in sight. I wish they'd come up with a new location to free Eve Koth. And of course, there's the predictable ending of Grievous escaping again. You know, at least in Revenge of the Sith, it wasn't overdone, but when you're doing a show, I think I would have liked a more imposing Grievous, because as I said in the first season's review, the Republic victories happen too often and it makes the Separatists a mitigated to non-existent threat. You pretty much watch this only for the spectacle sometimes. The season so far isn't very compelling. So the next episode has Grievous retreat to the planet of Sulakami, and the Republic has to hunt him down. First, the main positive. I kind of like the set piece and look of Sulakami. Looks a lot like it did in that brief shot in Revenge of the Sith. I think the first problem with this episode is that the concept it introduces outweighs the actual instigator for this episode. Grievous on the run is not focused on much. The episode with the clone deserter, Cut Queen, pretty much hijacks the episode because they wanted to show you some themes of what happens when a clone trooper quits. There's obviously an elephant in the room for Expanded Universe fans, that being that Cut Queen would not have enough independence to leave the Grand Army of the Republic easily because he was your average clone trooper. But there's another elephant, that being Cut Queen's partner has her own children who are half human, half Twi'lek hybrids. The problem is that it was made quite clear that Twi'leks are not genetically compatible with humans. This fact actually surprised me. I learned that less than two 
weeks ago. But Twi'leks cannot produce children with humans, even though they do have a very close anatomy with humans. If you want to produce children with an alien, you could boink someone that belongs to maybe the Achani, or maybe a Miraluka if you have a fetish for blind girls. Or you're just so ugly no one else would want you. But the point being, Cutler Quain's stepkids shouldn't be able to exist. Period. They could have just made Cutler Quain's stepkids fully Twi'lek or human. Pick one or the other, not both. The episode basically highlights how Cutler Quain, after his clone brothers were killed in a battle and he was left the sole survivor, decided to start a new family. Also, I know this wouldn't have anything to do with anything, but would it be right to have a relationship with a clone that ages twice as fast? Or would that be fine because he'd actually reach maturity by that point? And of course, the climax of this episode. Obi-Wan fights Grievous again. Fuck me. And Captain Rex, after learning Cut Quain's choice is justified, decides to keep his life a secret, which ended up not meaning much when the Bad Batch came out, but still. Then we've got Lightsaber Lost, which I guess is about responsibility. I will say that the episode is very relatable, because I'm so clumsy and I end up misplacing a lot of important stuff. So although this episode is insignificant in the whole scale of things, it isn't a bad episode. It's very much filler, but it's one of the few times it doesn't end up feeling like a waste of time. Ahsoka gets the assistance of an old Jedi dude with a very 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 light blue lightsaber. Yeah, turns out it isn't silver. Now here comes an episode arc I really wanted to talk about. The Mandalore arc with Duchess Satine and the Mandalorians. First of all, Filoni absolutely butchered what the Mandalorians are and what they were doing during the Clone Wars. Mandalore's look is all wrong for starters. I'm pretty sure it's supposed to be a jungle planet and they got the capital wrong, and also the Mandalorians were certainly not pacifists at any point during the war. Basically, the episode has Obi-Wan talk to Prime Minister Almuk, but fuck him for now. The real point of discussion is Satine, Duchess of Mandalore, who is a hardcore pacifist, which seems reasonable, but as the arc goes on, it extends to not stepping in when she needs to. You still need to have authority somewhere in case there are troublemakers, like criminals and well, we'll get to that. Basically the conflict is basically a Death Watch movement, which makes no sense because the Death Watch were destroyed by Jango Fett, although you could excuse that as it being a new Death Watch movement, but do you have to go that far to defend Dave Filoni when it comes to continuity? Anyhow, those fucking terrorists bomb a public area, leaving the sign of the Death Watch. And then a dude runs away, he kills himself, uttering something in a different language, and Duchess Satine recognizes the spoken dialect, and says it comes from Concordia. So that's where they need to go. So they go, and this is Osama Bin Vizsla, voiced by Jon Favreau. Which, let me say, this guy is far better at voicing Star Wars characters than he is making shows. I really don't want to hate on Jon Favreau, especially since he's the guy who directed Elf, which was a damn good Christmas movie. But when it comes to Star Wars, he's better off voicing characters. Now, the reason I called him Osama Bin Vizsla is because when shenanigans happen, and Obi-Wan gets ambushed by Death Watch, and Satine has to bail him out, and then it's a fight scene against Death Watch. And then that motherfucking terrorist shows up and reveals he's the leader of Death Watch. And his first introduction as a villain is ruined when he walks past one of his goons and shoots him for failure. In case you couldn't tell, the villain kills his own men cliche always takes me out of the story when it isn't done properly, which it isn't here. But thankfully, when he pulls out the dark saber, it's able to pick up relatively well. Now, I've done my rant about the dark saber in the book of Boba Fett, mostly because it's supposed to be weightless like any lightsaber, and Mando found it heavy. Apparently, I've been told that it was established as heavy in Rebels, which doesn't make it any better. Also, apparently there's a bullshit thing about how the blade is heavy because of some fuck-off crystal or something, which makes no sense at all. In the Clone Wars, the Darksaber is given a way better introduction, as Vizsla explains its interesting backstory and then fights Obi-Wan. And the fight is perfectly okay, 
It looks a lot like a mashy brawler video game boss fight, but besides that, it's good. Also, now that it occurred to me, why the hell did Vizsla reveal himself to be the terrorist mastermind when it wouldn't suit his plan? Eh, whatever, next episode. So anyways, Satine is getting an escort to the Senate, and she must be protected at all cost because she needs to keep Mandalore out of the war, and she can't do that if she's dead. This is the episode where it's revealed Obi-Wan and Satine knew each other from when Obi-Wan was still a Padawan with Qui-Gon. Basically, the episode has Anakin and Obi-Wan try to take out assassin droids that snuck onto the ship, and it turns out a senator, Tal Merrick, is in on the plot and he holds Satine hostage, planning to take her to the Death Watch. Probably the most memorable moment from the episode is when Merrick is holding those away with a detonator, and basically Anakin impales him with his saber out of nowhere. Of course it would be Anakin. I don't actually have a lot of complaints about this episode. The next episode sort of just drags out the conflict, having the Duchess, after failing to convince the Senate, be framed for murder. I completely forgot about this episode, and I can see why. It just drags out a story that I kind of felt should have been over already, because she already made it to Coruscant. Anyways, next episode. That Rodian from Season 1 dies when he gets poisoned, and Padme Amidala has to find out who killed him. This murder mystery is kind of average. They question the obvious suspects, but they find out it was his aide. And they figured this because the poison only worked on Rodians, and his aide didn't drink any of it. Shocker. I guess this episode is the closest to be Star Peace, because neither a blaster is fired, nor is there a lightsaber ignited. Next, this episode basically introduces a new character, a walking tarantula called Admiral Trench. Trench, for some reason, is more competent than General Grievous. Yeah, this is the seasoned and hardened character in this show. What the hell? Well, anyways, the Separatists are blockading Christophus, where Bail Organa is stationed, even though he's a fucking senator and should have no place in this episode. It's clear they just wanted to give him an appearance here, even though the last episode was enough for this entire fucking season. I don't have a lot to say about this episode, except the Separatists lose again. Seriously, even the most imposing high-ranking Separatists in the show can't win against these plot-armored main heroes. Also, this probably doesn't matter, but when Anakin greeted Trench by saying, Hello, ugly, did he say that because he wanted to insult Trench, or because he was xenophobic? I don't know, that's something that just popped into my mind. The next episode actually made me think even worse of The Mandalorian, because this episode, Bounty Hunters, made me realize that Filoni couldn't come up with a new story, so he recycled the plot of this episode. I didn't realize because it had been a while since I saw The Clone Wars, this episode has the same general plot as episode 4 of The Mandalorian. Farmers attacked by pirates, good guys step in and train the farmers to fight back, blah 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 blah. I've already talked about this before. Apparently this was inspired by that Japanese director that, that Lucas heavily derived aspects of Star Wars off of. I can't comment, but watching this episode annoyed me. Not because there's any problems with it, but because it showed me Filoni likes to recycle plots. This episode is kind of meh anyways. It's just a filler episode that introduces a few bounty hunters that appear in later episodes. Like the guy with a bowcaster and a shield for a hat, which is dumb. Then we've got the Zillow Beast arc. Basically, the Zillow Beast arc begins with the Republic attacking the Separatists on Malastar for fuel or whatever, until they come across the Zillow Beast when they drop an EMP, which is basically a giant creature that lives below the surface. Apparently, it's the last of its kind and the dogs are like, you must kill it if you want our fuel. And we've got this crappy moral dilemma of sparing the Zillow Beast, which I couldn't care less about. I know it's Jedi nature, but I don't really see a point to any of this. Basically, Mace Windu and Anakin put the Zillow Beast into a deep sleep, with the intent of studying it back on Coruscant, and for some idiotic reason, it's Palpatine who suggests this, thinking that it's a good idea. Of course it isn't. The Zillow Beast breaks loose and starts killing everything in its path, with its prime target being Palpatine, because it ordered the Zillow Beast kill. Now, the main problem with these two episodes is the ending, with its very heavy implications. Given the Zillow Beast went on a rampage and destroyed a lot in its path, it's never brought up why Palpatine wasn't held accountable. 
I've seen videos that actually try to fill in this question, and in my opinion it couldn't come up with satisfactory answers. Also, as I said earlier, the moral dilemma this episode puts forth is so crappy and hollow, that it makes you go like, is that the best you could come up with? An animal being the last of its kind is such a tired trope at this point. Also, given they both came out the same year, was the Zillow Beast a ripoff of the Gorog? Was the Gorog a ripoff of the Zillow Beast? Now let's talk about the arc that finalized the season. The Boba Fett's Revenge Arc. Basically, Boba Fett in a quest to avenge his father Jango, poses as a cadet given he's a clone, and gets onto the ship Mace Windu is on. It's made pretty obvious from the get-go that Boba Fett's a spy. I know that's pretty obvious, but there's no build-up at all. Of course, Boba Fett strays away, go to Mace Windu's quarters and he set charges that'll kill him. What's the excuse they'll have him to survive? A clone steps in at the last minute and takes the explosion head on, killing him instead of Mace Windu. That's some incredible dumb luck and contrived writing there. Couldn't they just have Mace Windu narrowly avoid death another way? I guess the one thing I like about this episode is that Boba Fett is only after Mace Windu. That's his target. And he reluctantly goes after everyone on board when he's told he needs to by his ally, who we'll get to in a bit. He basically causes the ship to malfunction and blow off one of the engines, and of course his allies or a sing. I shouldn't be saying of course, because from what I've been told, Boba Fett and Aura Singh are supposed to be fucking rivals during the Clone Wars. So that's TCW for you doing another retcon. Basically, this episode focuses on Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu, which doesn't work very well given their relationship is distant and untrusting between the two. So having an episode where they do something together is way off the mark continuity-wise. In fact, in the middle episode, Mace Windu and Anakin Skywalker have to get themselves out of a jam, and they have to work together. R2-D2 is sending help and makes it to the Jedi Temple and tells Plo Koon and Ahsoka what's going on across the galaxy. And the episode ends with Mace Windu giving admiration to Anakin's droid and quote, I see why Anakin sees you in such high regard. And it just doesn't work. In the next episode, they have Plo Koon and Ahsoka track down Boba and crew after they learn that they took hostages. So after going into a bar and hearing convenient intel on who they're looking for, which was honestly way too easy based on how this was structured, they go to Florum and meet Boba and Aura Singh head on. Basically this whole ordeal has Boba Fett captured and Aura Singh ditching him. And then as Ahsoka chases Aura Singh, Plo Koon takes Boba Fett to Hondo and Naka the pirate, who is also on Florum, and he basically tells him to just give in and admit his terrible deeds, and it's what his father would have wanted, which is flat out stupid. Knowing Jango's character, Jango hates the Jedi and has no care for the clones produced with his DNA aside from the one he called his son. Even back when I first watched this, I didn't buy it one bit. To wrap this up, Aura Singh tries to escape the Slave One and Ahsoka causes it to crash. And an admittingly less but still pathetic death fake out than the Rise of Skywalker, they frame it like Aura Singh died in the crash. But knowing the riding style of Dave Filoni, She's not being killed off so easily. So then both Bosk, who was in this episode, but I neglected to mention, because he basically does nothing and Boba Fett are arrested. And Boba apologizes to Mace Windu for the damage he caused, but reaffirms that he still hates him specifically. And that's the end of season two. Boy, did this take a lot out of me. Honestly, I was expecting season two to hold up better than season one, but as I did this analysis, there's just so many fucking problems with season two. The animation is improved, and they're widening their rage to other prequel characters, but even past the continuity issues, I just don't like where it went, especially since connective tissue to other stuff makes no sense. Honestly, I have no idea what I saw in this show back when I watched it on Netflix. Maybe my mentality was different given I was in the age of peak prequel hate, and the sequel trilogy wasn't concluded yet. Regardless, I was unsure of how low Season 2 would rank. I was thinking maybe a 4.5 or 5 out of 10, but since I can't decide between the two, I'll just give it a 4.75 out of 10. Yeah, I enjoy this season less than the first one. I went into this expecting a gradual increase in quality, but I think given Dave Filoni has since become an overrated hack, 
his crappy influence I may have now felt in his earlier Star Wars shows. Given this was the prioritized video you wanted to see, the extra work to finish this video took a lot out of me, because I had a lot to complain about. But now that it's off my chest, the Season 3 review will probably be made whenever, but not soon, depending on how fast I work. So I heavily expect dislikes from all the Clone Wars fans, but you came to listen to my brutally honest opinion on this show. And my opinion is that this show, or at least Season 2, has just aged badly, but not terribly. Now, before I close this video, I want to shout out the Patreons you can see on screen now. As you can tell, another plagiarist sympathizer has joined the list. That being Farmer Dude 11. Good on you, mate. I'm JJ Plagiarisms. And until next time, what are stories but mystery boxes? So since I was utterly disappointed by Season 2 of The Clone Wars, which I previously discussed, I had extremely mitigated expectations for the next season. As it seems, The Clone Wars has aged badly in many ways. Things start to pop up about it, and I think The Mandalorian was really a big eye-opener. Everybody should know by now that Dave Filoni is not George Lucas' apprentice. That's just a myth Filoni himself perpetuated. Filoni is not a disciple of George Lucas. It's more accurate to say that Filoni got a few explanations at best and that was it. George Lucas, from my understanding, was the loose idea guy for the Clone Wars. Dave Filoni would be given ideas for the Clone Wars, but Filoni would be given full reign to do whatever he wanted. On top of that, here's the opposite of an encyclopedia, as I've already demonstrated. Dave Filoni isn't even an encyclopedia on Disney canon, he just decides his own canon. There was a reason I had the Dave Filoni pop made, and that was because he is an essential visual representation for these reviews in particular, and also because I have like 10 videos ahead of me relating to Filoni shows. I've also been told that when it comes to the My Force Unleashed 2 review, George Lucas was given the choice to either fund the Force Unleashed 2 or the Clone Wars show. And I'm not sure he made the right decision in hindsight. The Clone Wars was made for super casual Star Wars fans it seems. I remember when the show was airing on Cartoon Network. I remember there was a kid at primary school called Lucas who was obsessed with it. He used to bring a toy blaster based on Captain Rex to school and play Star Wars The Clone Wars with his friends. I guess the one thing The Clone Wars did well is appealing to kids which was always the target demographic for Star Wars. I remember a statement from George Lucas that I remember off the top of my head where he says that TCW was THE introduction to Star Wars for many kids. I can't remember where I read that, so take it with a grain of salt, but when it comes to TCW, it seems that most people who praise it have a deep connection with the show, which is fine, or it's people who want to spite the prequels by seeing TCW is better, and that I strongly disagree with. I want to make it clear that not all of the TCW praise comes from morons just trying to spite the prequels, but I do want to say that it comes from a very limited, skewed view of Star Wars. Many fans probably have no idea what a dirge is, and probably think Ventress was Dooku's only apprentice and have no clue about his dark acolytes. I think the problem is that people don't give the other stuff a chance. To them, the only Clone Wars external material is the show. The original micro series doesn't exist. None of the Clone Wars games exist, and you can bet your ass Star Wars Republic doesn't exist. I'm just saying that TCW being some of the best Star Wars content is a bold claim and comes from complete inexperience with the Star Wars franchise. If you're just limiting yourself to the movies, shows, and probably the mainstream games, you're going to have a very skewed view of what is the best. From that perspective, TCW is great, but when you start reading the Star Wars Republic comics, playing the lesser known games, reading the novels, TCW comes nowhere close, and I'm only starting to dip my toes in the expanded universe. And I can tell you firsthand that TCW is fine. 
It's been overbloated because it has an advantage as a show over the less accessible stories like the Thrawn trilogy. I wanted to revisit season 3, which I haven't seen in years, and see if it's an improvement from season 2. So let's start with the season 3 pilot, Clone Cadets. I slowly realized the first time that this is a direct prequel to the season 1 episode Rookies. As I've discussed, I didn't care that much for Rookies, and I stated that a lot of the problems are retroactively patched in Season 3's pilot. With that being said, the episode basically focuses on the Domino Squad before they had duty on that outpost in the Season 1 episode. And this episode fills in a lot of gaps, like why Echo 5's in Heavy didn't give a single shit about their fallen squad mates and Rookies. Well, it's established here that the squad didn't really care much for each other. They were prone to arguing during their training during the war. They were extremely late to the war as they were still training until they were ready to be deployed. Still, if you're watching this in chronological order, it's still weird because the clones who die in Rookies are killed off without a care in the world. You see, watching the prequel trilogy before the original trilogy, like you're supposed to, gives you the story in the natural way. This is one reason why I didn't really care about watching these in order of when they happened. Because Dave Filoni it feels was making it up as he went along. Apparently that's not actually the case, and he did have a plan with George Lucas, but how was I supposed to tell that? It seems like a very messy show that was made with basic rules like these characters can't die before Revenge of the Sith, and shit like that. It had to be a very loose plan, or it's because of the enormous amount of retcons made that makes it look like Dave Filoni had no end in mind. And even if you do have a plan, if you don't abide by it properly, it will also become a mess. Also, when it comes to Ahsoka's fate, for example, George and Filoni had two fundamentally different opinions on what happens to Ahsoka, which I'll discuss in more detail in the Season 5 review. But for now, it seems like he changed a lot of things. I'm going to refrain from saying more, because I simply don't know enough, and my rule of thumb is, unless I'm absolutely sure, I never make absolute statements. Only a Sith deals in absolutes. So maybe we should get back to the episode. Shark T and the two instructors, which makes me automatically ask, wait, I thought the instructors brought on by Jango Fett were Mandalorians. But then you realize, oh right, the Mandalorians were turned into the Hitler youth specimens that became the very thing they swore to destroy when Filoni turned them into pacifists in this part of the story. So of course the instructors can't be Mandalorians. That sucks. Instead we've got two bounty hunters that can basically be described as mean and nice. Seriously, the Brainiac bounty hunter is a dick and completely unprofessional. Like, boot camp instructors I imagine are harsh, but it seems like this guy is just pushing proper protocol. After Domino Squad fail the exercise, they are sent back to their quarters, and a defective clone, called 99, goes and cleans up the mess. Now, the definite highlight of this arc is 99. A shame that the thing we have as his legacy is the Delta Squad wannabes we know as the Sad Batch. Although not explicitly said in this episode, 99 being unfit for combat would have been euthanized if not for the Jedi stepping in and cancelling his termination. You know, one thing people say about this show that I really don't agree with, for the most part, is that this isn't a children's show. It is. This aired on Cartoon Network, and it easily could have been aired somewhere else if it was given a higher rating. That doesn't mean it can't be a mature kids show, because a lot of those already exist. Like, obviously, you can't outright tell the audience that 99 would have been automatically killed as a defective clone if not for the Jedi stepping in, but still. So, point being, I don't know if 99 is an original idea or not, but he's a great idea regardless. As a defective clone, 99 is probably the most likable clone maybe out of the whole show. His disability is used for more than just making us feel bad for him, especially right before the climax. So anyways, we get another scene of Domino Squad arguing their asses off at each other, and the Brainiac clone, who is referred to as the Master Chief, which I don't know what the writers were thinking, because that definitely ain't him, but anyhow, the Master Dickhead insults all the clones, which makes them come off as unprofessional. Again, we've got Shark T and the Kaminoan Prime Minister 
talking about Domino Squad and how they are very much close to failing. Next scene, we've got some ARC troopers show up to Kamino to instruct the clone squad still in training. And it's here where I think we should talk about another retcon. That being how ARC troopers became ARC troopers. Basically, from what I understand, ARC troopers were the more independent clones in the first place, who were originally going to be terminated, but the Mandalorian instructors I mentioned earlier stopped the Kaminoans and took them on like sons. Being an ARC trooper was not something an average clone trooper gets to be. This show, from what I hear, changed a lot of the rules of the clones, and the old version, from what I understand, makes more sense because I don't understand why every single clone would be given the same independence level as the ARC Troopers and Republic Commandos in Legends. So anyways, the ARC Troopers basically talks about unity and expresses the first rule, we fight together. Which confuses me because Republic Commando said the first rule was kill them, before they kill you. I'm probably shit picking, but calling out the retcons big and small is highly satisfying for me. So complain all you want, it's never ever 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 gonna stop. STOP! So basically, the ARC Trooper calls out Bravo Squad to demonstrate the final test. Domino Squad watches Bravo Squad dominate the simulation. And then when it's Domino Squad's turn, they fail when they leave a man behind. I don't know why they left him behind if it meant automatic failure, but again, I guess that's nitpicking. Anyhow, the two instructors talk about how Domino Squad are going to have one last chance at the final test. But if they fail, they'll be working on maintenance for the rest of the war. The nice instructor and the master dickhead argue, and it's done where 99 eavesdrops their conversation. So the entire squad, frustrated that they're going to be stuck in sanitation like Finn was, decide to try and bail out, but none succeed. And Heavy is about to leave Kamino and go somewhere, until 99 shows up behind him, and convinces him to stay and pull it together. When Heavy remarks that their failure is just like him, 99 has some insightful words about how could he be a failure if he never got his chance. Very true. So Heavy, inspired by Uncle Ben 99, gets his team the next morning, dedicated to make it through, they finally pull their shit together, and even when they realize their belts are missing because the master dickhead took them before the test started, the team managed to improvise and capture the flag, and finish the exercise on time. After passing the test, Domino Squad get to graduate and go to war. Heavy stays behind to thank 99 for his guidance, and Heavy gives him his medal, as I suppose he earned it. Aww. And of course, there's an average case of, I'll see you again, trust me. But given we know what happens, this was sort of a cheap bit of sympathy bait, but aside from that, the ending is great. And then all but two of the clones in Domino Squad get hollow deaths in Season 1, which I've already spoken about. And then we've got this episode. The start to this episode is very questionable, because it has Anakin and Obi-Wan and their respective clone commanders talk about an intercepted message that has General Grievous discuss a planned attack on Kamino. Of course, the episode doesn't explain how this message was intercepted, it just starts that way, and you have to deal with it. That's a common thing to happen in this show, things being introduced without context. Like in Season 2 when the Jedi sensed that Cad Bane was about to steal a holocron, and it was a very convenient plot point to make things easier for the Jedi. So it's set up that Grievous and Ventress were both tasked by Count Dooku to invade Kamino. One thing I don't get, is why the Separatists ever invaded Kamino. Like, what I mean is that from the perspective of the Sith's grand plan, if Grievous and Ventress succeeded in taking Kamino, then Palpatine's plan would be in jeopardy because he needs as many coins as possible when he executes Order 66. Remember, the war is just meant to be a distraction for the Jedi and the galaxy, and is not supposed to be an actual unfiltered war, given Palpatine controls both sides. That's why the Separatists losing often makes no sense, because the war would have ended by then. Palpatine in reality would need to give both sides leeway long enough until he was ready to strike. So Anakin and Obi-Wan warn of the impending attack to Shark T and the Kaminoans. So as Echo and Fives are walking through their home, they meet 99 once again. 
and they have to cut 99 the bad news. That Heavy got caught under his own weight. Get it? And 99 reveals that Heavy gave him his medal two chronological episodes ago to the both of them. So that's an appropriate Chekhov's gun. And something else I do have to question is that Ventress is underwater, but it's unclear how she was able to get onto the planet's surface without being detected. Jesus, I just have to be that dickhead that questions the battle tactics and logistics, don't I? Well, anyways, Grievous starts his attack, and it's all supposed to be a distraction, as Ventress attacks the city from the inside. Something stupid with the episode as a whole is having Anakin and Grievous in the same battle. Having them almost meet, but narrowly avoiding each other for continuity to be intact. It seems like they just throw in iconic characters in the same episodes just for the sake of it. It's like with Dooku, Anakin, and Obi-Wan. They're not supposed to meet again until Revenge of the Sith. We cut to the random Ark Trooper getting killed by Grievous, who gives him a kiss for some reason. Jesus, I haven't really spoken about it. But I really do not like Ventress in this show. Her arc throughout the entire show was weird and felt unstructured. Even if it wasn't, it feels like Dave Filoni was making shit up as he went along. Given Ventress and Grievous share this mission, I'm going to point out that she's got the same problem as Grievous. She loses quite a lot. Her interactions with Anakin and Obi-Wan feel like the exchanges the Autobots and Decepticons have when they trash talk each other in G1. To put it short, it's very campy. I much preferred her role and presence in the Clone Wars micro series. She felt more like a threat in that series than she ever did in this show. Like, unless you like bold, creepy women, Ventress sucks in this show. I don't hear a lot of the Filoni groupies talk about her a lot. Cause let's face it, there's better things in this show. Also, when Ventress touches Grievous in a sexual manner, I just want to kick the person who wrote this episode in the nuts. Because now I'm potentially going to stumble across Ventress Grievous shipping. Even though Grievous is like 80% droid, but nothing will top Anna Soka. That will remain the worst ship in Star Wars history. So anyways, Echo 5s and 99 escort some clone cadets to the barracks, and despite the fact that the five-year-old clones have not completed their training, they're still going to fight. So Ventress tries to grab the clone DNA, and is confronted by Anakin Skywalker, while Grievous fights Obi-Wan again. And I'm going to say again that I'm pretty sick of their confrontations that should not be a thing. So let's just talk about the only thing I give a shit about in this episode. Fives, Echo, and 99. The show gets its first hard-hitting death when 99 becomes an active battle participant, supplying the other clones with ammunition and detonators and stuff, and dies with his final words being, I'm a soldier, like you. And the cinematography, the pacing, the setup, and the music work at its absolute peak. And this is one of the few things the show totally earns. But the weak ending happens when Grievous and Ventress escape again. Jeez, you couldn't have them win at least once? I have no idea why Grievous chose to pick Ventress up, given they were sort of like rivalistic allies in this episode. I suppose Dooku had Grievous and Ventress both accountable for the other, but anyhow, that's the end of the episodes, with the Separatists losing again. I really do not like saying again as much as I do, but if I must, then I must. Let's talk about the next episode, which is basically a team up between Jar Jar and Bail Organa, this is another filler episode. I don't remember watching this episode, and that's probably because it was a filler episode that was meant to be forgotten instantly, and was only made to fill in time. I see one similarity between this and Season 2's Cat and Mouse episode, where they need to give relief supplies to Republic forces on X-World. Something I don't understand is Jar Jar and Bail talk to the Toydarian King about helping the Republic, even though I thought they were already supposed to be helping the Republic, until I realized that this takes place before Episode 1 Season 1. And that just confuses me, because the episodes are not in chronological order, and I just lose track when the episodes are supposed to take place. 
There's not much to say about this episode aside from that, it's just bleh. Next episode, we've got the introduction of George Lucas's physical character from Revenge of the Sith. And for some fucked up reason, George Lucas didn't reprise his role and voice the character. I was extremely bummed out the first time, cause I envisioned George Lucas voicing the character, and given someone else filled in his role, it just became a fucking nightmare for me. Because I was like, George Lucas doesn't sound like that! Like, imagine the meme potential. You've seen that out of context clip from Beverly Hills Cop 3 with George Lucas making a cameo, right? You know, maybe I should get the George Lucas voice model made and dub him over. Instead, Baron Papa Noida is voiced by Corey Burton, who was Shockwave in the original Transformers cartoon. Basically, this episode revolves around Baron Papa Noida's daughters being kidnapped by Greedo. Really? This episode is basically a slice of life version of George and his family, given Papa Noida's kids are based on his actual children. Basically, the Trade Federation are the main bad guys, and the entire plot has the entirety of getting Papa Noida's daughters back, which I really did not care about. I guess the biggest turnoff was of course, George Lucas not reprising his role as his character. But the story was not interesting, and it's sort of a rehash of the Clone Wars movie, and Jabba is even a supporting character in this episode. Well, I've made my point clear. I do not like this episode. So let's move on to the next episode. Something I see absolutely no point to. This is a bizarre case where a filler episode has no bearing on anything. Out of all the things they could have explored, they made an episode about... Well, let's talk about it. Padme Amidala, who knows Duchess Satine for some reason, and they don't elaborate on how they know each other personally, which happens a lot in this show, they just introduce things with no explanation when they sort of need to, but anyways, this episode is a crappy commentary on corruption. Basically, these Egyptian mythology... people show up with a bunch of bottles, and they bribe the dock officer to let them pass. At first, I'm like, wait, where are they going with this? So basically Padme and Satine talk about Mandalore's neutrality and stuff that was already touched upon in Season 2 and the next day they see kids being rushed to the hospital. So yeah, they've been having poisonous drinks. The drink is shaped like a brand of iced coffee I occasionally have. I was sort of taken out of the story because of that, but it's only a minor issue. Basically, this episode is a useless first grade look at corruption. No nuances, just people being bribed in poisonous drinks. Certainly a waste of 20 minutes. Also, something I don't understand is why Duchess Satine always puts herself in harm's way, with minimal looking security. You look at the protection the United States President has at all times, it's rather pathetic. Where is her advanced protection? I find it hard to believe that the Death Watch haven't killed her yet. This episode is called Corruption, and I think they should add for first graders to the title. Anyways, next episode. In this episode, Ahsoka is sent to Mandalore to teach people the episode describes as the future of the Mandalorian government, and that includes Satine's crammed in nephew, Corky. Not only is that the stupidest name since Babu Frick, but he was pretty much thrown in amongst the other characters. The corruption arc was weak enough, and I had no investment at all, so I really started to lose track. Basically, Ahsoka is only used as a Jedi character to bail the real main characters out of a jam. Basically, Corky and friends break into a government warehouse and discover more corruption from a hooded figure, who I immediately guessed was the former Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison. Ah! No, I'm just kidding, it's Almac. This show has such predictable reveals. You could also say dramatically most of the reveals mean nothing. Almec was a supporting character with a mitigated personality. He has no presence. And it means little when it's revealed that he's corrupt. It was also very scooby dooish before the Prime Minister is revealed to be the bad guy. Like seriously, it's almost uncanny how much it is like the classic cartoon. As I said before, Ahsoka is only in this episode to bail the non-combat trained characters out of a jam. I was immediately taken out of the story when Ahsoka manages to defeat Almec and his henchmen. I think in this context, Almec should be the clear winner. This is why I do not like Ahsoka. She realistically would have died within the first half of the Clone Wars movie, and that's pushing it. This episode sucks. 
just like the last one. So let's move on to the next. The episode is the one that brings back Aura Sing out of Filoni's asshole. Basically, this episode has Ahsoka and Anakin receive missions from the Jedi Council, where, let me say firsthand, the lighting for the chamber is completely unlike the films, and makes the atmosphere feel different. But anyways, Ahsoka gets a bunch of dreams, which warns her Aura Sing is still alive, and out for Senator Padme Amidala. So what does Ahsoka do? She goes and speaks to Padme about it and basically this is pretty much one of their first proper on-screen interactions i would hopefully think scenes like this would deter an ahsoka shippers but of course not padme discusses how she needs to get to a conference on alderaan for some political shit that she insists is important basically the whole episode is ahsoka going out of her way to prevent an assassination of course Anakin's premonitions about Padme were way more interesting. I don't recall any personal character development between Padme and Ahsoka. The episode tells us that they're close friends. And the episode tries its best to develop the two as friends by having the two lovey-dovey with each other. But then again, Anakin and Obi-Wan as friends was way better. This episode is almost like a watered down representation on the dynamics of the prequel trilogy. I guess it shows how obsessive Ahsoka is with stopping the assassin. And when the conference actually starts, Aura Singh tries to snipe Padme and Ahsoka stops her. But Singh manages to get a non-fatal wound on Padme. And with that being said, the place goes on high alert, and as Ahsoka intercepts the assassin, it's a standoff with her and Padme behind her. And Aura Singh goes down like a bitch. Like, she takes down Ahsoka, but then Padme shoots her with a stun weapon, and that's it. The conflict's over. Go fuck yourself. This entire thing was pretty much only set up for the next two episodes. When it comes to this arc in particular, across all seasons, I think this is poorly paced, but I should probably explain how this episode ends. Since Aura Singh was an idiot who leaked details about her employer, Padme connects the dots and realizes it's Zero the Hutt from the Clone Wars movie. So they go pay Zero Brain Cells a visit and gets a confession out of him way too easily. Almost as easily as Aura Singh. Dave Filoni really should take some cues from L.A. Noir, because I don't buy this one bit. Also, the episode doesn't explain how Zero was able to hire Singh in a prison cell. That's something that would have been nice to know. Jesus, this episode just makes things too easy for the heroes. No tension, no suspense, nothing. Next episode. The next episode has only one redeeming quality, and that's the humorous droid banter. You see, in this pointless episode made to extend an arc that's gone on for long enough at this point, Anakin and Padme send out R2 and 3PO to go get some fruit for a cake. Yeah, sounds pointless. But I guess the real part of this episode is Cad Bane capturing the droids to detract information out of them concerning the layout of the Senate building. Which sounds beyond stupid, because the Senate building is a public building, isn't it? Pretty sure anyone can go there. Can't you just get a spy or a scout to map out the place? You don't need to fucking intercept two droids that belongs to one of the Senators. That's a lot riskier. I can also tell this episode drags shit out. Like, what I mean is that Cad Bane's droid tells R2 to get a droid spa while they kidnap 3PO, but when it turns out he's got no useful information on the layout of the building that they should have just scouted out, they then go and kidnap R2. Like, why didn't you just abduct both of them on the spot? Oh wait, it would make the episode shorter. I get it now. Yeah, I'm not very happy about this episode. Let's just get to the episode after that. This is the episode where they introduce a character from the Star Wars Republic comics, Quinlan Voss. But those initially excited about his return are kicked in the nuts, as we're instead introduced to Quinlan Lebowski as he, no joke, quotes a line from the very movie. Yeah, as you can tell, they totally butchered his character. Filoni, how could you? Expanded Universe fans I've spoken to were extremely bummed out and angry at this out-of-character depiction of the character. Quinlan Voss is supposed to be a very serious dude who's been through a lot of shit. 
Also in this episode, Obi-Wan Kenobi, who's supposed to be great friends with Voss, doesn't speak very highly of him before they meet in this episode. Why did they use Quinlan Voss if they couldn't be bothered to portray him correctly? Like, obviously they know about his character, given his unique force ability in psychometry or whatever the fuck it's called, which is basically the touch something to relive its memories thing that appeared in Fallen Order. Also another thing, Quillen Voss around this time is supposed to be DEEP undercover as one of Dooku's dark acolytes. So what happened? Did he just sneak out all the way out of Separatist space into Coruscant, did this mission and went back? And you realize that via the show's timeline and the multimedia project's timeline, Quillen Voss had already fallen to the dark side. Jesus, that would probably make for one crazy story. I'm actually curious in seeing an author dumb enough to come up with an extremely elaborate and convoluted explanation for all this. Anyways, first impressions of Quinlan Voss suck because it's an unfaithful betrayal. But enough of that. I've made my point. Let's get on with it. So by the episode's title, it's the hunt for Zero. Zero is brought before the Hut Council, and basically, they want his records, but Zero refuses to give it up. It's also here that a minor film character makes their guest appearance, Sai Snoodles. After hearing that Zero the Hut is on Nell Hutter, she pays him a visit. I really did not like this, but then again, I don't think I was supposed to. Zero the Hut and Sai, it seems, had a romantic relationship at one point, and Sai breaks Zero out. And after when the Jedi show up, he's long gone. So it's basically a trace the trail story. The hunt for Zero is fine, I guess. I didn't really see any overt problems with it. Mama the Hut was an interesting design, I guess. And it turns out Sai only got Zero to pull the records out so she could take them and kill him. That was an okay twist, actually, but nothing more. So with that being said, Cad Bane, who's in this episode, arrives too late, and the Jedi show up and fight him in a surprisingly cool fight scene. So that's a definite highlight. And of course, the only one at the end who truly wins is Sai Snoodles. A miscellaneous thing I wanted to talk about is how Dave Filoni changed the Hut species' genders, so instead of having both male and female organs, they're either male or female. God damn it. Anyways, next episode. The next episode is called Heroes on Both Sides. We're three seasons in, and only now we're talking about the Separatists being good. Really feels like Filoni went into this show with a checklist of topics for each episode, rather than having them being an overarching thing. Heroes on Both Sides starts with a Senate meeting debate on whether or not to continue the war at the cost of finances or find peace at the cost of pride. The politics in the show, I must say, is extremely simplistic. It's basically either pro or anti-war senators. The pro-war senators are the bad guys, and the anti-war are the good guys. This show foils its opportunity to explain why peace has not been achieved. Like Palpatine orchestrating the war to get more power is only the tip of the iceberg, and there's so much more to tell in regards to this topic. So anyways, in this episode, the Senate has a vote on whether or not to end the war. There's a shady thing going on behind the scenes, where a senator along with representatives from both the Trade Federation and the Banking Clan plan an attack on Coruscant to keep the war going. With that being said, the episode follows Padme and Ahsoka, as Padme discusses her friend in the Separatist Alliance, Mina Bonteri. Padme explains that she left the Republic, but she isn't a bad person, and I guess this episode does challenge Ahsoka's view on the Separatists a little bit, but I don't recall it contributing to anything else in the show. Okay, maybe it might contribute something in Season 5, but I'd have to watch that as well. So anyways, they go to visit her Separatist friend, and this show is so simplistic with its concept that it's a fucking joke. Seriously, the entire episode is literally, there are heroes on both sides. And Ahsoka meets Bonteri's son Lux, and they're super nice with each other. You can just tell right away that Filoni is shipping the two. It was that obvious, and I was just startled on how it's so predictable. So Padme and Bonteri try to get both their respective sides to end the war. We finally get a taste of the Separatist Council, 
took you long enough, and it's basically how many people have to die, and all that war, what is it good for crap, except Edwin Starr was a way better spokesperson than this gal the show made up for this one moment. So the Separatists vote to try doing peace with the Republic, and it seems that first peace is finally at the door, but then Count Dooku contacts the corporate representatives and tells them to organize the terrorist attack. So Grievous is tasked with sending a bunch of droids who do just that, and it leads to the war continuing as people are convinced that the Separatists organized this attack to lower the Republic's guard. Gee, this episode has no nuances, and it isn't the deep critique it thinks it is. Next! Oh wait, the next episode picks up when the last one took off, in a forgettable, terrible episode where Padme and her senator friends are all hunted down by assassins and they repel it. And it turns out Count Dooku also announces a Republic attack on Separatist soil, killing Bon Terry. Oh boo hoo. Telling rather than showing, my favorite. Anyhow, let's get on with the next episode. The episode with a big turning point for Ventress, for better or for worse, yeah. Basically, Palps contacts Dooku and tells him that Ventress is getting too powerful, which is laughable given the amount of battles she's lost, and that he needs to eliminate her. Dooku hesitates for like 20 seconds, and then he decides to obey his master. Dooku tells Palpatine that Ventress is his prized apprentice, because that will make us care about this heartbreaking betrayal. Seriously guys, that's it. On top of this, I don't like Ventress anyways, so this betrayal is utterly meaningless. Especially for what Ventress does after she's betrayed. She has one final confrontation with Anakin and Obi-Wan, as Dooku orders the ship she's on destroyed. And she's presumed dead. But Filoni just can't fucking kill off a character, unless they've absolutely outlived any relevancy. But by that point, their death would mean nothing. So boo hoo. Ventress is betrayed, but survives, and some thugs show up to salvage from the battle, and she fucking murders them. And then she goes to her home world, which isn't Rat Attack, instead it's Dathomir, which the planet itself is fucked up too. They got the terrain wrong, and turned Dathomir into a red foggy place which it isn't supposed to be. Surrounded by Dathomirians, which are not supposed to be an alien race, cause from what I heard, According to stories like the courtship of Princess Leia, many Dathomirians were human. Well, you can forget about that now. So, in this show's context, the Dathomirian witches anticipate her return. I have no idea why she decided to return to Dathomir if she hadn't been there since she was an infant, but whatever. They take her in and do some Night Sister magic on her as Ventress gets flashbacks to her past. And you can tell by these flashbacks that Filoni absolutely knew Ventress's backstory and didn't bother to abide by it. As we see Jedi Master Kai Nerik take her on as his Padawan on Rat Attack. Yeah, in unison with the expanded universe, Ventress has one confusing backstory and she turned to the dark side when Nerik died. Oh boo hoo. When I get around to reading the Clone Wars Multimedia Project, I expect not to be disappointed in that version of Ventress as much as I was here. So with that being said, the clan leader, Mother Talzin, offers Ventress help in killing her old master. So Ventress and two of the Night Sisters become semi-invisible and are given Jedi weapons, because Dooku must believe the attack was orchestrated by the Jedi in case it fails, and they get a poison dart too. So they go raiding Dooku's house and give him the dart, which doesn't work at all for some reason, and Dooku fights off the three, and leaves Ventress as the sole survivor. I could talk about more, but the second half of the episode felt like it was stretching out shit because Ventress's lifespan was greatly extended. And the episode ends with Count Dooku being contacted by Mother Talzin, who offers him a new apprentice. So that's what the next episode is about. Dooku arrives on Dathomir, and Mother Talzin and him talk about how Darth Maul's bloodline is still alive, in the form of his distant siblings, and probably cousins and whatnot. Gee, I wonder how that's gonna age. Anyways, Talzin promises him an apprentice, and he leaves to await his new apprentice. And next comes a ruthless competition between Knight Brothers that would make The Apprentice, the show formerly hosted by Donald Trump, shun instantly. 
Basically, the Knight Brothers are told to line up for Ventress. The two Knight Brothers of Notice are two brothers named Savage and Feral. Probably the only great thing in the episode is their bond, sticking out for each other and shit. Hope that doesn't go to waste. Anyways, Ventress attacks three of them that she believes are too weak to be a candidate for Dooku's apprentice. After she's done being harsh, the ones that aren't cast out are forced to fight Ventress. The first round has Ventress easily overpower them, and call them all pathetic fighters and whatnot. Afterwards, it's a round of lethal hunger games. One by one, Ventress takes out a Knight Brother, until it's only Savage and Feral left. Savage looks out for his brother, and will not Ventress harm him. He demands that she let his brother go, and she does, before they fight some more. With Savage, of course, losing, but I guess that wasn't the point. Then the episode is ruined when Savage becomes a dumb brute thanks to Night Sister Magic. They talk about him being a perfect male specimen. I don't know, but I think that might be a metaphor for something. He at first strangles Ventress, but then lets her go after she asks him to. And basically, this guy is turned into a slave who doesn't know any better, as they bring forth Feral, and Savage strangles him to death when ordered to, and he does so with no mercy. Gee, if Night Sister Magic could turn someone into a completely different person, then why can't... You know what, never mind. I'm 70% convinced that something like this is totally stretching the force, because it makes things too easy, but still. Savage Oppressed becomes a dude with potential, to someone with no potential, and for what I've seen, he stays that way. Later down the line, he becomes you-know-who's sidekick, and very little else. That's one way to waste an interesting character. I've seen videos about Savage's brother and how he matters, but he really doesn't. He's not part of this rigid character once the Night Sister magic comes on, so I see no point to any of this. Anyways, he's given his staff and presented to Dooku. Dooku is impressed, and he tasks Savage with taking out Republic forces on Deveron. So the next scene has him absolutely obliterate Republic forces, the clones and the two Jedi, and hey, we finally got the Separatists winning a battle. Too bad we had to wait until mid-season 3 to see the Separatists win for once. So picking up from that, we get the most bizarre, cherry-picked cameo in this entire show, Delta Squad. In the show's context, they were sent to the moon of Deveron, which I thought the Separatists would have taken over by now, but whatever. Anyways, Delta Squad are sent to Deveron to investigate, and Boss says there was no survivors. The show has no context for who these guys are. A casual fan is gonna watch this and think, who in the fuck are these guys? And also warm up to the sad batch. It makes me sick to my stomach when that happens. With that being said, the Jedi have a discussion as Ventress was presumed dead, and she was the only one who probably could have performed such a feat. Yeah, or General Grievous, why'd you guys forget about him? Or am I supposed to believe Grievous was weaker than Ventress? What sense does that make? Anyways, we get a training session between Dooku and Savage. Dooku defects all of his attacks and calls him sloppy and slow. I guess this scene was here for character establishment. Anyways, we get a scene of Obi-Wan being shown a hologram of Savage Press, murdering everyone on Deveron. At first, Kenobi thinks it's Darth Maul, but Yoda points out that it's merely a member of the same species. And they flat out say that Maul is from Dathomir, and Obi-Wan is like, I thought he was from Iridonia. You are correct, Obi-Wan. It's just that the overrated cowboy influencing your decision doesn't know that. Or he does, and he just doesn't give a shit. So Obi-Wan realizes that he must go to Dathomir and confront the Knight Sisters. They go to Dathomir, and after a scuttle with the Knight Brothers, they tell the pair to go ask Mother Talzin. So they do just that. And Talzin points them to Toydaria. Then, after they leave, Ventress is told she has no more time. It's all or nothing. She must attempt to take Dooku down now. I don't have a lot of complaints about this. Ventress would have no patience in this instance for revenge, so it makes sense in context. It's her one and only shot at revenge. So Anakin and Obi-Wan go to Toydaria, where Savage straight up murders the king from Season 1, Episode 1. That's no longer an asset. Although I don't recall it doing any tactical damage to the Republic in the rest of the show. Anyways, Savage escapes after a brief fight and returns to Dooku, who punishes him because he wanted the king alive. Then Ventress shows up, as well as Anakin and Obi-Wan boarding the ship, 
and it becomes a flunk of different characters causing haywire, and it's not actually half bad. Although given Filoni's track record, stakes are lowered because I know the two characters who we don't know the fates of, Ventress and Savage, don't matter because Filoni will just extend their lifespans until they're no longer needed. And since most of his characters only die when they start to wear off, I just don't care. And what do you know? All parties escape after Savage turns on both Ventress and Dooku. And the episode ends on the cliffhanger of Savage returning to Talzin and being tasked with searching for his brother Maul, who is somehow still alive. But that's a discussion for another time. Now we're on to the Mortis arc. Uh oh. I think I have a lot to say about this arc, because a lot happens in it. And as well as that, I want to talk about cut and deleted scenes regarding this arc. So you're ready? Here we go! So the setup for this entire arc is a distress message and so Anakin, Ahsoka and Obi-Wan planning to rendezvous with Captain Rex and then being sucked into a giant bright white light and they wake up with their shuttle still intact. They see they're on a mystic world, strong in the force. First problem, the characters act more casually to being in this mysterious place than you'd expect. I don't care if they're attuned with the force, literally anyone without prior experience would have pissed themselves the moment they laid eyes on this. Like seriously, you're in a place unnaturally strong with the force and you guys aren't as interested as you probably should be. I almost imagine the writers thought this place would be different to whoever designed the environment. Now, I'm aware that the Mortis arc has a more metaphorical purpose than anything, and understanding the purpose of the arc isn't so simple. So I conducted some research on what things are supposed to mean. What actually happened was kept secretive by Dave Filoni himself, because I guess he too likes mystery boxes. The trio come across this goddess looking character known as the Daughter. Again, the trio acts so fucking casually to being on this planet. Why are they acting this way? The Daughter refers to Anakin as the One and tells him to follow her. So the trio do that. At this point, I'm getting annoyed that these characters really don't act like they're in a magical place. Like I would have expected something more like the Wizard of Oz or something. Instead, we've got the three characters acting like they're in a pub. Like, I think it's clear that they're supposed to be trapped here for a while at best. After some non-serious banter, Anakin gets separated by the others after some rock falls down and separates them. And Anakin decides to continue following the daughter and ignores Obi-Wan as Ahsoka and Obi-Wan decide to return to their ship. When Obi-Wan and Ahsoka return, they again act so casual that their ship is gone. Then the crops start dying and this guy who looks like something a fan drew for a Star Wars art contest that managed to win shows up. Voiced by Sam Witwer, who played Starkiller in The Force Unleashed, and you can tell by his voice. This is the son. The stereotypically dark side looking motherfucker. And as much as I like Sam Witwer as Starkiller, the voice doesn't really work here. I don't know if it was because I recognized him, but it really doesn't fit with the character in question. So the son asks a question about Anakin, and of course, both Obi-Wan and Ahsoka ignite their lightsabers at him, and he just disables them. Then he tells them as it starts raining that the storms are quite lethal, so they should find shelter and then transforms into a bat and flies away. Cut to Anakin hiking up a tower, and when he makes it up there, he comes across this giant beardo face. I told you that's not my name! Telling him that he will see if he's the chosen one, and some other mystic shit, and again, I'm taken out of the episode because all the characters react casually to this absurd situation. Giant beardo face tells him he can sleep at his place tonight, and so we cut to Obi-Wan and Ahsoka. They've set up a camp within a cave, and who shows up but Qui-Gon Jinn. Qui-Gon as a force ghost, talks to Obi-Wan about Anakin being the chosen one and stuff. I was really confused on what the conflict of this episode is supposed to be. I know, I'm not supposed to take this arc literally, but at face value, the episode is not very clear. It seems that the trio are being bothered every now and then. Anakin sleeping meets a vision of his mother, discussing his guilt and how he struggles with it. Which I mean, I've hardly heard Anakin talk about his mother since the show began, and I half forgot she existed within the show's context, but hey, we've got a cameo now, haven't we? Yeah, something the show doesn't understand is that cramming in a dramatic moment 
instead of having it be gradual doesn't make for good character development. I'll talk about this as we go along the entire show. We've also got Ahsoka in the cave talking to a version of herself from the future, or at least that's what it's supposed to represent. The vision warns her that Anakin may be her downfall and warns her to leave the planet. All of the visions and mystic shit so far, this one seems the least confusing. I did not like Ahsoka's future design. It looks too clunky and slender at the same time. I don't know how to describe it beyond that. It made for a very off-putting vision. Obi-Wan wakes Ahsoka up, and Ahsoka tells him that Anakin might be in trouble. Cut back to Anakin confronting Giant Beardo Face, and we get some exposition on who the Giant Beardo Face and the other two beings are. They are known as Force Wielders, and few know of their existence. All three of them are trapped there, and it is necessary that it stays that way, because if his children were let free, it would tear the very fabric of the universe apart. And the giant Beardo face incorrectly describes balance when he says that controlling them is the way of keeping balance. As I've discussed in previous videos, that's not how balance works. And to those unaware, it's quite simple. The light side is balance, the dark side is in balance. I have a video explaining the Force as clearly as I can for more information. For what I've seen upon further research, apparently this isn't supposed to be taken literally, and that the real symbolism is Anakin's arc in the Star Wars saga. This is what Geeslees tried to explain about this arc, and I'm just repeating what they said to the best of my ability. The son and the daughter apparently aren't just the personifications of the light and the dark as they are the personifications of elements that feed the light and the dark. They aren't the same as the literal light side and dark side, but I suppose maybe I should talk more about this when the arc is actually completed. For now, let's assume that everything on Mortis actually happened and move on. Giant Beardo Face wants to know if Anakin is the chosen one, and he tells Anakin if he passes one test, he will be allowed to leave alongside his master and apprentice. Cut to Obi-Wan and Ahsoka walking across the planet, and then just like a magpie during mating season, they get swooped and flown away, and this is where the test for Anakin comes in. He has to save either Obi-Wan or save Ahsoka. Well that's an easy choice isn't it? Obi-Wan is the one who should be saved, and that was such an easy decision and so Anakin sacrifices Ahsoka, and then leaves with Obi-Wan and, I'm just kidding, Anakin decides to try and save both of them. At this point, I'm fed up with Ahsoka for all the continuity she broke. But Filoni used absurd means to keep her alive. So we get this admittingly cool looking spectacle where he summons the Force to free the both of them. And grip the son and the daughter away from his friends. After that, Giant Beardo Face congratulates him and is like, Oh my gosh, you are indeed the chosen one. Okay, dude, I'm dying and I need a replacement. Will you take my place? And Anakin is like, no way, bro, I'm leaving. And Giant Beardo Face just takes it without any issues and they're allowed to leave. Thing is, we've got two more episodes with this arc. So unfortunately, we're not done yet. So in the next episode, we start with Anakin having a vision where the sun tries to lure him to the dark side. And again, they talk more about balancing the force, and it makes me wonder at this point if Geesley's video was trying to explain a contradiction with mental gymnastics, or if this arc is secretly genius, and you know which camp I fall into. And the son shows up for real and kidnaps Ahsoka. So Anakin and Obi-Wan pursue him and they crash. Another happy landing. There is some arguing between Anakin and Obi-Wan, and I suppose Obi-Wan's reasoning to talk to the father does make sense given he and Ahsoka have hardly interacted with one another. Meanwhile, Ahsoka is chained up, and a creature who later turns out to be the sun, frees her and then bites her hand, which knocks her out. Which by the way, Ahsoka gets knocked out enough times in this show to get brain damage. Jesus Christ. In the next shot, turns out Obi-Wan chose to stay by the ship, and when he sees that giant Beardo faces tower is above, he chooses to climb it. Then we've got the Force Wielders, particularly Giant Beardo Face and the Sun, talk about the Sun's draw towards the dark side, and the Sun pulls some Force Lightning and tries to kill him before flying away. So with that, the daughter tells Obi-Wan about a magic sword that can be used to stop the Sun, and so he takes it from some pillar thingy. Meanwhile, Anakin starts panicking when he finds Ahsoka corrupted by the Sun, and they duel. 
And I really hate how in this kind of battle, Anakin refers to Ahsoka as Snips, so casually, which adds to these characters not acting like they're in the magical kingdom of Oz, on top of the fact that Anakin may be forced to kill Ahsoka. I say maybe, because we all know Filoni's stance on his bay. So a fight scene occurs between Anakin and Obi-Wan versus the corrupted Ahsoka and the daughter versus the son. Both end up with the son winning. As he obtains the sword, even giant Beardo face showing up doesn't deter the son from winning. He kills Ahsoka and fully intends to kill giant Beardo face but ends up accidentally killing the daughter instead. Well, thank God Ahsoka's dead. They've broken enough continuity as it is and, oh fuck off, you're just gonna resurrect her using the life force of the daughter. Not sure you can do that. And it reminds me of Force Heal and the Rise of Skywalker. But anyways, since Filoni will never let his bay go, Ahsoka gets to live. And the cliffhanger to the next episode is about stopping the sun. Next episode, the trio decide now is the time to get off world, but since Anakin is a bastard, he decides to go and resolve this conflict between the Force wielders. And so Anakin offers to help giant Beardo face defeat the sun, but giant Beardo face decides his father sun time should be between the two of them alone, and says that the sun will use Anakin against himself. He tells Anakin to find the answer through the force or something like that. That's where Anakin comes across a vision of Qui-Gon Jinn who talks about him being the chosen one and tells him that if he wants to resolve this conflict, he must go to a place on Mortis known as the Well of the Dark Side. Giant Beardo Face then shows up to the ship and tells Obi-Wan and Ahsoka that Anakin is going to the well. And as well as that, Anakin is shown the future by the sun and sees a glimpse of who he will become. And it's not subtle. Something that occurred to me is when Anakin became Darth Vader, how did he not see all of this coming? Part of Anakin being manipulated was doing the terrible shit he did for his wife, but the thing is, if he saw these things ahead of time, then wouldn't he see that he's doing the wrong thing or something? Like prequel haters like to say Anakin was an idiot who couldn't figure out that Palpatine was manipulating him, and of course the irony being that those same people couldn't figure out why the Trade Federation was blockading Naboo, so they're not ones to talk about any character being an idiot. And to sum up the rest of the episode, the sun corrupts Anakin, and the sun retrieves the dagger, and Anakin is corrupted, which makes me wonder why he was corrupted in the first place, if he was going to turn back so quickly, and all the characters have a clash, and it ends with giant Beardo face and the sun dying. And giant Beardo face talks to Anakin about being the chosen one, and dies, before the whole place goes haywire, and the trio wake up in their ship in space with Captain Rex contacting them, informing them they were lost for just a moment, leaving it ambiguous on what really happened in the past three episodes. So, my impressions about these three episodes are that they're okay, I guess. I mean, it does feel like they bend a lot of rules about the Force, and potentially reveal too much about the Force, but at the same time, it's not that simple, because the episode leaves things ambiguous on what really happened, Dave Filoni also refused to tell us what happened. From what I've researched, the arc is basically symbolism about Anakin's arc in the original saga, being corrupted and then bring balance to the force and stuff and everything about the son and the daughter and balance isn't meant to be taken literally. This arc has more depth and more intrigue than The Last Jedi, no duh, but it also feels trippy for the sake of it and bending a lot of rules, but also excused by the fact that the events are left ambiguous. But something that tells me Filoni had no idea what he was doing was the deleted scene with Revan and Darth Bane, where the son was supposed to meet the two Sith Lords as spirits, but George told Filoni to cut it out because Sith do not become Force Ghosts. And also the entire scene retconned what happened to both Revan and Bane at the time of their deaths. I have planned reviews for Knights of the Old Republic and the Darth Bane trilogy, so I guess this is just a tease for the future. Something else I wanted to talk about is that Anakin's dark side moments in this show don't constitute a compelling arc. The show just throws in moments of Anakin embracing the dark side, and it's more of a standout moment because it wasn't gradual. Rey, for example, sucks as a character because she just believed in the Force and never struggled with it. It was poor writing on top of a fundamental misunderstanding of the Force. This show just gives dark side moments to Anakin and pretends it contributes to his arc, when really, it doesn't. 
Anakin doesn't even behave like he's supposed to. He grew out of being a reckless teenager in a few months, and now the show gives him an apprentice. As if the council would ever trust him to do that. So now that we're done talking about the Mortis arc, let's talk about the Citadel. The Citadel, if you ignore the retcons, isn't actually that bad. Problem is, the retcons shouldn't be ignored, so let's talk about them. The Citadel arc starts by saying that Evan Piel has been captured by the Separatists, and that he has vital hyperspace lane info that will give either side the advantage, and is being held in a prison known as the Citadel. The Citadel is like a maximum security prison in which no one has ever fucking escaped ever. So the Jedi plan to break their fellow Jedi out, but who else to send but Anakin, Obi-Wan, and the boys? Of course, since Ahsoka needs to be in every fucking episode at this point, she shows up and insists she come along. And of course, Anakin tells her no. But all it takes for Ahsoka to go anyways is talking to Plo Koon, and she gets his permission. So anyways, the characters are frozen in Carbonite, which doesn't make any sense because it was stated in Empire Strikes Back that Carbonite is potentially fatal. So the characters going in Carbonite without protection is just plain stupid. But anyways, all of them survive being frozen and are shipped off to Separatist space, with a bunch of reprogrammed battle droids bringing them there. For some reason, the Carbonite wards off the life scanners, which I don't buy, but plot progression at any cost. We also meet the prison warden, this guy, who sounds like someone who would better fit a prisoner character than the prison warden. Anyways, they get unsealed from Carbonite, and unlike Han Solo, recover within a minute from the effects of being unfrozen. Which reinforces that they have no idea how Carbonite freezing works. But after that, the writing seems to recover, showing how the prison has been sealed off quite well. And so the crew are forced to do conventional climbing to get up, even though that wall doesn't look climbable. They sneak past some droids, and Ahsoka fits through the air ducts and lets everyone else in. But conveniently a clone trooper trips and falls to his death, setting off the alarms. The warden sets up the security protocols, and essentially it's a fight to Evan Peel. Another clone trooper, Longshot, dies along the way. Again, the throwaway clones die so easily. It isn't as bad as the episode Rookies, but still. So anyways, Evan Peel is freed by the crew, and he says that the hyperspace lane info is also held by his captain held somewhere else in the prison. After a bit of an action sequence where the warden magnetizes everything to the ceiling, including Anakin's hand, they manage to switch the magnets off with one slash and they outmaneuver the warden. They make it to the captain's cell, and guess who it is? Why of course! It's none other than Will Huff Tarkin. I'm not sure, but this is probably a retcon, given Tarkin was something else during the Clone Wars. Like I think he was a governor or something. But I can't quite remember. So take it with a grain of salt. Anyways, Obi-Wan suggests they split into teams of two. Tarkin suggests going as one so they have strength in numbers. Throughout this episode, it's shown that Tarkin is prone to disagreements. Such as when Anakin and Tarkin disagree. It's very on the nose and I'm like, I get it, they have differing philosophies, it didn't have to be this blatant. So on to the next episode. In the next episode, it's basically the middle breakout episode. Not much to criticize here, except for the fact when they capture the escape ship, the blue reprogrammed droids aren't suspicious for some reason. Since now these droids became a factor in the group's escape. Basically, the episode consists of Obi-Wan's group getting captured, and then escorted only to be freed by the reprogrammed battle droids. While Anakin's group goes along the surface and the fuel lines, and when the two groups meet up, they go to the hangar to steal the shuttle and the battle ensues. Echo perishes, who until season 7 is presumed dead. You know, re-watching this, it made me realise how little of a shit I gave about Echo or Fives. We don't spend enough time with either of them, they're mostly drop-in, drop-out characters. Echo was only in five episodes so far, in late season three before he's presumed dead. That's better than most characters, but I only remember him at this point for his name and thereby his gimmick. Next episode. So anyways, they don't give us much time to think about Echo, which already adds to his hollow presumed death. Instead, it's the team hiking amongst the caves, knowing that the Jedi Council and the Republic fleet is coming to get them. Which I mean, they're deep into Separatist space, so I don't buy it. What I mean is that wouldn't there be something that the universe accounts for in regards to stuff like this? How a sizable fleet would automatically just enter wherever the fuck they want without resistance? 
Anyways, this episode doesn't have much plot. It's mostly the characters repelling ambushes. But with that, even Peel fucking dies. Which is a huge retcon, because he originally survived Order 66. So that doesn't make sense, unless he was magically revived later down the line. Evan Peel before his death tells Ahsoka the intel, and they bury him and blah blah. They move forward, intending to escape, and with that, the Warden almost kills Tarkin, but because G Cannon is absolute, Ahsoka is the one that saves him by stabbing the Warden. And then the ships show up and they escape. The Republic wins again, with Ahsoka knowing the intel and Tarkin surviving. So it's all intact. They end the episode with some very on-the-nose ideology bullshit, and that's the Citadel arc. What could we possibly end on? Unsurprisingly, it would have been better if they ended it with a different arc. How to One Lost is basically another Ahsoka-centric episode, which I just can't stand. But anyways, the episode starts with a continuing battle on Felucia, which at this point, why the hell is Felucia so important? The show to my recollection never made it clear why they're taking Felucia. I assume it has something to do with geography, but then again, Filoni's really bad at galactic geography. Anakin, his apprentice, and Plo Koon are leading their forces. Ahsoka is ordered to take a separatist base, but is ambushed by Trandoshans and kidnapped. Conveniently, the clone troopers that accompanied her don't witness her being stunned, which seemed a little bit too absurd because the moment she's out of sight from the clone troopers, she's kidnapped. What the shit? Anyway, she's locked in a cage, and we see the motive behind the Trandoshans who kidnapped her. Along with many others, they're going to be let free and hunted down for sport. At this point, I'm fed up with Ahsoka, so I fully support what they're trying to do. But pushing my biases aside, they're let free and they're hunted down like animals. Turns out some other Jedi younglings were also kidnapped so they team up. The main one of interest is a girl named Khalifa, along with a Syrian named Omer, and a Twi'lek named Jinx. Stupid, but I don't feel like losing my sanity. Anakin tries searching for Ahsoka, but it leads to a dead end. As Ahsoka sneaks across the jungle, we see the Trandoshan leader has a son that he's sending out on the hunt. Ahsoka throughout the course of this episode really annoys me. She cannot relate to the other younglings who have been stuck here for god knows how long, and she doesn't seem to adapt quickly. One of the Trandoshans fucking ambushes the group, and Khalifa has him at a force grip, but Ahsoka keeps chanting Jedi principles that don't matter in this situation. It's kill or be killed, you stupid bitch. I think Ahsoka is supposed to be a mediator as someone who just got here. But just like the Mortis arc, the situation she's plunged in just doesn't feel right. Anyways, Ahsoka manages to kill one of the hunters, and Khalifa is mortally wounded in the process and dies. Turns out that specific hunter was the son of the leader, Garnak. A criticism I have of this episode is that Ahsoka should be easily overpowered by these Trandoshans, being a skinny teenage girl along with the other younglings, but they push the suspension of disbelief too far in this arc. Ahsoka survives a lot of impossible odds, which is another example of an arc where she could have died. Then in the next episode, they have Ahsoka and the others ambush one of the hunter's transport ships and free a guest character, Chewbacca. And I'm like, why wasn't he introduced earlier? It would have made this episode more believable if they had a Wookiee as an ally. But with that being said, they capture a hunter and mind trick him with minimal experience, which of course I don't buy. It leads to them raiding the main ship as Ahsoka fucking takes the leader head on and unrealistically defeats Garnak and kills him by force pushing him off a balcony. The Wookiees were barely used in this two episode arc and they could have been used as a factor that kept Ahsoka and the other younglings alive. But Filoni will never make his bay look weak. We see her overpower Trandoshans. I know that they aren't as strong as Wookiees but come on. And this certainly wasn't epic enough to be a season finale. With that being said, that's season 3. As you could tell, there were a few bright spots, but not enough to enjoy the actual seasons. More rat cons, more stupid writing, and generally more bullshit. This season just sucks. Given this is when Filoni groupies say the show gets good, I look pessimistic at the future of my viewing experience with TCW. I do not expect to enjoy Season 4, and I already don't think very highly of Season 7 in retrospect. So let's see how better or worse they can do.
next time. TCW Season 3 gets a 4 out of 10, which is slightly lower than Season 2. And the reason why is because the season is just so stupid. It is not a deep show at all. The episode about corruption was so cookie cutter that it had to be an early draft mistaken for the final version. TCW, I really don't like. I used to, but the show has aged badly, and as we go on, we'll continue to see why. <sighs> so to wrap this video up, here are my patrons on screen. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories by mystery boxes? The Clone Wars is overrated. I haven't said that enough. I was utterly unimpressed in my rewatch of the show, because there's just a lot of cracks. And with that being said, people say the Clone Wars just gets better and better as it goes on. Personally, so far, with the first three seasons, the show has just gotten worse. Maybe because the show retcons more and more things, and as well as that, Dave Filoni really got carried away with what he was doing. I have wondered whether or not Dave Filoni actually thinks he's a hardcore Star Wars nerd who knows everything about the universe, because the only thing bigger than his hat is his arrogance. Filoni is the kind of guy who relies on George to bail him out. Sort of like the journalists who rely on George as a scapegoat. That's no way to treat your franchise creator, but it happens. Filoni, now that I think about it, sounds more like a pizza topping than the surname of a guy who makes entertainment. The Clone Wars was made to fulfill an agenda. Just not a woke one. Filoni has convinced people that he is the go-to guy for Star Wars, which he's not and never will be. Filoni contradicts his own canon on a whim whenever he feels like it. People think Filoni's going to retcon the sequel trilogy or that the Mandalorian saves Star Wars. That's laughable. Filoni is the embodiment of the casual Star Wars fan who acts like he knows everything. Sort of like Cosmonaut Variety Hour. He cherry-picks stuff from the Expanded Universe to give the illusion that he's a hardcore fan. Honestly, I think the Filoni-verse should have just been its own canon detached from the Expanded Universe. That's the only way Filoni's show could work. The OG6 movies are always primary canon, and everything is split into different canons. So let's talk about The Clone Wars Season 4, the season that really introduced a lot of big things, and see how much Filoni butchered the Expanded Universe. Let's rip in. So the first arc is inspired by a segment from the Clone Wars micro series concerning the world of Mon Calamari, or Mon Cala. Basically what's happened is that tensions run high on the world since the king of the Mon Calamari has been assassinated, and succession dictates his son, Lee Cha, take over. And right off the bat, he sounds exactly like CDI Link. You know, that terrible annoying voice that is heavily memed upon. The opening scene is the Quarren refusing Lee Char as their leader, and included amongst the show's laundry list of cameos, Guile Akbar. Why do I suspect that they're retconning something about him? Hmm. Anyways, we get a bare bones establishment for why the Quarren want to leave the Republic. It's the same old cookie cutter shit Filoni has made the audience used to at this point. Despite there being an advantage of time over the micro series, there is barely any reasoning beyond the Quarren don't like the Mon Calamari that much. This is practically identical to any other Clone Wars planetary conflict episode, just with a change of scenery. It utterly fails to be an improvement upon the micro series, despite its advantage of time. The primary antagonist seems to be the shark guy, who is under the direct command of Count Dooku. Not only is the symbolism for his design so overt, but they literally reenact the scene from Finding Nemo when the shark dude tries to murder Lee Cha. Mostly this is a spectacle episode. The one compliment I will give this episode is the effective weapon the Separatists have, which are basically half-mechanic jellyfish that kill instantly if touched. There's this really simplistic arc about how Lee Cha needs to learn to become a leader, and so he learns to do this in what feels like a weekend. This is a similar problem that Solo had. 
that it just had Han Solo meet Chewbacca, get his iconic equipment, do the castle run, win the Falcon, and all this other crap in the span of a weekend. Ultimate proof that the Han Solo movie should have just been delegated to a novel. Anyways, this conflict is hollow as all hell. The Separatists at first have the upper hand by the end of the first episode, and this is part of a predictable formula, where they make you think it's going to be serious, but then the Republic will pop back up and win the day. For the millionth time. By the start of the second episode, they tried to make us dislike the bad guys with the passing mention of all the Mon Calamari, including women and children, being put in internment camps. Telling rather than showing. My favourite! This isn't the sort of moment where it's like Anakin ignited the lightsaber at the younglings before cutting away. It's just a cheap bit of telling rather than showing. Plus, they don't even detail what's going on in these internment camps. Is it like... Well, you know, or is it just a summer camp? I don't know, and I don't care. The conflict is so weak and poorly strung along that it made me roll my eyes. On the upside, they do implement Gungans into this arc when they run out of clone reinforcements suited for underwater combat. The Jedi at the temple contact the Gungans, and Jar Jar, like a true mad lad, instantly accepts the offer for help when he learns that Senator Amidala is in trouble. So that's a plus. But soon afterwards, the episodes resort back to non-deep themes about inspiring hope as a leader. I still haven't seen a hint of this being a deep show, because as far as I remember, the Mortis arc had no idea what it was doing, and hid heavily behind ambiguity. Anyways, everyone except Ahsoka and Lee Chara captured, with Anakin and Kit Fisto interrogated on where the prince is. Somehow, Ahsoka and Lee Char easily sneak into the prison camp without being detected. And here, I thought it was a fucking joke, because it's like Hitman on very easy mode, where it has enemies that constantly move in a way where you can proceed to roll in, and are deaf and blind to everything. This is extremely absurd, and it takes a while for Lee Char to get detected too. We've also got Jaws puncture Padme's suit in an effort to draw out a confession from Anakin and Fisto. When Lee Char gets captured, he requests an audience in the throne room. And when contacted, Shark Dude says he'll meet him there. We're also going to mention that the Quarren Senator who sided with the Separatists is openly expressing doubt on the side he's chosen. And Shark Dude publicly announces that he's intended to be leader of the Mon Calamari. You can easily tell that the Quarren Senator learning this is going to give him a change of heart. There's also a ridiculous moment where Jar Jar spit is able to cover Armadala's helmet cracks. Gee, what weed was Filoni smoking there? Anyways, there's a confrontation between Shark Dude and Lee Cha. Again, I can't take Lee Cha seriously when he's trying to convince the Quarren Senator to join him and lead the Separatists out. Shark Dude orders the execution of Lee Cha, and in a very unimpressive set piece, in a gathering the size of a small funeral, Lee Char is about to be executed, but predictably, the Quarren have a change of heart and unite against Shark Dude. Everyone is freed and they start fighting against Separatist Tyranny. This all leads to a hollow confrontation between Shark Dude and Lee Char, in which Lee Char attaches a bomb and blows the shark up. Jaws isn't happy. Anyways, Lee Char is crowned as the new king, and everything is hunky-dory. They also change Mina Till's gender from male to female during this arc. Another classic retcon. Well then, that wasn't a very impressive start. They had the advantage over the micro-series, and they squandered it. Also, why the hell would every single Quarren turn back on a dime to Mon Calamari royalty? Wouldn't there be some fixing up left to do? That's another case of the show not earning anything. This seems to be a classic Filoni problem, ignoring implications and just wrapping stuff up without sufficient work. Then comes another episode I forgot existed. I forgot so much that re-watching it didn't recount my memory, so I'm wondering if I originally skipped it or not. The setup for this episode is just plain stupid. Apparently, right after the Gungans helped liberate Mon Calamari, they are now suspects in a conspiracy to take over Naboo. I don't know when this episode takes place, but watching this episode after episode, this just makes the whole thing feel disjointed. Anyways, Jar Jar is still loyal, because of course he is, so he, Armadala, and Anakin travel down to the Gungan city to meet the leader, who isn't Boss Nass. 
Filoni, why the fuck wasn't Boss Nass the leader in this episode? He quite clearly is still the leader in episode 3. What were you thinking? Instead, it's this thin Gungan who isn't as memorable as the real deal. Right off the bat, Jar Jar and friends realize that Boss Thin Bag is acting strangely, and it turns out that he has a mind control device around his neck. Mind control? Oh, oh no. Turns out a traitorous Gungan minister is working with, you guessed it, Count Dooku. When confronted by Boss Thinbag, the Gungan Minister flat out stabs Thinbag. It's actually sort of bizarre. Basically, Minister Ratbag escapes, and Thinbag is left in critical condition. And then the dumbest plot contrivance happens. Apparently, Jar Jar looks identical to Minister Thinbag, so he can just pose as him. What? That's ridiculous. And then you think about it and then you're like, oh, that's why Boss Nass isn't in this episode or any episode of TCW, period. So basically, Jar Jar poses as Boss Thinbag to cancel the attack. Minister Ratbag tries to escape and Anakin pursues him. Then there's the most bizarre crossover in this entire show, Jar Jar and General Grievous. Okay, you got me there. I wasn't expecting that. Although they managed to turn Grievous into even more of a joke when Jar Jar starts stalling and buying General Tarpal's time. When that time is bought, Grievous is easily overwhelmed and disabled. At first I thought it was a fucking joke, having Grievous be captured so easily, but then I realized he was just made that pathetic. I kind of prefer the old Grievous. I wonder what excuse they'll have for him to be around until Revenge of the Sith. Well, apparently, Sidious values Grievous a lot for some unspecified reasons, and orders Count Dooku rescue him. They devise a plan to capture Anakin and force Padme to trade Grievous in exchange for Anakin. Of course, throughout the course of less than five minutes, the decision is made, and Grievous is let free. And surprisingly, the Separatists honor the agreement. This episode was total crap. It felt like Filoni just came up with two different episode ideas and just crammed them into one. Also, they killed General Tarpals, which is just a massive disgrace, the way they did it. Man, does this show suck. Anyways, on to episode 5, Mercy Mission. Basically, there's been an earthquake and the Republic has to give humanitarian aid to a planet and prevent Separatist annexation. The only reason to watch this episode is for R2-D2 and 3PO. They are definitely the highlight. In fact, one of the best things in this show are the droids. R2, 3PO, Cad Bane's droid, and the Separatist battle droids. I love all of them. They have such humorous, witty dialogue. The droids steal the show in this series, and if anything is well written, it's them. Them. Since R2 and 3PO are very prominent in this episode, this prevents the episode from being an abortion, because I probably would have disliked it otherwise. Basically, the droid duo and Commander Wolf are sent to said planet to do what I previously mentioned. It is kind of weird that 3PO isn't accompanying Padme, but whatever. I suppose Padme lent the droid to Commander Wolf. By this point though, I really got sick of the clone's voice actor. D. Bradley Baker was not the right fit for the clones. His voice sounds too fake and over the top. He misses two birds with one stone by not sounding enough like Tamara Morrison and sounding too much like an Australian stereotype, pissing off both New Zealanders and Australians alike. Also the fact that Mr. Baker puts on his voice from Spongebob. Well maybe we wouldn't sound so bad if some people didn't try to play with big meaty claws. What did you say, punk? BIG MEATY CLAWS! Why couldn't Tam voice the clones? He wasn't even doing much around the time period or so I hear in his career in general. Or another idea, why didn't you delegate the clones to multiple voice actors for variety? Republic Commando did that to great effect, why not here? I've seen so many Filoni groupies defend D. Bradley Baker by saying that he can differentiate the clones, as if Tem was ever given a chance to see if he could do just that. You guys do know what an actor is, right? Anyways, another redeemable part of this episode is the persona of the aliens in peril. I love their contrast to the clones. Basically, this is a 3PO and R2 arc. They go on a wild adventure, getting stuck underground, coming across tree people, and a magical woman who tells a riddle, and this part confirms that Filoni and the writers were on drugs. 
Who the hell came up with this? Not a lot happens in the episode that progresses the war. To be honest, I don't even know what the state of the war is, because this show is just some random adventures with the cast, instead of showing us the actual war. The best guess I have is that the Republic is winning, because they win every time in this show. Despite its enjoyability, this is filler, and it ends with 3PO and R2 making it back to the surface, and the next episode, they board Adi Galea's Star Cruiser, which gets attacked, and shenanigans happen where they get into a Y-Wing and crash into the planet, and accidentally kill the tyrannical leader of some tiny people. Then they topple the dictatorship of a bunch of droids, posing as a god or something. And then they are captured by pirates and sent into a droid fighting ring, where General Grievous attacks the pirate ship and they are sent to an incinerator room, but Plo Koon and his clones show up to save the day. Despite meeting R2 in a previous episode, Plo Koon doesn't recognize him. Like, it wasn't shown that he met 3PO before, but surely R2, I'd give Filoni the benefit of the doubt if only I didn't know what he's like in regards to continuity. And that's episode 6, we're only a quarter of the way through. Next comes the Umbaran arc, which is something a lot of people talk about in regards to this show. Basically the setup here is that Umbara is controlled by the Separatists, and the Republic has to claim it. Simple, but it fails to give the big picture of where the war is going. In the entire show, it's just Separatists claim something and the Republic has to take it back. The episode seems to start as usual as the Anakin and Obi-Wan Command clones episode, and that's essentially what it is in the first half. What I will give this show is that Imbara as a planet is well designed, and the lighting is great, I guess I can rely on the concept artist to get it right at the very least. It's a very moody planet. Perfect atmosphere for a dark planet that a Republic has trouble taking over. With that being said, the first third of the episode is a chunk of the clones fighting the local Embaran militia. They are tasked in taking the capital city, which is a long way away. With that being said, we get a cool action sequence of Anakin and his clones taking the Umbaran militia head on. With the clones barely being able to see what they're shooting clearly, they are meant to back up Obi-Wan's battalion and help take the capital city. The whole episode is flipped on its head however, with the introduction of a new character, Pong Krell. Pong Krell is easily one of the most infamous characters in the show, and unlike a lot of characters, he was designed to be hated. This dude basically tells Anakin that he's needed at the Jedi Temple, and so he leaves, with Captain Rex having to greet his new temporary commander. Right off the bat, you can tell that this guy has an ulterior motive. He's absurdly disrespectful, arrogant with an ego like no other, and his voice is a dead giveaway that he's the bad guy. This guy isn't subtle about his disdain for clones either. We can immediately see the contrast between how Anakin treats his clones versus how Krell treats his clones. He refers to Rex by his designation, instead of his nickname, which is an extremely obvious sign that Pong Krell doesn't care about them. He makes them hike for 12 hours straight without a break, leading to them getting burnt out. And then when they reach the capital, he changes the attack plan and orders a full forward assault. Rex obviously points out the absurdity of a plan as dumb as that, and Krell does the classic, are you questioning my orders, buddy? that the classic villain does. I don't have a problem with that trope for intimidation purposes, but Krell just goes way overboard. Despite some arguing, Rex goes along with the plan hesitantly, and tension becomes really low, as the clones just banter about the reckless plan, and shock and horror, they get ambushed after stepping on some mines. Despite Pong Krell telling them to keep moving forward, Captain Rex orders a fall back, and this of course, leads to Pong Krell scolding Rex for disobeying his idiotic orders. Something I don't like about this episode, is that they just refer to Krell as some tactical genius, when so far, he's just a fucking idiot who throws soldiers at a problem until it goes away. His behaviour is extremely suspicious. I know what happens later, but this doesn't excuse anything. Pong Krell is given an unnatural amount of power over Anakin's clone battalion, and he abuses it to his heart's content. 
He's not even trying to be subtle. I've said previously that this show just has the worst plot twists, that everything is just way too obvious, hardly any effective surprises. The next episode continues the ferocious fighting. Obi-Wan tells Pong Krell that he needs to take an outpost out, and after the information is relayed, Pong Krell in a display of inconsistent behaviour refers to Captain Rex as well, Captain Rex. I'm sorry, but I thought you only referred to clones by their designation. It's mistakes like this that really show the incredible talent of the writers of this show. So far, all I see is Pong Krell being a dick to the clones and giving them reckless orders, and now he doesn't even refer to them by the names he did previously. Anyways, they make it to the outpost they're supposed to take down, and it leaves the clone battalion in debate on whether or not they follow him. Rex trusts the general's judgement for some reason, and they move out. Again, I'll give this episode a compliment with the creative war machines made for this specific episode, such as the caterpillar tank and the spider tank. In another display of inconsistency, Pong Krell refers to Sergeant Apo by his nickname. Again, instead of his designation like the last episode. Okay, now this is the confirmation that the writers didn't bother to stay consistent. How could you make that mistake twice? Anyways, Rex comes up with a plan to sneak two clones behind enemy lines and get into the outpost. Of course, Krell hates the idea and tells Rex that if he continues, he will be relieved of command. Well, to my surprise, the two clones in question, Fives and Hardcase, managed to do that. And they try to use the Embaran war machines against the militia, but the way they do it, they just accidentally themselves through this whole thing, and it's utter BS. They're only saved because they're protected by blaster deflecting ray shields. Well, with that, they turn the tide of the battle, and then General Krell decides to get the rest of the units to move in. At the end of episode 2, General Krell doesn't congratulate Rex, just says that he had good luck and whatnot. Okay, I know this guy is supposed to be a terrible example of a Jedi, but why does he think there's such a thing as luck in Star Wars? Well, anyways, you can tell at this point that the clones are managing to outdo their terrible casualty inflicting orders. Next episode, Obi-Wan contacts General Krell, telling him that his own men are in trouble. Pong Krell decides that he's going to have the capital city taken right away, not caring about joining up with Obi-Wan's forces for a joint attack. Even when Rex's bros suggest an alternate plan to use Embaran fighters to sneak in undetected, the episode logistically already doesn't line up with anything in the Expanded Universe. But ignoring that, a small fraction of the clones decide to disobey General Krell anyways. It's a common trope of being told not to do something and doing it anyways. Disobedient clones are really starting to become noticeable. As stated before, most clones wouldn't have enough independence to do any of what we see in the episode. Hardcase tries the Embaran fighter and teaches himself how to fly. Where did you learn to fly? And by the time he figures it out, Krell caught on to what they're trying to do and locks down the hangar. Something I don't get is why the clones aren't very discreet talking about it. They speak to Rex about it even though he's more dedicated to following Krell, and it reminds me of the episode of Spongebob, where he and Patrick find a cave with a pirate ship, and Patrick can't keep it a secret. I remember a line in that episode where Patrick, being the idiot that he is, dismisses Spongebob's idea of keeping it a secret, when he's just like, It'll be a secret everyone knows about. This literally has the same vibe. Despite the fighters being locked down, Fives, Hardcase and Jesse easily pull off their plan, flying away like magpies when you get too close. Seriously, this is so stupid. I guess later it is explained that Rex actually gave them the slip when confronted by General Krell. I noticed that this episode is really heavy on classic Star Wars references. It has the trio fly into the hangar of a Separatist ship and blow it up from the inside. Hardcase decides to sacrifice his life to destroy the ship and it's minorly sad. I guess it ties into his character that he gave his life to save his legion from General Krell's terrible orders. When Fives and Jesse return, Rex shows up with a smile, but then the three of them are ordered to see General Krell. Basically, the Rex and Fives take the blame for each other, and Krell essentially goes back to calling them by their designations again, showing how inconsistent the writing is. And then they do the most inappropriate Q credits I've ever seen. After Pong Krell tells both Fives and Jesse they will be court-martialed and executed with sinister music before cutting. 
talk about inappropriate. Maybe they should have used different music credits aside from do 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 Anyways, let's talk about Carnage of Krell. Rex tries to get General Krell to reconsider court-martialing Fives and Jesse, and only makes things worse when Krell changes his mind, but not in a good way. He figures that he should just have them executed immediately. But of course, in the lineup, all the troopers refuse to kill Fives and Jesse. And well, Rex goes back having disobeyed orders. And then a transmission comes through informing everyone that some Umbarans have captured clone weapons and armor and are playing dress up for a major offensive against the outpost. General Krell halts Rex's punishment by telling him to go fight the clones. I'd just like to say firsthand that the episode is extremely on the nose with what's actually gonna happen. Rex and the 501st go out and are attacked by the Legion disguised as clones from the 212th. With minimal build-up, both sides shoot at each other with equal skill, and Rex randomly takes off the helmet and holy shit, it's not a disguise! He shot an actual clone from the 212th. Despite the animation being upscaled from when the show started, Rex's realization movement is really weird, and he only takes a few seconds before it sinks in. Then obviously, he tells everyone in the 501st to take off their helmet, trying to get the 212th to do the same. Rex literally runs into one of his clone brothers in the 212th, trying to get everyone to stop fighting. Eventually the troops do stop shooting, and Rex talks to the 212th platoon leader Waxer, clinging on to life, confirming the worst. General Krell gave them the same orders, with the same advice. Rex now assumes the role of de facto leader of both platoons, and he knows now that General Krell must be stopped. So they march into the command tower, Pong Krell when asked to explain his actions, is dismissive and whatnot, and brings out his two double-bladed lightsabers against the combined forces of the 212th and 501st. I suppose this part is decent. I think we needed a lot more time. The 22 minute runtime leads to this feeling quite rushed. Couldn't this be a special episode? It was the end of an important arc after all. Man, people consider this one of the best arcs, and here I am with problems. Aged like absolute milk. I also thought it was comical when this random clone trooper decided to run towards Pong Krell. Season 4 in and we haven't moved past pathetic clone trooper deaths. Anyways, the fight between Krell and the clones goes on for around maybe 3-4 to four minutes. Pong Krell is bested by the clones in that time, and is it just me and my calling BS on that? Jesus Christ, I expected this to be way better. This certainly feels like this should have been double the length. Well, anyways, Krell is locked up, alongside with a stubborn dogma, who only now realizes Krell was a rat. We get some insight into Pong Krell's plan. He wanted to give the Separatists the victory on the silver plate, and impress Count Dooku, becoming his new apprentice. As Generation Tech pointed out, it's never seen or confirmed that Count Dooku actually made any kind of deal with Krell. And the way Krell says it, he did this banking on the fact that Dooku would just accept him as his new apprentice without even speaking to him once during the war. To that, I say, what an idiot! Oh, what a loser! What the fuck were the writers on when they wrote this? Keep in mind, Generation Tech are fans of the show, and they didn't directly realize how poorly written Pong Krell was in this entire arc. He is the central character who caused everything to go wrong, and he didn't even speak to Count Dooku once. Did he really think Count Dooku would let him hop on board because he wanted to become his apprentice? The villain's motivations make zero sense here. They could have had Pong Krell have some reassurance and then betray the Jedi and the Republic, but it's the fact that Pong Krell was a narcissistic idiot who thought that he would get things that really shows how pointless this all is. So anyways, after learning that the transmitters were sabotaged, they decide they need to execute Krell. Rex aims a gun at him, but Dogma is the one to shoot Krell, feeling it was the right thing to do after blindly following orders. Then we get some themes about Rex questioning the point of this war, and blah 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 blah. Man, this episode sucks the most when it ends. Worst ending for an episode arc in the show so far. Nothing was earned, Pong Krell was predictable and stupid, and they had the nerve to push some themes into it. Seriously? This is something that could have easily been fixed, but it's just the part where Pong Krell is just a stupid dumbass that really ruins this arc. Is this really the best TCW has to offer? 
Next arc. This next arc has one of the most interesting behind the scenes backstories. You see, the following arc was based on a tie-in comic for TCW that George Lucas read and enjoyed. The comic in question was called Slaves of the Republic and had sexually explicit artwork of Ahsoka, who was still not of age yet. Yuck. Anyways, they adapted the comic into an arc in season 4 and what we're left with is this. So let's talk about it. I remember I couldn't finish the arc the first time, but I couldn't remember why. So let's find out if that was a good choice together. This arc is basically about the Togruta, a Soka species, being invaded by the Separatists and being round up and being sold into slavery by the Zigerians, a race of ruthless slavers. Immediately after, the Republic shows up and the Togruta are all but gone. Anakin, of course, has a deep-seated hatred for the Zigerians for obvious reasons given he himself was a slave at one point. The Zigerian in charge of the world now, Dinar, asks for Obi-Wan Kenobi. In a rare display of intelligence, Dinar is not an idiot, and it feels like he knows about Obi-Wan's untrustworthy nature of false surrendering. He has planned one step ahead of him, and he's planted bombs all over the town. If he doesn't want to see any Togruta harmed, also he manages to prove quite strong, and beats the shit out of Obi-Wan, while Anakin and Ahsoka try to defuse the bombs. To be honest, the defusing bombs things feels like a video game. Once all are activated, Dinar realizes that he's screwed and reveals that he rigged one of his droids and throws it into Obi-Wan before making his escape. Again, this guy isn't a fool, unlike a lot of the one-off antagonists in this show. Predictably though, the guy is caught when he's overpowered by Ahsoka, which is power level inconsistently, but screw it. This guy actually did a decent job. But for some reason, he spills the beans on what happened to the kidnapped almost instantly. So the trio realize they need to go undercover to the Zigerian capital. This is sort of the part where Ahsoka is like, they're my people, but it isn't explored much. Anakin, of course, is furious in regards to all this because it means that he's going to have to confront his past as a slave again, seeing other people be enslaved. They travel to the Zigerian capital in disguise, with Ahsoka posing as a slave for sale. Of course it would be her. When they walk into the city, they are confronted and are let inside the palace by the Queen of the Zigerians because they claim to be associated with some character I've never heard of. Apparently, this unseen character is an enemy of the Queen, and Anakin is posing as the guy who killed him, and lies that Ahsoka is a slave he got as compensation. And this part I really hate. It has both the Queen and Anakin compliment Ahsoka's value as a beautiful slave, and I'm just gagging at the audacity of the writers. Also, we have Anakin seducing the Queen with the worst pickup lines imaginable. In context, Anakin doesn't actually like the Zigerian Queen, so he has a way easier time charming her than he would Padme. Anyways, after a failed rescue attempt from Obi-Wan and Rex to the Togruta leader, they are captured. Now I wanted to get into the main theme that is this episode, that being slavery. It's a very simplistic, over-the-top depiction of slavery akin to Return of the Jedi. Jabba the Hutt treated his slaves terribly, locking them up, forcing them to do uncomfortable tasks, and disposing of them if they failed or refused. Then we've got Watto, the more realistic slaver, who aside from having people enslaved, wasn't that bad of a master. He kept his two slaves fed properly, gave them proper housing, and didn't overwork them. To be honest, slavery is a controversial topic because it's either depicted as far too brutal for drama or not brutal enough. It's extremely hard to showcase. From what I understand, unless it's highly demanding, dangerous, or exhausting work, slavers tend to keep their slaves controlled by treating them nicely to avoid inciting rebellion. Because if slaves can tolerate their work at the very least, they'll try running away less because they won't have brutal conditions to run away from. I don't know. It just seemed like slavery in the show was very cookie cutter. Technically clones are slave soldiers grown and trained for one purpose, to defend the Republic, and that's more nuanced and interesting than this shit. Hell, even the show's own looks into that very topic were way more interesting than the slavery bad crap. Anyways, at one point, Anakin stops one of the Queen's slaves from killing the Queen for some reason. He won't be tied as an accomplice, and given Anakin's personal history, why save the leader of a slave institution? 
I don't know. The flirtatious banter between the two is getting really corny at this point. And it ain't like Attack of the Clones in the slightest where there's context. The Queen invites Anakin to a slave auction and asks him to be there with her. This is where they bring out Obi-Wan Kenobi to be punished, and when asked to punish Obi-Wan, Anakin uses this as the opportunity to start fighting back. We've got another callback to Return of the Jedi with the salute, and R2 popping out the lightsabers. But this time, Anakin, Obi-Wan and Ahsoka are overpowered by the slavers, and Ahsoka foils her opportunity to kill the Sigerian Queen and is knocked out for the 50th time. Seriously, Ahsoka getting knocked out is actually a pretty common trope, and I can say firsthand, she deserves it. What the hell is wrong with you guys? So Anakin wakes up on a bed with the Queen ahead of him. He opts to strangle her, but after realizing that his friends are being held hostage, Anakin is instead forced to be both a bodyguard and a consort. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty messed up. I'll give the episode that. The following scenes with Obi-Wan and Ahsoka have them both be enslaved. In Obi-Wan's case, the slaver in charge drops down a bunch of the captured Togrudas to a deep chasm to their deaths. And wasting slaves' lives like that seems really stupid. You could be selling them on the market, you know. Man, I just fucking hate the over-the-top depiction of slavery. This is far from an interesting critique on the topic. I doubt Filoni even looked at anything regarding modern slavery. Like indentured servitude or anything like that, where people are forced to work to pay off something they can never afford and being stuck in a job. Then we've got the Queen talking to Anakin with his past as a slave, and basically grandstanding him with the idea that the reason his friends are still hostages are because of him. The Queen decides Anakin to be his top servant, following orders without question. Will there be a personal conflict of Anakin deciding to become a slave of this Queen despite everything? Tune in next time. Then we've got Obi-Wan and Rex being pushed around the other slaves. It's the common trope of slavery always being overworked to death. Not realistic, not believable. I guess the episode does point out that they're put through brutal conditions to weaken willpower, but the downside is that you'll incite slave revolts. I hope. Anyways, Anakin is being nudged by the Queen to swear allegiance to her, and he is reluctant. Then Dooku shows up in the system, with the explanation that the Queen is getting a little rebellious with what she's been ordered to do. Basically, Anakin uses the undetected R2 to escape, and I do have to question how R2 managed to sneak by the palace undetected. The Queen also goes to meet Dooku, and he's not putting up with her shit. She proposes an idea to enslave the Jedi by breaking their will, and Dooku rejects it as the Jedi had to be terminated. Then it turns out the Zygerian Prime Minister is on Dooku's side, and I barely remember the Prime Minister besides this one moment in the entire arc anyways, and this is basically all he does or even exists for. So of course, Dooku kills the Queen. Meanwhile, Anakin frees Ahsoka, and since Anakin needs the location of Obi-Wan and Rex, and all the Togruta slaves, he goes back into the palace, and of course, meets Dooku again when he's not supposed to. Again, he grabs the Queen and escapes. In the Queen's last moments, she realized that she was a pawn this whole time and spills the beans to Anakin. Obi-Wan is in the Kadavo system and that's their next stop. So with that being said, they stop by the door and summon the Republic fleet to attack the complex and free the Togruta. The slaver in charge dies when Rex stabs him, and the Togruta are freed from their shackles. Yay! At the end, the leader of the Togruta personally speaks to Ahsoka, and that's the end. But wait, what happened to the Zygerian slave empire? Or literally every other slave? Or how this all impacts the state of the war? Unsurprisingly, none of this is brought up. They just wanted to wrap this arc up, but the thing is, they haven't earned it in the slightest. I still have no clue what's happening in the wider war, or what happened to Zygeria after this. I mean, they don't talk about what happened to every other person enslaved, so we can only presume that they're in shackles for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's pretty bleak. Man, I just hate this ending. So many plot holes and unanswered questions. 
Why didn't the Republic go and free the other slaves? It's not like we can just brush it off by saying there would be legal repercussions, which was the reason Qui-Gon didn't do anything to Watto, because he was a dude living in hot space, abiding by local laws legitimately. Not ethically, but legitimately. In context, Zygeria has chosen to side with the Separatists. The Jedi could literally free the slaves. So yeah, this arc is pretty weak. It feels like Filoni and friends put a few ideas together and called it a day. I don't know how faithful of an adaptation this is to the comic arc, but from what I've seen, they changed a bunch of things, and I guarantee it was for the worst. I am still unimpressed. This feels like an unfinished story, and like key scenes were cut out or something. I'm not sure. Next comes one of the most questionable episodes in the entire show. I expressed problems with this episode before I even started my TCW review series, if any of you remember. The setup for the next one-off episode is a meeting between Republic and Separatist representatives trying to work something out on the neutral planet of Mandalore. The meeting hardly goes anywhere until Lux Bonteri shows up. Remember him? The guy who was super friendly with Ahsoka, and Filoni was just shipping the two. Yeah, just wait and see what happens in this episode. Anyways, Luck shows up uninvited, and talks about the Separatists because he's learned that Dooku was behind his mother's death. Oh yeah, I almost forgot. Your mother died in the last season in a passing line of dialogue. Only now we're seeing how this affected her son. You suddenly realize this is why Bonteri even had a son besides the other reason. Some Separatist droids show up to take him away, and Ahsoka decides to free Lux with Padme telling her to be discreet about it. So Ahsoka sneaks onto the ship Lux is being carried to. We get a brief conversation between Lux and Dooku, where Lux swears revenge, and Dooku just opts to order him executed. And of course Ahsoka shows up on time, and the two of them escape. They run back to the Republic ship docked while the Senate guards hold off the Separatists. And this no doubt would just ruin the negotiation meeting. That in question isn't really talked about again in the whole episode beyond Anakin saying that it fell apart. When Ahsoka says that she'll escort Lux to Coruscant and the Republic, Lux pulls a gun on her, revealing that he has other plans. Ahsoka of course snatches the gun off him, and then Ahsoka immediately drops her guard. Assuming that Lux only had that one weapon, well jokes on her, she's knocked out by a taser, and Lux goes to assist him near Mandalore presumably. I don't know. Ahsoka wakes up many hours later, with her lightsabers taken. She noticed Lux outside the ship, and confronts him, and this is where all is revealed. Lux has aligned with Death Watch. Yeah. As it turns out, Lux was so desperate for revenge that he made an alliance with Death Watch. Since Bo-Katan and the Death Watch don't recognize Ahsoka, Ahsoka makes up a story about how she and Lux are engaged. What the hell? Then comes the worst moment in the episode, when Bo-Katan grabs Ahsoka's chin and spanks her in the ass, remarking about how she's a little skinny. Jesus Christ, where do I begin with this? Let's get the obvious out of the way. Bo-Katan just spanked an underage girl in a sexual manner. This is what I mean when I say Filoni really has an obsessive fetish with Ahsoka. If Slaves of the Republic wasn't enough, this is the definitive proof. When I first watched this, I didn't fully process this bit, but now that I'm older, I realize that this is part of the showrunner's desire to turn Ahsoka, an underage girl, into a sex object. Since Ahsoka is sort of getting a woman's body by now, it feels like they're really just pushing the boundaries of what's acceptable. This shit aired on Cartoon Network? Why weren't there any complaints? I suppose people were just so in love with Ahsoka that they didn't care. That's probably the reason. The second reason being that people probably didn't think much of it. Because it was a woman spanking an underage girl. Like, think about it. If Osama bin Vizsla had done this, I think there would have been an outcry. The main reason I don't like this moment is because I'm sick of the overrated waifu Ahsoka being a sex symbol when that's just so wrong. So anyways, they go out to a camp that Death Watch set up. Speaking of Osama bin Vizsla, he shows up. And I suppose the dark lighting gives the scene a sinister tone, along with the music. Lux apparently has a device that can track Count Dooku. What? When Lux gives him the device, they decide to throw a party. 
Ahsoka is thrown in with a bunch of kidnapped hostages. We see that Lux is just making excuses for the Death Watch when the leader of the nearby village demands the kidnapped back. The way this is presented, Lux ignores the red flags, and then when we cut to the next scene, Osama bin Vizsla returns the hostages, but immediately stabs one of them and burns the village, causing chaos and generally being E there. Man, this is just so bad. With barely any development, Lux in the next scene realizes that the Death Watch are bloodthirsty murderers. Osama bin Vizsla is about to pull a good old fashioned execution on Ahsoka when he finds out she's a Jedi, when R2 enters the tent without anyone noticing him, and just goes sporadic and causes a distraction. Ahsoka gets her lightsaber, and it's a duel between Vizsla and her, and again she makes it out unscathed, which I'm sick of seeing far better duelists stooping down to Ahsoka's level, just because she needs to stay alive for the plot. Ahsoka and Lux are chased by the Death Watch, and predictably they escape. Lux decides to open up the escape pod, and Ahsoka and Lux say their goodbyes. Side note, there's a part in the episode where Lux and Ahsoka kiss as a distraction. And that's the episode! Man, what a paper-thin plotline! The next episode arc this time has an actually creative idea. It basically starts with Obi-Wan faking his death to everyone but the Jedi higher-ups, so he can foil a plot to kidnap the Chancellor. As such, both Ahsoka and especially Anakin believe he perished, and Anakin is pissed. It's revealed in the setup that a captured Separatist, Morali Evel or something, is planning to kidnap the Chancellor, and so Obi-Wan needs to pose as the sniper who tried to kill him, get arrested, help Morala escape, find out the plot, and then stop him. Simple, easy, effective. I like it. Let's hope it stays that way. It's also rather weird seeing Obi-Wan without hair or a beard, given he's meant to impersonate a clean-shaven bald guy with face tattoos. I think it's sort of a stretch that droids can do facial reconstruction on him, and change his voice by swallowing a voice changer device. They lure the sniper that the Jedi hired in the first place, and arrest him so that Obi-Wan can take his clothes and impersonate him. Meanwhile, the secondary plot revolves around Anakin's desire for revenge. It does get sort of iffy on why Mace Windu and Yoda wouldn't let him in on the secret if he proceeds to do this right afterwards. Like in this episode, it's Anakin who gets Obi-Wan disguised as Hardeen arrested. But given what happens later, it seems kind of like a mistake to have Anakin not know the secret. Well, anyways, Obi-Wan gets locked up in prison for his own murder. Right off the bat, he easily attracts the attention of Eval, when he of course acts tough against those trying to pick a fight with him. I can sort of tell that Obi-Wan right here is having fun being someone else. It's actually pretty engaging. Obi-Wan is put in a prison cell conveniently with Eval, who is trying to recruit him. And he's also got Cad Bane in on his plan. Obi-Wan contacts Yoda and Mace about the conspiracy, and soon afterwards, there's another lunch with Obi-Wan confronted by the one and only, the young Bobby Fat. <laughs> Apparently, Reiko Hardeen stole a bounty from him, and it leads to a fight breaking out from everyone in the prison. To be honest, it isn't as brutal as I'd like. The sound effects from the prisoners and the guards hitting each other don't help, but it leads to the perfect distraction. Obi-Wan meets up with Cad Bane and Evel, and Evel accepts them into their jailbreak. After slicing into the morgue, they play dead in the coffins, and that's where they break out. Since Obi-Wan isn't a bad guy, there's a dilemma where he hesitates to shoot a clone officer. He probably should have just punched him out cold, I'd be nitpicking. They escape the prison, and Eval says there's a place for Reiko Hardeen in his plot to abduct the Chancellor. In the next episode, Eval and crew crash land on Nal Hutta, and decide to get rid of their fatigues and get some new equipment. They harass some local merchant for their clothes, and they task Obi-Wan with getting the ship. After they've got the ship, Cad Bane ditches him and Obi-Wan is arrested. Since Obi-Wan previously put a tracker on their ship, they get shot down where Obi-Wan reveals their location, and both Cad Bane and Eval are forced to go back to Obi-Wan for help. This is just too amusing to criticize. Basically, Obi-Wan is cleverly working around them to get in on the plot so he can stop them. Obi-Wan's acquired his own ship, and now they have to rely on him. 
Unfortunately, Anakin is still pissed because believing Obi-Wan is still dead, he's out for Reiko Hardeen. He, with Ahsoka, tracked down the trio and he is hell-bent on revenge. Of course, Obi-Wan has to avoid killing him, and this problem is solved when Cad Bane steps in wanting to fight Anakin alone, and then before he can kill Anakin, Ahsoka steps in and they flee. Obi-Wan actually tells Anakin that he's alive before knocking him out, and it leads to a hint that Obi-Wan is still alive, although Anakin is not sure how exactly. And then the next episode. Cad Bane, Evel, and Kenobi all make it to Sereno, where Dooku puts out a contest between bounty hunters in the box. Before the contest even starts, Cad Bane kills a dude for his hat. Anyways, Count Dooku introduces all of them to each other. They're all the best of the best bounty hunters involved with the CIS. They're all going to compete in the box, designed by Evel to determine the strongest enough to work on the job. As it's about to turn out, the box is extremely dangerous, and despite the experience of all the bounty hunters, not all will return alive. The box in particular is inspired by a 90s science fiction horror film called Cube. Out of curiosity, I watched a bit of Cube and the resemblance is uncanny. Cube has a cult status, and I'm guessing Filoni and friends watched Cube and used it for their idea of the box. In context, I kind of felt like the box was counterintuitive because half-ish of the bounty hunters die in the box, and killing off experienced contractors like that sounds like sabotage. When entering the box, the first room is poisonous gas with rising platforms above. Obi-Wan figures there's an entrance below the gas which leads to the exit to room 1. Everyone follows his lead, and the first room is without casualties. Room 2? Not so much. The next room is a bunch of stabby laser blade platforms. Obi-Wan also leads the team to the top, with the first casualty happening here. In the third room, the walls are closed in with lasers, with a serum that Evil says works for only one of them. Spoilers, it ain't Kenobi. Instead, it's this Parwin Mushroom three-eyed dude who guesses he can take it. Kenobi backs up the speculation, and the Parwin injects himself with it. And what do you know? The plan works. Only two casualties in this room. Looking at Cube, this is a kid-friendly version of it. The box is certainly intimidating, but is toned down for approval on Cartoon Network. Anyways, in the fourth room, it puts sniping skills to the test. It's basically shoot these targets, else the platform comes off one by one. One of the bounty hunters misses a shot and plummets to his death. So who is the next volunteer? Why, it's Kenobi. At this point, it's pretty much three and a half times out of four rooms where Kenobi has been the greatest asset to the team's survival. Eval shows up and decides to be a dick, propping up two targets at once. Kenobi, with his Jedi reflexes, gets three shot before ammo runs out. Eval mocks Kenobi for running out of ammo and decides to drop him into the flames. Kenobi is saved only in a rare display of honor by Cad Bane. Cad Bane uses his grapple hook to save Kenobi and tells Eval that if he's going to kill him, do it like a man. It's unexpected, but it actually makes a lot of sense. Cad Bane did not trust Kenobi as Reiko Hardeen, but saves his life because he has a tiny bit of integrity that knows that Hardeen going down like this is dishonorable enough. It's actually kind of interesting. Cad Bane at this point proves that you can earn his respect under specific circumstances. Anyways, Dooku decides to pit Kenobi against Eval in a one-on-one -on -one match. Of course, Kenobi overpowers Eval in a fight scene that sort of feels like a video game, so that's a minor issue. But that's about the start and end of this episode's problems. Anyways, Kenobi refuses to kill him, and Dooku, because of this, who was considering Hardin as the mission's leader, instead delegates leadership to Cad Bane. This does sort of remind me of the moral test on Kashyyyk in Knights of the Old Republic, where the computer tests you on whether or not you'd achieve absolute victory. Basically, what happened here is that if Kenobi was fully committed to being Reiko Hardin, he would have been put in charge of the mission, and would have had more control over stopping it. But since Jedi values kicked in, he spared Eval, and now Cad Bane was selected as leader. This is one of the few times this show actually made me think about things. Believe me, this show wants you to think about the deeper meaning all the time, and 9 times out of 10, it fucking fails at it. 
Well, here, it actually hit the mark. Anyways, next episode. It's time to pull the plot against kidnapping the Chancellor. Cad Bane hatches the plan using a morphing device to disguise everyone except himself and Eval as Senate guards. Eval has the lamest job and is just meant to be the getaway Uber driver. I am going to question the super advanced technology. It does seem like it's pushing it at this point, but anyways, Kenobi informs Mace Windu about the plot and when the Chancellor is giving a speech on Naboo. The Parwin knocks out the shield generator, and I suppose they do use the morphing technology to confuse the good guys, and Palpatine and whatnot. I guess another problem I have with the episode is that it should have been longer, as the climax is too short, with Kenobi showing up and finally blowing his cover at last, taking out Cad Bane and Eval, capturing them, and bringing them into custody. Confusingly enough, it feels like wrap-up time, but we're just over half the episode, so there's obviously more. Everything is revealed to Anakin, and he's pissed, but escorting the Chancellor back, they're ambushed by... Dooku. Fuck off! Not this again! Yeah, so this is the real climax, and Dooku gets away. The end. Okay, I was having a breeze for most of this arc, but then the clumsy ending happened. This arc was four episodes long, and we were almost, almost close to having a good arc with little to no problems, but they just had to ruin it at the end. If this arc ended with Cad Bane and Eval being captured, this probably would have made the final episode better. I wouldn't have my complaints. I'm starting to realize now that these episodes have iffy pacing due to a limited time frame. That's probably why they miss most of the time. Alright, I've said my piece on the nearly all-compelling arc that was ruined by the last 15% of it. So let's get on with the next arc. This one centers around a Sarge Ventress, and based on my memory, I really hate this one. Basically, after the embarrassing defeat in Season 3, Ventress returns to Dathomir again, and Talzin encourages her to be a Knight Sister. But unfortunately for her, Dooku meanwhile orders Grievous to wipe out the Knight Sisters. Which I mean, this might be one of the few good parts of the episode. Shows how Dooku isn't just a forgetful moron. Although they can still spare battle droids to the Dathomir system, despite losing in every other episode ever to the Republic. But forgetting that, they ambush the Night Sisters and well, they're on the defensive. Even raising the dead in their defense. It's magic against machines. This is what would have happened if Harry Potter replaced John Connor. You know, they would actually make an interesting crossover in of itself actually. But back to the topic at hand, Talzin tortures a stick figure of Dooku that applies to his pain. Again, that's sort of iffy given Dooku is light years away. So he's got to have some sort of immunity being that far away, right? Night Sister Magic is a little overpowered. Also, Talzin is pretty much wasting time. She needs to focus on the battle, then torture Dooku. We've also got Grievous and Ventress duel. You want to know who wins fair and square? Grievous challenges Ventress to a one-on-one, -on -one, and if Ventress wins, Grievous leaves Dathomir. Well, shock and horror, Ventress wins, but Grievous just ends up cheating and genocides the Night Sisters anyways. I was expecting Grievous to win, but of course he loses. Again. Man, I just hate Grievous in the show. Can't he win at least once? Ventress is forced to flee, and the only reason she isn't finished off is because Dooku, still being tortured, orders Dooku to redirect his attention to Mother Talzin. Oh! That's why they had this super contrived writing with overpowered Night Sister magic. It's so Ventress could have an excuse to escape. Also, gotta mention how Grievous slowly marches towards Talzin's location. Instead of skidding around like a spider, like he did in Revenge of the Sith, Dooku in the meanwhile just stumbles around his office in pain, until Grievous finally tips over and saves his life. For some reason, this feels like one of the few honourable things Grievous does in this entire show, even though Dooku is pretty evil. Maybe I just didn't like seeing Christopher Lee, an old man, in pain. Ventress manages to escape, and the spirit of Mother Talzin or something tells her to follow her own destiny and all that crap. And there goes the terrible, horrible ending to this episode. Also, I gotta wonder something. Are we supposed to feel bad for the Night Sisters? Night Sister Merrin in Fallen Order made us too, but in the context of the show, the Night Sisters just seem to be like avid, corruptible dark side users. 
I don't know. It seems like the presentation is really confused. Well, anyways, Ventress goes to Tatooine after finding a way off the planet. Huh. I never imagined Ventress going to Tatooine. It just doesn't feel right. That's just a pet peeve, though. I shouldn't try to criticize the episode for that. Anyways, Ventress goes into a cantina, and some guy starts some sexual harassment and she kills him. You know, did the writers actually think Ventress would be considered attractive? Or did this one guy just like creepy bald women? I really hope no one actually simps over Ventress like that. I mean, unlike Ahsoka, she's actually an adult, so there's that. But TCW's supposed waifus are a really, really low bar. Well anyways, Bosk and some pink bounty hunter talk to her, informs her that she just killed one of their teammates, and that they need another one to fill in. So that leads to Ventress being recruited for the mission they're about to do. Anyways, we get introduced to Dengar, voiced by the red letter media simp known as Simon Pegg. Ugh. You can tell I'm going to enjoy this episode already. On top of the fact that Ventress is being turned into a bounty hunter now. On the latter, I say... <laughs> they pretty much strayed far enough from the original Clone Wars Asajj Ventress at this point. But this I really hate because it's just an incredibly stupid change. Well, with that being said, she meets Boba Fett, insults his age, and then in the next scene, the team is contracted to escort some cargo. They aren't told what it is, just that they need to escort it. Wow, that must be something really important. Well anyways, they're ambushed by raiders, and the whole episode is decent spectacle, but then comes the ending. Turns out the cargo is a young woman, who is to be forcibly wed to the contractor's boss. Basically, Ventress feels bad for her, and overwhelms Boba Fett, and the episode ends with Boba Fett being tied up and gagged, with Ventress returning the girl to her brother, and then talking to the other bounty hunters, unaware of what she did to Boba Fett, and she decides she wants to say a bounty hunter. Man, do I just hate this episode! The only thing I kinda like is Boba Fett's tough exterior at such a young age, but aside from that, I hated this episode. Ventress botches her first bounty, and decides to stay in the game. Am I supposed to be impressed? Ventress really feels like an SJW's wet dream here. This episode I just really hate. But now that it's out of the way, let's talk about the moment TCW became a fan favorite show. All became the most overrated thing ever for the worst. If you know the episodes well, you know we're talking about that episode. Basically the perspective drops from Ventress to Savage Press doing other shit. If you remember the last review, you know he's looking for his brother, the legendary Darth Maul, who is somehow still alive. He randomly finds a clue near a bar and boards a ship, and confronts the pilot, asking him for the location, and holding him hostage, and forcing him to take him to a planet called Lothal Minor. Most of the episode is Savage searching around the planet. A snake alien named Morley guides him around until he betrays him and leads him down a trapdoor, where Savage navigates the underground tunnels and meets the one, the only, Darth Maul. Presentation-wise, Maul is scary, delusional, and deranged. Probably one of the best performances in this show. Sam Witwer, who also voiced the son, voices Darth Maul. First things first, how did Maul survive the Phantom Menace? This show doesn't explain squat. Just use your imagination and you'll figure it out. Yeah, so here comes the most overrated story decision ever. Bringing back Maul from the dead. Why they did this isn't hard to explain. Incessant whinging from people who wanted to see more of Maul, and instead of just reading Shadow Hunter or something like that, they complained that a one-off character, designed to be a short but sweet henchman, should have had more screen time. Here's the thing though, Darth Maul is dead, and he was ever since the Phantom Menace. He killed Qui-Gon, and then was killed himself. Simple and easy. Darth Maul, just like every other side villain, was meant to represent how Palpatine views all of his servants as disposable. And people didn't really catch on to that. It's a common idea from prequel haters that Obi-Wan should have just went up against Maul in the prequel trilogy or whatever, which adds to the idea that Obi-Wan did nothing in the prequel trilogy. Not only is that dead wrong, because his conflict was training Anakin, who behaved like a rebellious teenage son. This idea of keeping Maul alive I found to be incredibly weird. Wanting to see more of a character isn't a good enough excuse. 
I wanted to see more of Luke Skywalker after Return of the Jedi, but face it, something like that is best reserved for books and whatnot. The idea of bringing Maul back adds to the common stupidity of prequel hate. They wanted something, but couldn't get their heads out of their ass of what the story actually is. They seem to focus more on what they wanted than what George gave them. This is most likely due to a sense of entitlement and imagining the backstory being one way and being so convinced that that was the correct way that they couldn't fairly assess the prequel trilogy. Darth Maul is a huge representative of this problem. I think since Darth Maul was a huge part of the Phantom Menace's marketing, people just wanted him to be there for a long time, but that's not how every story works. Darth Maul was the key marketable character for one movie and that's all he needed. Again, people can't accept the idea that the Emperor disposes of all of his henchmen like trash. He used Maul, he used Jango, he used Dooku, he used Grievous, and he used Vader. The key villain you were supposed to be focusing on was Palpatine. If you watch the saga like you're supposed to, you'd know that. Prequel hate criticisms are a deep rabbit hole of people coming up with infinite criticisms about the prequels and disputing all of them takes a while because it's a blind, deep-seated hatred that you can't find the core of what you're saying with all this. Bottom line, the more should have been kept alive idea is not a valid criticism because you both miss the point and are inserting your own personal desires or for assessing the story being told. I really hate this show for bringing Maul back. It was only done after people whined about it for over a decade. Let's get that straight. And the way they bring Maul back is contrived and poorly explained. People mostly overlook his return because they say that what comes after is just so darn well written. Season 5 is a discussion for another time. But since this is the start of Maul's role in this show, it's handled piss poorly because they don't explain his return. Something something hatred. Now characters who come back from the dead like Maul is not a new concept. Darth Sion was much like this, a Sith Lord who is immortal. But here's the difference. Darth Sion was invented specifically with this story arc of living forever and being an immovable object in mind. Darth Maul was not. They basically changed the purpose of the character a decade afterwards. Is Maul's internalized rage interesting? Probably, but he died. Keep him dead. This all could have been fixed as a matter of fact with a simple change. What if Maul instead of being resurrected was instead made the first Spartai clone before Jorah Sabaoth in the Thrawn trilogy and the clone was an insane nut job who with the same memories was convinced that he was the real Maul and just like in the Clone Wars he desired revenge hard against Kenobi. Not only would this fit in with expanded universe lore a lot better but that would have made an interesting story arc all the same and I can imagine a story arc where Sidious clones his apprentice and he becomes an absolute lunatic hell bent on killing Kenobi. That would have made perfect sense. People as I've said before treat Filoni as a law buff but if he truly was he would have done something like this instead of bringing back the physical original character because hatred or something. Now before you congratulate me for coming up with this idea it's not my idea. I spoke to someone on Discord who suggested this fix, but I can't remember who it was. I asked a bunch of people who I commonly spoke to if they came up with the idea, but they all said they didn't. As such, if the person in the comment section can remind me, I will pin your comment. I intend to give credit where it's due, so feel free to inform me. Anyways, we're on to the season 4 finale and Mother Talzin does some magic on Maul to bring him back to sanity. Again, Night Sister magic is proving to be way overpowered. Once Maul is truly brought back to his prior state, he gets some chicken legs, which is kind of stupid looking, but it's not overt so you avoid laughing at it. Maul runs outside and he does a monologue about having revenge. Savage catches him up to speed, saying how the Clone Wars started without him. So what does Maul do exactly to get the attention of the Jedi? Go to a random planet and slaughter innocent people. They send the transmission to the Jedi Council and Obi-Wan is forced to go alone and face Maul. He rejects the offer for a Jedi strike team and makes it to the system. At first, Obi-Wan is smug like he always is, and then he completely realizes that Maul is back, the one who killed his master Qui-Gon. He takes him on, but is overpowered with the help of Savage. 
for some reason, Maul doesn't properly subdue Kenobi. Like, obviously he says that he wants him to feel every single cut in extreme pain, but you couldn't tie him up with force cuffs or something. Well, conveniently, Ventress has a score to settle with Savage, and so she helps Kenobi escape. The fight scene that follows is underwhelming. I've started to notice that lightsaber duels are nowhere as good as the prequel or even the original trilogy. It sort of feels too flowy and doesn't hit hard enough, if that makes sense. So I was sort of disappointed by the duel that closes season 4. Obi-Wan and Ventress easily escape from Maul and Savage, and Maul just says they'll have to be patient and wait for the Jedi to come for them. Maul doesn't seem that pissed throughout the whole episode, despite him saying that he's angry as hell. And that was season 4. What do people seriously see in this show? Cause it sucks. So far I am utterly unimpressed. This show has been disappointment after another. There are only maybe two arcs in this entire season that I liked. The supposed highlights like Pong Krell and Darth Maul were just overrated as hell and very very underwhelming. Seriously, I swear I do not have a malicious agenda. It's just that after exposing myself to way more of Star Wars, The Clone Wars is probably just okay at best, but terrible as an expanded universe piece, which is nowhere close to being. The only arc I actually loved was the one where Obi-Wan poses as Reiko Hardin, but again, the ending fell flat. But while it was good, it was really good. The show just seems to get worse and worse it seems. I'm going to give TCW Season 4 a slightly lower score than I gave Season 3. A 3.9 out of 10. And that's simply because this is supposed to be the high point of the show, alongside Season 5, is it not? Now, before I close this video, there's one more thing that I wanted to address. I've been told that I should try watching the show in chronological order. The thing is though, I'm not interested in watching the show all over again. I'm seriously tired out from watching the show as it is after I've seen it. To be honest, I'm only motivated to do these videos because I get to share my thoughts on it. That's it. Aside from the occasional gem, I really do not like this show. Aged like milk. My opinion becomes lower and lower for this show, and it was hard going through the episodes because at some points, I was seriously losing motivation to. But the review is what pushed me to keep going. I will finish my Clone Wars review series as long as I'm still alive. And then we'll talk about Rebels, and the rest of the Filoni-verse. I'm JJ Plagiarisms. And until next time, why are stories but mystery boxes? Season 5. I have really gone far into the series now, haven't I? I have my audience to thank for that. As stated in my last video, the video review itself is my main motivation, since I really do not enjoy the show in hindsight. Season 5, from what I understand, is the highlight of the whole thing, but those who say that also love the rest of the series, while I say it's horrible. Dave Filoni is overrated. He at this point has also become a convenient alternative to George Lucas to those at Disney Lucasfilm. Dave Filoni hides behind George constantly and reaps all the rewards. I don't know Filoni personally, but I'd have to say that the image I have of him based on his actions, is not inspiring. He doesn't have the most punchable face, that would be Cosmonaut Variety Hour, but I'd say he's a mid-tier option. I'd rather punch JJ Abrams or Ryan Johnson, but I still have a general distaste for Filoni. Come to think about it, he is like Cosmonaut Variety Hour in many ways. Pretentious, ignorant, and deceptive. Dave Filoni's Star Wars literature experience is extremely limited but doesn't mind pretending to be a buff in the logistics of Star Wars. As I've proven in this review series, there is very few things he gets right about Star Wars lore. Whether it be from the EU, or even the films, he just sucks at Star Wars. His flagship character Ahsoka is getting damn old now, and he couldn't make a successor to save his life. Was Dave Filoni even known for anything before Star Wars? He wasn't even mainly involved with Avatar The Last Airbender as I originally thought. He just directed a few episodes, just like J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson. I am curious on the other stuff he's made, but that's a story for another time. Since I've ranted about Filoni for at least five times on my channel, I'm not going to slow down anytime soon. His influence hasn't been stated enough. 
He really has all the power he needs to control Star Wars, even if he's not directly number one. People think that he's the god of Star Wars. I remember when Ryan's cult following tried to grandstand Last Jedi haters like me by saying that Filoni loved the movie. Like that means anything. Shouldn't George Lucas be the real consultant? Or are you just using Filoni because it's more useful for your agenda? Or an even scarier idea? You've convinced yourself that Filoni created Star Wars. Filoni wasn't even there until much, much later. Do I hate Filoni? Probably. He's overrated as shit and a poor Star Wars lore buff, but I don't know if I hate him. I'm leaning towards yes, because he's such a bad influence on the franchise, and he knows that what he does is bad for it, but power corrupts absolutely. Filoni is almost like Palpatine, manipulating things to go his way. He did this with George Lucas, and he's doing this with Disney Lucasfilm. Just wait until he becomes the head of Lucasfilm. His rise to the top will be complete, and he'll plaster Ahsoka over everything, again, for the trillionth time. When Filoni dies, I won't be surprised if his funeral is Ahsoka themed. With whatever the Ahsoka series theme will be, and her colours splattered on his coffin. Let's just say that will be a really bizarre day when that happens, decades down the line presumably. I'll be like 40 and I'll be like, man, Filoni did a lot, didn't he? Okay, I should probably stop talking about when Filoni dies. That was just a thought experiment. I'm just saying that Ahsoka is his flagship character, and pretty much his only flagship character when it comes to Star Wars. George Lucas has a lot under his belt, but the most important would probably be Anakin slash Vader. Drew Carpishans would be Revan, Timothy Zahn's would be Thrawn, and so on and so forth. Ahsoka is the weakest of the four I just mentioned. Worst major Star Wars character ever. At least in the Lucas era. Because I mean, we've got Rey Skywalker. So with that being said, let's get into Star Wars The Clone Wars Season 5. It has been quite the journey so far. So what should we start with when it comes to Season 5? Darth Maul again, of course. It's established that he's been pillaging, looting, and murdering indiscriminately. He destroys a bunch of droids on a space station before taking a small fortune. I should have mentioned this before, but since Savage Press is nothing more than a shitty sidekick, his only purpose is to listen to whatever evil plan Maul relays to him, and thereby the audience. This is so lazy. It's also around here, where Maul forcibly takes Savage on as his apprentice. So what's Obi-Wan doing? Did he bring a Jedi strike team like how he should have in the first place? No, he's only brought one Jedi with him, Adi Galea. The moment I saw her on screen, I was like, uh-oh, what are they retconning now? Because it has to be something. Adi Galea, unlike most of the film Jedi explored in this show, have no personality. It's almost like she and Obi-Wan are buddy cops, the shittiest in the entirety of fiction. They investigate the space station Maul attacked, and the person questioned, who I'm guessing owns this station, isn't stressed out that his station was just attacked. He seems unnaturally calm to all this. Meanwhile, Maul and Savage go to Florum and... We see this piece of shit. A flying saucer. Very Star Warsian, isn't it? Anyways, the flying saucer is commanded by pirates who work for Hondo and Naka. They see Maul's ship and think it'll be easy pickings. Instead, they are bombarded with Maul and Savage. But Maul does not kill them. Instead, he offers wealth and benefits if they decide to join him. They intend to be crime lords. The shallow pirates of course decide to join Maul because money is more important than loyalty. Remember that, kids? Maul gives Hondo on the surface the same offer, and he obviously refuses. The saving grace to this episode is Hondo Inaka. I said that I liked him in previous episodes, and it's a good thing that he's here, because the rest of the episode sucks. He has such sarcastic, witty dialogue. Being proud, yet oh so distraught that his men betrayed him, and generally being the Jack Sparrow of his universe. Obi-Wan and Adi Galea show up in the system and contracts Hondo, and a temporary alliance develops between the two. While Hondo's men fend off the traitors, Obi-Wan and Galea face off against Maul and Savage. You then realise the only reason Galea was thrown into this episode was so that she could be killed off. Another classic 
Volonivus Retcon. Adi Galeo was originally killed by Grievous at the Battle of Boz Pity back when Grievous was a real villain who actually existed beyond losing every battle. This is also pointless too, because this didn't need to be a retcon. This is what happens when you don't send a Jedi Strike Team to deal with problems like this. What the hell were the other Jedi even doing? Were they just jerking off and smoking dope while playing fucking video games? I wonder what games they were playing. Adi Galea is killed off so easily, and the episode doesn't even establish why she's here if there wasn't a Jedi Strike team sent to assist Kenobi. Also, once they get inside the tunnels of the base, Hondo manages to re-establish the loyalty of his insubordinate men, while Obi-Wan and Maul face Savage alone. When they're about to kill him, Obi-Wan kicks Savage in the knee, causing him to go off balance. Which is weird because Adi Galea tried the same thing earlier in the episode, and it did nothing except make Savage even more angry, leading to her death. So Kenobi cuts off Savage's arm, and Kenobi flees. When Maul and Savage get back to the tunnels, Ondo and all of his men ambush them. And when boarding their ship, they decide to get into an escape pod and thus, Hondo and his pirate gang get to take all of Maul's riches, and then we've got a scene of Chancellor Palpatine telling them to forget about Maul, unless he causes trouble for the Republic directly, and that's the end. Maul isn't dead, and Palpatine's grand plan is in danger potentially because of that, but the last frame before the credits is Palpatine smiling evilly. I also gotta say, how Palpatine has barely been in this show. We don't really see Anakin further manipulating him, or anything like that, He's mostly just been there, I suppose. This is one of the few times I've directly talked about Palpatine in this show. He is very underutilized beyond contacting Dooku for evil plans to be thwarted by the good guys. In fact, speaking of Palpatine, it's so odd that one of his lackeys, Sly Moore, isn't in this show. She hardly even made any appearances in Disney canon, I hear, until the late Darth Vader comics. Well, anyways, let's get on with the next episode. The next episode, titled A War on Two Fronts, deals with an insurgency on Onderon after their king decides to join the Separatists. Oh, wow. Onderon? Really? Are you sure Filoni's talented enough to handle a planet prominently featured in the Old Republic? Probably not. Filoni was probably the one who decided to use Onderon as the relevant planet in this arc. I know that's an assumption, but it lines up with how most other episodes are made. Lux Bonteri makes his return. Since he was nothing more than a petty romance foil for Ahsoka that went nowhere, I don't know why he's here. He doesn't deserve to be from a planet with such a rich history that nobody should ever trust Filoni to explore. Ever. Well, point is, Lux is a co-leader of a resistance effort on Onderon. Problem is, though, they can't fight squad because they've got no training. So Anakin proposes that they get training so they can be an effective distraction for the Separatists. There's an idea floated around that Anakin is going to inspire T-words, because YouTube doesn't really like that word. Despite the concerns, Anakin's plan goes through. I'd also like to mention how Obi-Wan talks about abiding by proper conduct of war. Says the guy who, along with his apprentice, pulls false surrenders all the time. I know Obi-Wan's hypocrisy is part of his character, given he tends to do what Anakin does when he isn't around, but the way this is presented, it's supposed to be taken as serious. False surrender is a war crime. Period. I've seen some people try to defend this by saying that it's not technically a war crime based on Star Wars' conduct of war, but I think that's an extremely low bar. False surrender in the real world is one of the oldest wartime sins. Also, Obi-Wan and Anakin are supposed to be the good guys. And do you really have to go that far to defend Dave Filoni at that? Anyways, Obi-Wan decides to accompany Anakin and Ahsoka to Onderon. In terms of aesthetic inconsistencies, Duxon, the jungle moon is nowhere to be seen. The Jedi plus Captain Rex are dropped off and meet this gal, Steeler, who escorts them to the Rebel base. It's also here where we meet, and I'm so glad I get to play this intro again, Saw Guerrera before becoming leader of the Partisans. The three of us this morning. I'm the only one this evening. But I must go on. The frontiers 
This is Saw Guerrero in his earlier years. I have to question how old he's supposed to be given he looks like he'd pass off at late 20s at oldest and the actor was mid 50s when Rogue One was made. I'm just saying that the age doesn't line up completely well. The before mentioned Steeler is his sister. I watched Rogue One before I saw the Clone Wars and thus I was surprised that this was his origin. Filoni's influence is everlasting. Also, since the Onderon Resistance are established in having little to no fighting experience, it's going to take more than a short but sweet classic Rocky training montage to get them up to speed on how to use guerrilla tactics to fight the Separatists. They practice shield penetration, taking out Separatist tanks and whatnot. It's also here that we see that Lux and Steeler are romantically involved, much to the something 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 feeling of Ahsoka. Again, given I don't give a shit about their potential romance that went nowhere, it just feels awkward. And I don't mean because there's a conflicting love triangle or anything, but rather in regards to how the story is presented. They also cease to show Ahsoka's something something feelings towards Steeler and Lux just around halfway through the arc. I honestly forgot about it until self-reflecting on my thoughts on this episode. I also suppose it can be considered a character trait by this point that Lux has a thing for black girls. First Ahsoka, who I suppose is technically black because Rosario Dawson, and now Steeler Guerrera. Coincidence? I think not! Why do I bring this up? I don't know, I just thought it was an interesting factoid. With that being said, a couple of Separatist recon droids discover the Rebels location and move to attack them. With only a day of training if that, the Onderon Rebels use their newly acquired skills to take out the droids sent to kill them. It's a common thing in this episode that the Jedi restrain themselves from fighting directly, given they're here to teach the Rebels how to fight and they're not going to fight the war for them. So after they're done destroying the droids, they decide to sneak into the capital city of Isis. How are they going to do that? Well, they pose as merchants and rely on the stupidity of battle droids to let them in. Man, are things just made way too easy for the good guys in this show sometimes? The way this is presented, I was just scoffing at it, because this is so absurd and unbelievably stupid. I know droids are dumb, but are they really the only guards for verification ever? I don't think so. Well, moving past that, we get a montage of the rebels putting their skills to the test, disrupting the new king's regime. Speaking of the new king, we get our proper introduction to this guy, King Rash, the weirdest name for a king ever. He assumes that the previous king he dethroned, Ramses Dendup, is behind this rebellion. So he gets Dendup out of his cell and questions him. Dendup denies any involvement in the uprising, and King Rash does nothing but have a hissy fit. Anakin and Obi-Wan after a while return to Coruscant, leaving Ahsoka to supervise the whole thing. You trust her, right? Yeah, before my rewatch, I was told that Ahsoka was in the season a lot more than what was reasonable. Anyways, Lux decides they should destroy the droid's power grid to prevent them from recharging. So they deactivate a droid patrol, board a tank, and use it to blast the power grid. It's around this time that I'm baffled by the sheer absurdity of all this. The rebels just trained for a fucking day, and now they're more capable freedom fighters. Also, it's the fact that the Separatists don't have any victories at all in this episode. They just keep failing, further playing into the trope that the Republic or the good guys always win in this show. King Rash requests a new supply of droids from Count Dooku, who also gets him a new general, a droid named Kalani. And with that, the episode is complete. We've got two more episodes to go in terms of this arc. The next episode starts with another ambush of droids, and Steeler, who previously assumed the role of rebel leader, makes a broadcast trying to win the hearts and minds of the people. King Rash has another meeting with his lackeys, and he brings the deposed King Dendup again and decides to execute him to demoralize the rebels. When the rebels are informed of this, Saw goes on to a solo mission to free the king, despite the protests from his sister. 
What a well-organized rebellion, am I right? Anyway, Saw infiltrates the palace, which doesn't have a high security as you would expect, and talks to the king to have him rescued, but ends up being captured himself. And now he, too, is on the lineup to be executed. It's here where the Onderon general guy speaks to Saw, and has a turnaround even more sudden than that Quarren in the Mon Cala arc in Season 4. The next day, at the public execution, the Onderon rebels move into the crowd. The whole thing is set up like guillotines, those head slices used in the French Revolution and the Reign of Terror. The ex-king is about to be beheaded, when the rebels in the crowd step in at the last minute and destroy all the guards, except for Kalani and King Rash, which is extremely convenient. As expected from a poorly planned attack, the droids surround them, and despite Ahsoka's obligation to stay out of things, she is about to intervene, when the Onderon general guy turns on King Rash, along with some of the Onderon militia. It feels like the only way these rebels would have survived is if an external force bailed them out. If they were expecting Ahsoka to intervene, then that's extremely misguided. Also, why is Ahsoka sent out on assignments on her own so often? I remember the same thing happened when she went to Mandalore to teach Corky and friends. Ahsoka isn't even an adult yet, or a knight. Why is she being sent on these super dangerous missions without supervision? Oh wait, I know why. Filoni wanted her to be an independent young whammon. I get it now. Still though, I've been reading Darth Bane Rule of Two, and that book establishes that Padawans cannot do assignments on their own. They need supervision from a knight or master. This is a semi-important plot point in the book actually. I'll explain this when I get around to doing that book. Also, despite the general stepping in, Ahsoka still reveals herself. Kinda defeats the whole purpose, doesn't it? Point is, the ex-king is freed from his shackles, and this all leads us into the next episode. So far, my impression is that this is the worst rebellion in the world. Funnily enough, it's as bad as Saw Gerrera's partisans for the opposite reasons. The Onderon Rebellion feels like they don't punch hard enough. It's the kid-friendliest rebellion in the world. Now, normally something being kid-friendly is fine. It's almost on a kindergarten level, almost. With that being said, the Onderon Rebels make a message with the ex-king, encouraging the people of Onderon to rise up, and the poor droids are attacked with stuff thrown at them. I suppose the droid banter still is the redeeming quality throughout this show. The Rebels, meanwhile, plan to draw out as many droids as possible to overthrow King Rash. Steeler Osa briefly kisses Lux, because I guess it wasn't obvious enough that Lux and Steeler were in a relationship. Although looking back, this makes it too obvious that something's gonna happen to Steeler or Lux. Thanks for the spoiler, Filoni. Man, does this show have the worst twists and turns? So King Rash and Kalani send droids to the Highlands to take out the Rebels. So we get an okay spectacle sequence, with the Rebels using flying beasts to take over Onderon. You know, this arc doesn't really misrepresent Onderon much, aside from leaving out Duxon, but it also doesn't represent it either. If this planet was called something else, you wouldn't know the difference. Take it from someone who's read Tales of the Jedi, the real version, and KOTOR 2. Since the Onderon Rebels are easily outmatched and outgunned, Ahsoka requests help from the Jedi Council, but Obi-Wan and Anakin tell her that no can do. But Anakin decides to help his apprentice indirectly. So what's Anakin to do? Get Hondo and Arka to send supplies to the Rebels, of course. <laughs> okay, you got me there, show. That's clever. Plus, it's nice seeing Hondo again. So the pirates show up to supply the rebels with what are essentially rocket launchers. Hondo leaves just as soon as he arrives once the droids show up. Great cameo. So how does the rest of the episode hold up? Well, it turns out the rocket launchers were real. You didn't scam them. Although the thing is, the tables are turned far too quickly, I think. As that's happening, Steeler, Lux, and Ahsoka are called back to base as the Separatists intend to kill the ex-king. They return to base, and Seela narrowly saves the king, but as that happens, Saw shoots down a droid gunship, and it crashes right at Steeler's location, resulting in the edge of the hill cracking, and Steeler holding on for dear life. When I saw this, I was like, oh god, this better not be going where I think it's going. Yeah. 
So Ahsoka uses the Force to try and save her, but conveniently, our droid blaster cannon hinders Ahsoka and she drops Steeler, resulting in her plummeting to her death. And it's gone. Alright, I suppose Steeler was an okay character. She didn't really leave much of an impact, so I just had a blank expression when the sad dramatic music played. Everyone is destroyed. Ahsoka, Lux, and Saw. Watching it out of context, the scene is pretty fucking incredible, but in context, this was just a meh death that felt overplayed. It also felt too much like they wanted an excuse to kill Steeler off. When they go down where Steeler splat on the ground, it's all insinuated that Steeler knew the risks and that she died a hero. I suppose this show kind of earns it, it makes sense in context. My complaints about the Kindergarten Rebellion still remain, but at least the episode doesn't end with serious implications. Especially when Count Dooku ceases King Rash's support and kills him. Oh great, the villain kills his own men cliche. King Rash was gonna die anyways. Just leave him to his fate, Dooku. So a memorial is held for Steeler, who is martyred as a hero of Onderon. Meanwhile, I was thinking about how they didn't do Onderon justice. This was an underwhelming arc. I don't know why they even used Onderon. I suppose they didn't misrepresent it? but they didn't represent it either. It was just hollow garbage. Many have said this is supposed to show the roots of the rebellion, and while I suppose that's true, I wasn't really inspired at all. It didn't feel like this was a brutal regime that needed to be toppled. At least the original trilogy had Alderaan being blown up, that was pretty terrible, but this arc has nothing. I don't recall much of people being oppressed. The way it's presented, it's almost like a bunch of rebels unhappy with the status quo being changed. Almost as if when Trump became president and there was a revolution because people were so used to Obama. That sounds silly, right? The same is true here. Uprisings happen when bad or oppressive decisions are made. Here, what has King Rush done to deserve this? I don't fucking know. Most of what he does is hunting down those who oppose him violently. That's not evil. Yeah, this was underwhelming. Didn't like it. Let's see if the next arc can do better. The next has little in relation to the Clone Wars itself. It's mostly just younglings picking their crystals during the war. We see a group of younglings, including a Wookiee Jedi, because George Lucas couldn't make up his mind on Wookiee Jedi since Lobaka, but... Anyways, these younglings are going to Ilum to find a lightsaber crystal that matches them. For some reason, Ahsoka despite still being a Padawan, is going to guide them. Because Filoni has no clue about Jedi rituals, I think Ahsoka would be tasked with something else. And again, Padawans aren't allowed to do missions like this without the supervision of one ranked higher in the Jedi Order. Well, ignoring that, Ahsoka takes the younglings to Ilum, where Master Yoda awaits. You know, if Yoda was on the transport, that would have neglected this problem. But since Filoni don't give a fuck, we've got him at Ilum instead, waiting for Ahsoka and the younglings. Also, Ahsoka and Yoda pull a twisted prank on the younglings by telling them the door will freeze, then they will be trapped inside the cave. So they better do it in a time limit. So for some reason, they want the younglings to rush it. I'm probably overthinking it, but still. The younglings venture inside and basically try to find their crystal in a timely manner. It showcases all the younglings finding their crystals in their own way. To the episode's credit, they do differentiate all the younglings. I couldn't be bothered remembering their names a week from now, but hey, I can tell them apart at least. I feel especially bad for the Athorian. The noises he makes from being scared kind of got me. I'm not gonna lie. I suppose this is a better version of what the Tales of the Jedi shorts tried to do with Ahsoka. Still though, I think the Clone Wars wasn't a good time period to tell a story like this. It has little to do with the war, nor is it an episode arc that focuses on the main character specifically. Ahsoka is shoved in your face in this season, when she doesn't need to be, especially since her appearances break Jedi rules, on top of the fact that she never existed ever in the Expanded Universe, ever. Anyways, next episode. The next one basically focuses on building a lightsaber. I will say that this episode pretty much breaks law concerning crystals. From what I understand, crystals did not need to be bonded with the user, because that was extremely rare. The crystal the Jedi Exile bonded with was that. 
extremely rare. Also, Felony rips the name from Splinter of the Mind's Eye, the very first Expanded Universe novel ever written. Now, I am yet to read Splinter of the Mind's Eye, so this is mostly word of mouth, but the way it's described to me, it's egregious. Also, Jedi would go with their master as a Padawan, not a youngling. Also, they would face visions and basically other shit the Clone Wars didn't present. Anyways, this episode has Honda and Arca in it again, which is part of what prevents these episodes from falling apart because he's great. He targets the ship, and as that's happening, the younglings are taught to make their lightsabers. The droid that helps them make them is quippy and likable, so I guess the droids are still the best part about this show. For some reason, the Wookiee youngling wants to make a lightsaber made of wood. I remember when StarWars.com put this lightsaber in their top 10, even though they left out a ton of superior lightsabers from the expanded universe. Where the hell was Exar Kun's lightsaber? Oh wait, I get it. Despite being part of official Star Wars staff, they have no idea what a Revan is. Those super casual lists annoy me. Anyways, back to the episode. A chunk of this episode is lightsaber construction. When that's interrupted by the pirates, Ahsoka, who is the sole supervisor, even though once again, Padawans aren't allowed on their own, is basically the only one to protect them. I guess somehow, they'll find some way to even the odds, even if it's extremely not in their favour. Hondo and Naka's goons forget to check the vents, because we needed an excuse for the younglings to stay hidden, and when reminded they need to check the vents, Hondo decides to smoke them out. The episode is power level inconsistency, given the pirates are outmaneuvered by younglings plus Ahsoka. I guess R2 is there as well, but I think the outcome should have had the pirates as the clear victor. The human boy, Petro I think his name was, even tricks a pirate into using his faulty lightsaber that explodes. The explosion isn't lethal enough, which is surprising. The episode ultimately ends with Ahsoka being captured by the pirates, in which Anaka intends to sell her off. Hopefully not as a sex slave this time. Good. This is far from the end we'll hear of her, unfortunately. Anyways, the Separatists ambush Kenobi's fleet, with the episode breaking continuity by having Kenobi and Grievous fight again when they're not supposed to. I've complained what was wrong the first four or five times, so I'm not repeating myself. Filoni should have never done this. Anyways, the younglings decide to disobey direct orders from Kenobi and try to rescue Ahsoka anyways. What is it with kids in the show being so disobedient? They conveniently come across a carnival transport that is conveniently traveling to entertain Hondo. They pretend to be acrobats in the most corny thing I've ever seen so that the carnival will take them along. This is so fucking stupid that I hope there's a fucking clown on that transport too. <coughs> yeah, I'm hoping that the good guys will fail so much, aren't I? I can't help it. I fucking hate Ahsoka. Anyways, Kenobi sets the ship to self-destruct, and Grievous flees the scene. Meanwhile, I'm cringing as this carnival just takes me out of the universe, because it looks too much like Earth, and the youngling steals Ahsoka's lightsabers from a drunk Hondo. Then Ahsoka and the younglings escape way too easily. My god. I have to mention that in this part of the arc, Hondo was way overplayed. He works better in smaller doses. So the third episode is pretty much the worst. I hated it. Only question is, what about the fourth episode? Well, the show goes completely off the rails from here. After a brief chase sequence, General Grievous and the droid army shows up. Hondo and Arca and the pirates are now under Separatist control and influence. So this is sort of a sequel to the episode where Hondo captured Dooku. And now the tables have turned and Dooku has now captured Hondo. So what happens from here? The pirates and the younglings plus Ahsoka team up. Okay, that's an unlikely alliance. Hondo certainly prevents this episode from being terrible, and I suppose I mildly enjoyed this episode for what it's worth. I still think it's unneeded, and it doesn't tell us exactly where we are in the damn war, but it's something. So there, there is a joint uprising against the Separatists. Ironically, this is more engaging and interesting than the Onderon arc. That's not saying much, but I just wanted to say it. Also, as the episode progresses, I slowly realized that this was the dreaded episode that made a certain character even more of a joke than before. Grievous takes on Ahsoka 
and the younglings and is unable to defeat him. And this right here is Grievous at his lowest bar. The fact that he can't even kill children is so fucking pathetic. Remember when Jedi Shaggy was flat out terrified? Those days have long passed. Fuck off, Filoni. So yeah, this arc is pretty bad. The Younglings arc did not interest me. I suppose it was slightly better than the Onderon arc, but again, that's not saying much. I don't think the Younglings arc was the best idea. Something like this is better left to a story specifically about it in a source book or whatever. The Clone Wars sometimes has irrelevant episodes. I've said before that there can be more personal arcs that don't really relate to the war, but this ain't it. Ahsoka I'm really getting sick of, and Grievous has become so predictable. With that being said, we come to the episode arc which is ironically George Lucas' favourite in the whole show. You know, the one Giram tried to use to discredit George Lucas as a good filmmaker. That's ridiculous. Like something, even if it's bad, doesn't make you any less a filmmaker. Do filmmakers have to like the only well-made stuff only? No, their taste can be just like the average moviegoer. You say the following arc is the worst in the whole show. Well, first of all, that's dead wrong. And second, there's not much good in the show anyways because it's fucking overrated. It wasn't even making money at the start, but George continued funding it because he didn't mind losing money. He had plenty of it and he could afford to take a hit. Before I rewatch this arc, I had the idea that this would ironically be my favorite set of episodes. So far, my favorite is the one where Obi Wan poses as Rayco Hardeen. So now we should probably get into the episode. The episode is called Secret Weapons, and the cast is primarily droids. Good. The droids have never disappointed, so hopefully this show can be salvaged somewhat. A group of astromech droids, including R2-D2, are sent onto a mission to sneak into a separatist ship and retrieve some decoding module for intercepting messages from General Grievous. As such, Master Windu puts a dude named Colonel Meeber Gaskin in charge. I have to say, I love this guy. He has the trope of acting high and mighty to make up for his very small stature, and when paired with droids, he gets very bossy. Plus, the droids themselves are quippy and funny. I like it. The natural chemistry of the Colonel and the droids carry this episode, as the unconventional team must make up for their limited abilities and rely on each other to make it out alive. They take a shuttle to the Separatist fleet and sneak past with the Colonel hidden in one of the droids. They manage to take the module and make it out just as the alarms are raised. I like the part with the Colonel taking on the Separatist commander droid and bouncing around to outplay him. Oh, so one last thing. The Colonel has the voice of an American commander, which kind of makes his character a lot better because of his identifiable voice. Anyways, they make it out with the module and jump into hyperspace, leading us to the next episode. The one Giram specifically seemed to give Lucas a lot of shit for for liking specifically as his favorite episode. In my personal opinion, this episode is okay. The thing that keeps this episode alive is the dialogue between the Colonel and the droids. They collide with ice comets in hyperspace and collide into a flat-ass desert planet with no end in sight. This is basically them surviving in the desert, and I'd say that the humour is pretty funny. They make light of being stuck in the desert and becoming thirsty and whatnot. I don't really see any problems beyond it not relating to the war, like the first episode in the arc did, but this didn't. On its own, it's fine. It's not a very interesting episode, but it ain't boring either. The entire episode results in the group making it to a small settlement in this desolate wasteland. That's where the next episode kicks in. The group are really looking to replenish because the Colonel is exhausted and hungry and the droids need a recharge. The Colonel tries walking into a bar only to be kicked out because the owner is a dick. As well as this, the Colonel almost resorts to eating literal garbage until the most convenient character shows up. A clone. Yeah. Although the writers gave him the most convenient case of amnesia I've ever seen. This clone Gregor has no memory of his life as a soldier in the Grand Army of the Republic because reasons. After his shift ends, the Colonel and the droids follow him all the way to his crappy place because it's not a rent-free world. Mr. Dikovich intensifies. They play a projection of Captain Rex, who Gregor thinks is himself, and of course the group explain to him who he really is. 
They discovered due to an arm tag scan that he was a clone commando captain who went missing during the Battle of Sarish. According to the Colonel, the Battle of Sarish was one of the Republic's most devastating defeats. Well, it's nice to know that the Republic actually lost once in this show, but that's far from impressive from a writing perspective. The Republic should have lost more times than one. Anyways, Gregor decides he's back in the war once he recounts limited memories of the battle and so he remembers where his equipment is. Turns out Gregor's boss has been keeping him essentially as a slave. Gregor confronts his boss and makes a speech about being with the Republic is way better and has more glory than being a dishwasher. But with that being said, the Separatists are coming. So after scouting out the area, it's nice to see that they got the Republic Commando Visor right at least. The guy clears a path for the group to escape, but sacrifices himself in the process. Presumed to be dead until Star Wars Rebels. Man, Filoni can't help but keep his favourites alive, can he? He can't let them go. Anyways, next episode. The group make it to a Republic ship in the middle of space. Making their way to the bridge, they at first see Republic officers, which turns out to be high quality holograms. A little too advanced for the technology of Star Wars, but whatever. It turns out it's filled with droids, and the whole thing is a trap. The whole episode devolves into stopping the Separatist ship from ramming into a Republic conference. The whole thing is a bunch of shenanigans, and then at the end, they escape, having to leave R2 behind as the ship blows up. But don't worry though, he's found relatively intact through the wreckage somehow, which is super contrived, and the whole ending is happy. I guess aside from R2's insane plot armor, the ending wasn't that bad. The Colonel certainly was an entertaining character, and the droids certainly lifted up what otherwise would have been a bizarre arc. I almost feel as if the writers were on drugs. All the episodes are very different from each other, so I suppose this would be the most unique arc. I suppose I would say this entire arc is decent. It's not as good as the Obi-Wan poses as a bounty hunter arc, which was pretty much great except for the ending, but it's still enjoyable. So I'll throw a bone and say season 5 finally did it. Now we're getting into the stuff that people really talk about in regards to season 5. The first of which is Darth Maul again. So far, I've been unimpressed with Maul. So let's see if his last appearance before season 7 was worth it. This takes place right after the first episode of Season 5, or at least, that's how it's described. Maul and Savage, after being defeated again, drift into unknown space, cold and barely alive. Conveniently, a group of the scummiest people arrive to save the day. The Death Watch, led by Osama Bin Vizsla enter, and find Maul and Savage. Osama Bin Vizsla decides to save them, as they may be enemies of the Jedi. The Death Watch have them restrained in their temporary camp, and when they wake up, Osama Bin Vizsla questions them on who they are. Maul explains who he is, and Osama Bin Vizsla proves to be relatively hospitable. I find this to be a bit jarring, since since Vizsla was previously very cold with the other characters. I say this because when Maul enters Vizsla's tent, Vizsla invites him in for tea. That's pretty civilized for the guy who burned down a village in his last appearance. Anyways, Vizsla also introduces himself and his group. They believe in the Filoniverse version of Mandalorian warrior culture, and are hindered by the dumbass pacifist government of Duchess Satine. Wow, you're now going to fix the problem you introduced, Filoni? How thoughtful! So anyways, Osama Bin Vizsla and Maul propose an alliance. Vizsla gets Mandalore, and Maul gets Kenobi. It's a win-win. Of course, the molester Bo-Katan steps in and objects to the idea. And Maul of course chokes her because she was talking shit about him. I suppose what I do like is how Maul's monologues are animated. Very sinister. So I'll give the episode that. The Death Watch all mutually agree that the brothers Maul and Savage would be very useful. Maul quickly comes up with the plan to recruit the Black Sun Crime Syndicate so they can liberate Mandalore. So they go to the Black Sun's place. Now, I haven't indulged myself in the Shadows of the Empire multimedia project yet. I've only played a little bit of the video game, but why do I suspect they're doing something to the Black Suns? I glimpsed at Prince Shizor's Wikipedia page, and it says that the Clone Wars fucked something up. Anyways, Maul beheads the Black Sun leadership, and the de facto leader left alive decides to join Maul. Osama Bin Vizsla is ready to take over Mandalore, but Maul stalls him. He says that they need to do more planning before they 
liberate Mandalore. And then the Pikes decide to join Maul on the spot. While I suppose things are made way too easy for Maul and the Death Watch, I suppose they heard about the Black Sun leadership losing their heads and figured if they joined Maul now, they wouldn't encounter any problems. Besides, there's a fair sight for mutual gain by joining a bigger organization. They next intend to get the Huts to join them, but the Huts decide to take their chances and attack them. After a brief Kinda okay action sequence, Maul and Death Watch come out on top, although most of the huts escape, conveniently except for one. After that one hut gives them a lack of information, aside from Jabba can be found on Jabba's palace on Tatooine, he is executed. You could have tried to extract more information from him guys, just saying. So of course they go to Jabba's palace next and barge in, and Jabba finally relents and decides to join Maul and his alliance. It's around here that Vizsla figures after they take Mandalore, they will get rid of Maul and his brother Savage. That's the first episode. I will say there wasn't much tension. It was mostly just a setup episode. The Jedi nor any of the good guys are in it. So anyways, in the meeting room, Maul decides to pull a false flag attack. Maul's criminals will attack Mandalore's capital, Sundari, and then the Death Watch will show up and save the day. This sounds extremely similar to Syndrome's plan in The Incredibles, except less likely to work. Now, Syndrome's plan was born out of narcissism and arrogance, so it made sense why it was so delusional. But this plan, in context, is so stupid. I can't believe they're actually going with it. I suppose the writers, when they decided to have Maul and Vizsla take over Mandalore, struggled to come up with a way to get them to control the planet. So they just came up with a plan that would never work and decided to roll with it. So the fake invasion begins, and conveniently the Death Watch arrive to save the day. Duchess Satine can obviously tell Vizsla planned this, but of course Vizsla denies it. We get a montage of the Death Watch saving the people of Mandalore. Right now, I'm scoffing at how this plan actually worked. The reason this plan shouldn't have worked is simple. The Death Watch had committed many atrocities against the Mandalorian people and other systems. Are the people so dumb that they're just willing to forgive and forget? I don't think so. Do you think a government could just be overthrown if a group of T-Words showed up and saved the day from a suspiciously convenient invasion? They make overthrowing a government look so easy. A poorly strung along false flag attack is all that's needed. Also, it's not really explained why Duchess was instantly deposed. Did she make some bad decisions off screen before the invasion? This is so fucking pathetic and weak. I don't buy this one bit. So because the people of Mandalore are dumb and have short memories, except Vizsla as Prime Minister on a whim. Satine is thrown into a prison cell, and Olmec, who I forgot for most of the season, has the cell opposite to her. So anyways, with the plan complete, Vizsla backstabs Maul and has him arrested, and they're locked in a cell. For some reason, they forgot to put him in a cell that is resistant to Force users, and so the two easily escape. Season 7 had Maul locked inside a Force-resistant coffin thing. Where the hell was that? Or did you guys just not come up with that yet, and was thrown in as an afterthought? Just like Ahsoka? Man, the writing here is so piss poor. Fortunately, the storytelling kind of gets back on track when Maul and Savage make an offer to Olmec, being Mandalore's Prime Minister once he's done with Osama bin Vizsla. Maul intends to challenge Vizsla one-on-one -on -one to the title of leader, and due to ancient Mandalorian customs that Filoni ignored for most of this show, if he wins, Vizsla's soldiers will switch allegiances via Mandalorian customs. If the first half of this episode wasn't so god-awful writing-wise, I'd be on board with this turn of events. We cut to Vizsla sitting on his throne, contacted by one of his lackeys, being strangled by a Maul. Maul and Savage barge in, and Maul has the coolest demand to the throne ever. I challenge you! One warrior to another, and only the strongest shall rule Mandalore. 
Vizsla, knowing he must abide by Mandalorian standards, accepts the duel. This is probably the coolest fight scene so far. And to be frank, I almost forgot the terrible writing that led up to this. But almost isn't good enough. Vizsla always seizes his advantages, using his jetpack and everything at his disposal to overpower Maul. But he should have known better. Because Maul comes up on top. He viciously beats Vizsla down, claiming the Darksaber, and we see Vizsla chose his final words carefully. I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior! Osama bin Vizsla is dead. Around half of the Death Watch in the room automatically accept Maul as their new leader. While Bo-Katan isn't willing to accept Maul as leader, she proclaims that they're all traitors and Maul simply responds that History will not see it that way. With that, Olmec is instated as Prime Minister, with Maul as de facto leader of Mandalore. Now he plans to draw out Kenobi. My impressions of this episode is mixed in the most literal sense. The first half was terrible, while the second half was excellent. Do I trust that they keep it that way? Not really, but we'll find out soon enough. The episode starts in Corky, remember him, shows up to rescue Duchess Satine with the help of Bo-Katan. Even when I first saw this episode, I hated Bo-Katan's immediate turnaround. She just becomes one of the good gals overnight, and nobody really talks about her terrible deeds that she did directly or wasn't accomplished too much after this. This should not be treated like she's suddenly in the clear for all the pretty terrible stuff she's done with Osama bin Vizsla. Anyways, during the attempted escape, Satine is captured again, but not before she's able to send a distress message to the Jedi Council. Obi-Wan is called in and adamant on saving her, but Kiandi Mundi points out that since the Death Watch are aligned with the Separatists no longer, the Jedi nor the Republic can step in. So what does Obi-Wan do when he realizes he can't help Duchess Satine? Obi-Wan decides to go in alone. This isn't a criticism of the episode, but why didn't Obi-Wan bring Anakin along with him? Two Jedi is better than one. Obi-Wan references how he borrowed the ship from Anakin, and using his Reiko Hardeen disguise, he does the classic steel armor maneuver to get in undetected. Well, at least they're referencing the movies, and it makes sense in context. He tries breaking Satine out, but making it back to the docking port, they are captured by Maul and brought back to the palace. For the first time, Maul explains his deep most hatred for Obi-Wan, to Obi-Wan, and the first time we actually get a deep dive into Maul's character. It took them this long, but they finally did it. Obi-Wan refuses to succumb to the dark side, but Maul comes up with the ultimate kicker to have Obi-Wan share his pain. He is going to kill Satine, the one he loves, and then he does just that. Ouch. Okay, you got me there, show. Satine wasn't exactly a lore-accurate character, but looking past that, Obi-Wan is distraught and you're right along with him. So first Qui-Gon, now Satine. Obi-Wan has had a lot of bad luck in Star Wars, given he'll lose his apprentice too. Oh wait, there is no such thing as luck. My mistake. Anyways, Palpatine from across the galaxy senses Maul on Mandalore, and now he's going to have a little meeting with his old apprentice. About time. I was wondering why Palpatine was just sitting on his fat ass. The rest of the episode is a duel sequence from the perspective of Obi-Wan and Sidious. Obi-Wan is freed by Bo-Katan, who is conveniently revealed to be Satine's sister. Okay, that was a weird plot twist. I don't really have any thoughts there, because it felt super random. And again, they treat Bo-Katan like she hasn't done anything wrong. So anyways, Obi-Wan escapes. Now let's talk about the more interesting perspective of the two. The all-powerful Darth Sidious makes it all the way to Maul's throne room. Maul, when he senses the presence of his old master, is terrified. I'll give you points for that. Sidious was the worst master ever. Despite knowing the incredible threat that his master possesses, he and Savage still try to take him on in a two-on-one. The two fight as hard as they can, but it's no use. Sidious toys with both of them, dodging and blocking all their attacks, with Sidious killing Savage. Maul goes to his brother's side in his final moments, as the Night Sister magic wears off, and he resorts back to his normal shape. Sidious too overpowers Maul and realizing he is bested, he begs for mercy and Sidious 
kind of gives it to him, but not before throwing Sith lightning at him and enjoying it at that. Maul in pain and screaming is extremely hard to watch the first time. We know that despite Maul being a villain, he is still a victim of the evil Darth Sidious. I've complained previously that Palpatine isn't in this show much. Well thanks for finally giving him a moment to shine and be the evil personification of the devil that he is. It took you five seasons though, but the moment that's given to us is great. Well done whoever wrote this. I'll throw you a bone if it was you. Actually I had a look and it says that this episode was written by a guy called Chris Collins. So it wasn't you, Filoni. Also, something I noticed was Palpatine's two lightsabers. I guess it does explain that Palpatine didn't retrieve his lightsaber in Revenge of the Sith because he already had two of them. This is no compliment since the show has retconned so much, and it's about to retcon so much more. I've still got the season to wrap up, and then season 6 and season 7, but now we've got perhaps the most important arc in the show. I've complained about Ahsoka a lot throughout this series review, and rest assured, I still don't have nice things to say about her. This is the arc that determined Ahsoka's fate, and it wasn't as predetermined as you might think without knowledge of behind the scenes exploits. I've actively questioned how much of a plan Filoni had during the making of the show, because I keep saying that I still have no idea where the war is going. It seems based on my understanding that there was a rough plan for the show, more so than the sequel trilogy, but nothing more. But still, I wish it was planned out more. With that being said, let's get into the Jedi Temple bombing arc. The first part of the episode is a complete waste of time, and it introduces a plot hole later. It's a battle on Kata Nemoidia. This has nothing to do with the rest of the arc. It's just Anakin and Ahsoka in a fighter battle, and Anakin is being drilled by buzz droids before Revenge of the Sith. Ahsoka has to save him, and ends up crashing his fighter in the process. Then this part is completely dropped when Yoda contacts the both of them and informs them that a Jedi Temple hangar has been bombed. So the opening was just filler. The real episode starts with Anakin and Ahsoka talking to the Council about the Temple bombing. And I gotta say, I was actually surprised with how interesting the mystery was. When Ahsoka and Anakin were tasked with investigating the Temple bombing, they do everything that is sensible in an investigation like this. They look all over the crime scene, ask survivors and witnesses, and when they have a lead, in the form of a guy named Jakar, they question his wife and they recount the footage, trying to figure out what happened. They see that there were microscopic nanodroids set to explode, and Jakar might be behind it. They try to get the droid to look over hours of footage, and after searching for a while, the droid finds part of Jakar. His hand is left intact, while the rest of him exploded. They find out that the nanodroids were in his bloodstream when the explosion happened, so they go into his home. The music is really gripping, so I gotta hand it to the episode. For the moment, I'm fully soaked into the story. Eventually, they find Letta entering the home, and they ask her to come for further questioning, but as they're walking out, she tries to escape. But it's futile, because Ahsoka and Anakin catch her, and she confesses that she fed her husband food with the nanodroids in them, and it seems that they have their Jedi Temple bomber. That's the end of the first episode. I guess another important thing to mention is that since both clones and civilians alike, died in the bombing as well as Jedi, the Senate is paying attention to the bombing as well, but not out of any love for the Jedi. So in the next episode, a memorial is held for the Jedi killed in the bombing. Barriss Offee, who was barely seen since season 2, is reintroduced to us. After the memorial, Anakin, Ahsoka, and Barriss are informed by Tarkin that letter, the Jedi Temple Bomber, is under military custody, given clones died in the bombing. Ahsoka and Barriss speak to each other briefly, and then Tarkin contacts the Jedi, saying that Leda wishes to speak to Ahsoka Tano because she'll speak to no one else. When I watched this with a critical eye, I thought... Yeah, I don't think a T-word would get that luxury, but anyways, Ahsoka goes to speak to her, and guess what? She spills the beans. She says that a Jedi taught her how to create the bomb. For some reason, she goes on a long monologue about being set up and whatnot, and by the time Ahsoka actually pries information on who the Jedi was, she's conveniently choked with the Force until she drops dead. The suspension of disbelief has been pushed too far here. The woman goes on too long on being set up and fails to get to the point, and then when she's about to, she's conveniently choked by the perpetrator. The 
The clone see doctored security footage of Ahsoka choking Leto, and again, I have to question this. Many times, it feels like the technology in the show is way too advanced for Star Wars standards. Faking security footage like that would require a lot of money, I presume. Plus some CIA level hacking to import right around the time the person was being choked. I struggle to believe that the perpetrator would be able to do this sort of complex multitasking unless they were immensely powerful and accomplished Jedi Master. You probably know where I'm going with this when it finally is revealed. Tarkin refuses to believe Ahsoka's accounts after viewing the fake recording. Also, he touches her inappropriately. Anyways, Anakin tries to see Ahsoka, but is turned down. Instead, the unseen perpetrator throws a key card near Ahsoka, which he uses to escape. Conveniently, the perpetrator also slew the clones to make her look guilty. She runs all over the base, trying to escape. It's believed that she killed a bunch of clones, and I'm just sitting here with disbelief. Ahsoka isn't guilty, and the fact that she wasn't even on Coruscant when the temple bombing happened should be proof enough of that. Anakin and the clones pursue Ahsoka, and hey, the music that plays here is pretty cool. That's about the only compliment I'm paying this episode, besides the general quality animation in Season 5. Okay, I guess the spectacle is decent too. Fun fact, remember that kid named Lucas that I mentioned in one of my previous previous videos who was a massive fan of this show? Well he told me about this part out of context. He said that Ahsoka was being chased by clones and being fired out with stun shots, like Leia in A New Hope. This all leads Ahsoka down the pipe system. She and Anakin have one last discussion and Ahsoka is of course protesting her innocence and Anakin tries to get her to plead her case to Jedi Council. She of course refuses and pulls a leap of faith just when the clones show up. Anakin looks down and Another inappropriate credits roll. Well, fuck me. I was almost invested, but then you had to pull the heroic, loud credits music at the wrong time. Man, for the more tense or sad episodes, you probably should not play the same end credits theme as when the Republic wins a battle, guys. That might be one of the reasons I've always taken out of an episode at the end. I criticized this in season 4, I'm criticizing it now. Anyways, next episode. With Ahsoka missing and on the run, Anakin and Plo Koon are sent with a group of clones to find her. So what happens from here? Ahsoka, for some reason, goes out on the streets, instead of finding a deserted building to hide in. Why am I not surprised? Ahsoka decides to contact Barris of all people. Oh, so now we have enough pieces to figure out who was behind the Jedi Temple bombing. It's Barris. You blew that revelation wide open prematurely, Filoni. Thanks for the spoiler in advance. So yeah, this is around the time those old enough to see bad twists coming will figure out that Barris is behind the bombing. In the scheme of the whole thing, Barris was featured in the show again since season 2. And is contacted by Ahsoka specifically. Who else could it be? We cracked the case, ladies and gents. There's too many red herrings for it to not be Barris. The show has the worst plot twists in Star Wars ever. For the rest of the episode on the first watching, I was just waiting for the inevitable to be revealed. I'll talk about why it doesn't make sense when Barriss' motivations are revealed. Also, the tagline moral quote of this episode is, Never become desperate enough to trust the untrustworthy. Since Ahsoka is the desperate one, there's really only two characters in this episode that could be untrustworthy. I've already mentioned Barriss, so it's time to get into the second candidate. After Ahsoka sneaks around a bit and gets a cloak from a homeless guy, she finally has some clothing that will somewhat conceal herself, but instead of just going into a deserted building or somewhere the police won't look for a long while, she decides to board a tram. Yeah, I guess she couldn't be fucked walking. Just go into public transport. In the real world, there are security cameras near public stations. I don't know what Ahsoka was thinking. And guess who shows up to collect the bounty on Ahsoka? Why, it's Asajj Ventress. The show tries to make us think Ventress was behind the bombing, but given what happened in the last season, it's quite doubtful that it was actually her. Again, there's so many red herrings that lead back to Barris. You're not fooling me, show, and as it's revealed in the later scene, it ain't Ventress. Ahsoka tries to talk Ventress out of redeeming the bounty, and tries to offer her a pardon for her crimes if she helps. Yeah, because Ahsoka, even if she's acquitted, will totally get a Separatist war criminal 
pardoned. Well, actually, now that I think about it, Ulic Quadroma did far more damage than Ventress did, and Ulic ended up being unpunished. Mostly left depressed and guilt-stricken over his actions, so maybe there is a president for Ventress to be pardoned? Okay, I'll throw you a bone, Filoni. You're off the hook for this one. Just barely. So Ventress decides to help Ahsoka. Ventress takes her back to the Star Wars equivalent of a payphone station, and Ahsoka talks to Barris again. And again, any thought that Ventress could be the guilty one is gone once Barris is back in mind. Barris tells Ahsoka that she's found a clue in a factory where the nanodroids were made, blah blah. A sensor droid spots them, and then a group of clones come to arrest her. Despite being barely able to evade the clones last episode, she overpowers and kicks their asses. Let me remind you that Ahsoka isn't even an adult yet. I presume she's like probably 17 at oldest. I suppose I can buy that Ventress could overpower the clones, but Ahsoka? Nada. They both flee to the factory, and for some reason, Ventress doesn't come with her. And for some reason, around the corner, she's attacked by the perpetrator. I think they were just trying to keep it a secret. It's quite obvious who the perpetrator is. Anyways, Ventress is overpowered by Barris, and I'm calling bullshit on that. Barris, in the show's context, should be the same age as Ahsoka, and should not be able to take on Ventress. Well, somehow, she overpowers Ventress, takes her equipment and lightsabers, and proceeds to attack Ahsoka, knocking her out to the nanodroid explosives. Oh my god, they're seriously making Ahsoka accidentally to herself into making herself look like she was the one behind the bombing? Well actually, I like this. I hate Ahsoka. Let her die, let her die, let her shrivel up and die. In the season 5 finale, The Wrong Jedi, the council put up a trial for Ahsoka predictably, with all the circumstantial evidence against her. She is found guilty of sedition and treason, and revoked in her place in the Jedi Order. Quick question, she was off-world when the temple was bombed. Why is this not a factor? I mean, they never bring it up ever. The trial only goes on for like two minutes. Most improper trial in fiction ever. And given trials in fiction tend to be inaccurate, as Legal Eagle pointed out, that's saying something. But when this happened, I was like, Nag, nag, nag. Also, I know I was re-watching this, but I disliked and was fed up of Ahsoka so much that I thought there was some faint possibility that she would die. Alright, you might be telling me that the shitty trial practices are exactly the point and that the council judged her too soon, and my response is don't care. Ahsoka was considered a promising Jedi before then, correct? Why would this trial be this fucking short and based on a vote from the council? This is so dumb. So Anakin tries to get the bottom of this by questioning Ventress, while Ahsoka is put on military trial. Also, another thing, is Ahsoka's age even going to be a factor in the trial? Because she's still not an adult yet. Eh, probably not. We should probably just continue before I lose my sanity again. Ahsoka is put on trial immediately, and Tarkin is the prosecutor, while Padme is the defense. Anakin questions Ventress, and she reveals that Ahsoka also spoke to someone called Barris. And so Anakin lets her off, telling her that she's dead if she's lying. But he doesn't arrest her. I suppose he doesn't have time, so I'll give the episode a free pass for that. Anakin questions Barris, and ignites his lightsaber. And wow, Barris ignites Ventress's lightsabers. What a fucking horrible twist. I called it quite a while ago. Barris is subdued by the Jedi and captured. Right when the trial is about to be wrapped up with Ahsoka's guilty verdict, Anakin comes in and presents before everyone the true perpetrator, Barris Offee. Barris immediately confesses to the crime and does a speech about how the Jedi started the war and they suck and everyone in the room should be put on trial, blah 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 blah, don't care. She is taken away soon after, never to be seen again as of the recording of this video. Filoni apparently said he had plans for Barris, but that doesn't change the fact that he's retconned the expanded universe again. Barris was never said to have betrayed the Jedi Order because she died a member when Order 66 was carried out. So wait, why did Barris remain in the Jedi Order? I don't get it. Even the Wikipedia article says as much. Thank you for ruining everything again, Filoni. Fuck you. And another thing I have to ask is why did Barris do any of this? 
It's quite obvious that she's the perpetrator, but what's not obvious is why she framed Ahsoka, her friend, instead of someone else, or how she perpetrated this bombing. Barris is not in character, even by TCW standards. It's quite obvious that Barris was chosen because it would be the hardest thing for Ahsoka to hear while she was being proven innocent. Thing is though, it doesn't make any fucking sense. It's not explained why she betrayed Ahsoka specifically. You could have picked any other Jedi. Being a mastermind and all, why couldn't you just frame someone you didn't like? Also, the way she conducted herself was beyond reasonable. She didn't even try to protest peacefully, as we've been shown. She just zips right onto being the irredeemable Darksider right off the bat. There were no hints earlier in the series that she'd fallen because she was barely in it. Also another thing I don't understand, if you wanted to send a message, why would you do this specifically in the way you did it? It would only be perceived as a T-word attack. So great plan Barris, you betrayed your friend, failed to get your message across, and got caught in the end. Now that I think about it, this is the galaxy's worst mastermind. The villain's motives suck, you get an F-. With that inexcusable case of retconning and poor motivation aside, Ahsoka is offered a place back into the Jedi Order on top of a promotion. But Ahsoka decides she ain't coming back. Instead, she's leaving the Jedi Order altogether. Despite Anakin's attempts to convince her to stay, she is adamant on leaving. And so, she walks out of the temple, and that's the end of the episode. And hey, they actually put sad music at the end of the episode instead of the loud and proud end credits scene this time. That's the episode The Wrong Jedi and the end of season 5. Quick question, what happened to Asajj Ventress? Was she pardoned like Ahsoka said she would? I think that's a thread you forgot about guys. In fact, we never see Ventress in the show again. If you want to learn what happens to her, you gotta read Dark Disciple. Which from what I heard also features Quinlan Vos, and the author tried to backtrack on his personality from goofy to serious again, and they shipped the two. Gross. Also, another question I had is how Barriss' master, Luminara Unduly, saw Barriss' betrayal. We don't really get an answer in a later episode. That's a very interesting question that they leave us hanging. And then what they did to Luminara in Rebels doesn't help, but that's a discussion for another time. Okay, now the conclusion. This season was terrible. I think it might have been a minor improvement upon season 4, but that's about it. The show seemed to just get worse and worse, retconning more lore, introducing overrated story arcs, and maybe getting better with the animation, but the storytelling remained underwhelming. What did I see in this show? The only arc that holds up is the one where Obi-Wan poses as Reiko Hardin. Other than that, most of the show is crap. I am fully relentless towards the show, it has aged terribly. And this is where I wanted to talk about Dave Filoni in detail again. You see, Ahsoka's questionable fate at the end of Season 5 was completely the opposite of what George wanted. As revealed in behind the scenes featurettes, George wanted to kill Ahsoka off. But Filoni, who wanted Ahsoka to survive, snuck how he put the episode together behind George because he knew George would have him change Ahsoka's fate back to death. Filoni, who has touted himself up as George's Padawan, snuck behind his back and lied to him. What a fucking snake. Ahsoka had long outlived her welcome, and it would make no sense for her to live to Revenge of the Sith. Before this episode, I was wondering why Ahsoka wasn't in that film, and after thinking about it, her dying is the only thing that makes sense. If she left the Jedi Order, but continued to be on Anakin's mind, his turn to the dark side makes less sense. Especially in Season 7. Oh boy, we'll get to that. Don't worry guys, Ahsoka's existence plays too many factors in the films. She should have died. People seeing this as one of Anakin's additional disillusionments with the Jedi? is irrelevant, because this was not a plot point in the films. This does not expand to Anakin's turn to the dark side, because Ahsoka never even existed until 2008. Filoni really wanted to keep Ahsoka alive, but in doing so, he made the films worse. Perhaps hindsight did not exist then, but it does now, and thinking about it, Filoni was in the wrong. Ahsoka should have died to maintain integrity with the films. Filoni already retconned the Expanded Universe. He did not need to retcon the films. Well that's TCW Season 5 for you. Overrated, underwhelming crap. Believe me, Knights of the Old Republic, 
Darth Bane, the original six movies, and many other shit are way better than The Clone Wars. The Clone Wars is only perceived as great because of a lack of experience with other Star Wars content. That's still the case now. I liked TCW at a time where I was not versed with Star Wars as I am now. Now that I'm widening my range, I see TCW as a continuity nightmare. In the general scope of Star Wars content, I'd say it's pretty mediocre at best. Only praise as much as it was because it was more mainstream than Star Wars Republic, for example. Airing on Cartoon Network where millions of kids would see this, and maybe perhaps as their first Star Wars outings at that, was a trap many fell into. The Clone Wars is not top tier Star Wars content. That's a perception made from super mainstream and super casual experiences with Star Wars. The final score I will give The Clone Wars Season 5 is a 4.1 out of 10. Only a minor improvement over Season 4. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Here we are at perhaps the last season that can be considered in the Lucas era. Since Dave Filoni made it, he's still responsible for the genocide of continuity in the expanded universe and the films alike. The scale of his crimes against Star Wars continuity are large scale and unspeakable. Season 6, also known as The Lost Missions, was the final piece of the Filoni-verse, although it is simultaneously one of the first parts of Disney's canon, before even Star Wars Rebels. The show itself was canned by Disney, a decision that many people hated, and then people suddenly forgot once Disney made Season 7 to conclude the series. To be honest, it feels like the bare minimum once they finally did the show. All the unfinished episodes in terms of improperly rendered arcs were released in their unfinished state. People are eager for me to get into Rebels, so perhaps the unfinished episodes will be a discussion for another time. I'll probably call them the unfinished episodes if I get around to reviewing them. Or perhaps I'll write the script for them the same time I'm doing Rebels. I'm thinking ahead though. Season 6 was around 13 episodes long. I presume that's the amount of episodes they could finish before they had to can the whole show. So let's see if the series went out on a high note. Probably not. I looked at the episode order, and look here! We're starting off with the worst one based on memory. This is the arc that concerns Order 66. Yeah, we're talking about that arc. So like any other episode of The Clone Wars, we're dropped into a battle in the middle of the war with minimal context. I still have no idea where the war is going or who's winning. There's a space station that orbits the entire planet in a ring of sorts. Anakin and these two sisters, one red for fruit and one green for vegetables, <laughs> are commanding the 501st Legion. It seems like it's just going to be like any other battle. And it's also revealed that Admiral Trench, the Tarantula Separatist, survived. I don't know why they brought him back. Trench in this show is commonly seen as a more competent commander than Grievous and probably would have made a good supporting villain given Grievous was reduced to a joke. Since the Separatists lose in every episode, I was interested in why they brought Trench back. Are they finally going to have the Separatists win a battle at last? Well, not really. During the Republic strategy meeting, we see a clone who is not so subtly coloured after Doctor Doom from Marvel Comics. The most random thing in the world to reference at that. The clone, in fact, is nicknamed Doom, so it's pretty overt. But he's just a shitty character that's probably there to sell toys. I have seen a few listings for Commander Doom, or whatever his name is on eBay, so I'm guessing they intended to sell this particular character for toys. I don't have any complaints with that, but ripping off Marvel was not the way to do it. But Commander Doom isn't the one of focus here. In actuality, the two clones of focus is Fives and Tup. Tup appeared in previous episodes, but was mostly a minor character appearing in group activities with other clones. I remember him doing minuscule stuff in the Umbara arc in particular. Since he's not a clone that pretty much anyone would care about, he's selected as a plot device. The cheapest, most poorly set up, most contradictory plot device ever conceived. Tup is having a headache, and stares menacingly at the vegetable Jedi briefly. Five snaps him out of it, and tells him to focus on the clankers and whatnot. When I was re-watching this, I could read it like a fucking book. This is gonna be about Order 66 happening prematurely, isn't it? Well, yeah. 
It's not really elaborated on why Tup had a headache exactly, as I'm sure there was a lot of times clones hit their heads hard enough to trigger something in their brains. What the source of the headache was wasn't explored until later episodes, but even then, it became confusing. I'll talk about it when we get to the dreaded reveal. Anyways, like any other battle, Anakin charges into battle with his clones, along with the two healthy eating Jedi. Tup, during the middle of all this, goes into a trance. He sees the vegetable Jedi, and since Tup is a fussy little fucker, he aims his gun and shoots her. And it's gone. This is followed by Fives tackling Tup and restraining him. Since one of the Jedi commanders is gone, they're forced to retreat as they've lost their momentum. Them. I don't have any complaints about that specifically. You wouldn't expect a clone to fire on one of the commanders. Point is though, Admiral Trench witnesses all of this and finds it fascinating. His first action is to contact Dooku, which makes sense. A potential weakness in the clone army should be factored into Separatist tactics. He tells Dooku everything he saw, adding in that the clone seemed entranced, so it wasn't like a rare case of a traitor in their midst. Anyways, after securing a safe zone during the retreat, Anakin and the fruit Jedi are confused. Why would Tup do this? In a brief interrogation with Tup, he seems to be in a trance or something, chanting good soldiers follow orders. Again, I hate this, as it breaks continuity, but again, when it's revealed, I wanted to have that extensive discussion. I just want to point out that so far, that none of the clones acted like this when Order 66 was actually initiated, so it's inconsistent behaviour to say the least. Well anyways Dooku contacts Sidious, in which Sidious of course, orders Dooku to retrieve the clone. I have to ask why not just kill the clone, it would certainly prevent the Jedi from finding out the truth. Top me while it doesn't seem to remember what happened. And everyone assumes that maybe the enemy has something that made him do this, like a virus or a toxin. I'd just like to say that the Jedi keep assuming the wrong thing, and this is inconsistent with the films and the expanded universe. Well, anyways, while Tup is about to be transported to Kamino, a Separatist ambush kicks in, and they drill into the ship and capture Tup. And again, I have to ask, why not just kill him? There wouldn't be enough evidence for the real cause anyways, right? But then you realize that they've got to stretch this plot out. And the way they do it is ridiculous. Anakin and the troops investigate after the attack. They try to get Tup back, and so what do they do? They manage to avoid detection somehow, and use a grappling gun to attach themselves to the ship as it takes off. And here, I'm calling bullshit. The suspension of disbelief is pushed too far. How were they even able to find him in an artificial ring around a planet? That's a lot of ground to cover, isn't it? Well, ignoring that, they easily get Tup back, and it's here where it would have been nice for the Separatists to have a fleet guarding Tup, wouldn't it? Why did they only use one shuttle? It's said that Tup is dying, and Fives wishes to stay by his side, and so he's being re-escorted to Kamino, and that's episode one. Man, this video is going to be long, isn't it? Maybe not as long as the other reviews, but still. The next episode is titled Conspiracy. The episode starts with the Kaminoans about to run tests on top, and it's proposed that since it might be a Separatist virus, Fives must remain in quarantine. Okay? Why not all the other clones that were around Top? There were more than a dozen around him, and Rex in particular is called back to the front lines. Wouldn't it make more sense to have all the clones around Top be quarantined? Why is it just Fives? Oh wait, it's so only Fives could discover the truth. My apologies. Well, right off the bat, this story doesn't make any fucking sense. The way it's set up, it's all just for an explanation to a non-existent plot hole. But oh boy, we'll get to that. So anyway, Shark T is a prominent part of this episode. And as a Jedi character, she doesn't do anything of value. It's been said by others that she was incompetent just because of this arc, and I agree. She stands there with a blank expression and does no deeper digging essentially. Now this kind of stuff is hard to talk about because we know what the characters don't but it still feels like Shark T could be doing more. This kind of makes me wish this arc was never made. The war is meant to serve as a distraction for the Jedi, correct? Why can't this episode arc slot be reserved for something else? Something closer to the expanded universe would be nice. 
The Kalanoans basically opt to terminate the clone, and they even go as far to contact Lord Tyrannus. Now, I'm not going to question the Kaminoans being in on the conspiracy directly. They'd have to be. They made the clones. And it's here where they reference the dreaded inhibitor chips. Fuck these little brain MacGuffins. It's revealed throughout the course of this episode that a brain chip activated Order 66 prematurely in top because of a tumor. Sorry, I had to say it like that. But anyways, the inhibitor chips are completely unlike the one in Spider-Man 2. Remember when Doc Ock lost his inhibitor chip and it only took Peter's reasoning and Doc Ock's incredible willpower that he was able to gain control of his mind and body again? I believe the Kane and the Lost Padawan comics had something akin to that, which was made irrelevant once the sad batch happened. But anyways, I really hate the inhibitor chips. Let's talk about Order 66 in relation to the films only. People who have no idea what a real plot hole is, and probably just looking for something to complain about, whinge all the time about why the clones turned on their Jedi generals on a whim. People just assume that the clones just love the shit out of the Jedi who commanded them which there's no evidence in the films for. There's a reason why the clones are mostly just a casual acquaintance at best to the Jedi, among other details in the prequel trilogy. Let me clear up this supposed plot hole. Here's a line that so many people sleep on from Attack of the Clones. They are totally obedient, taking any order without question. We modified their genetic structure to make them less independent than the original host. There. Non-existent plot hole destroyed. Not satisfied by the explanation? Well, you should be, and that's enough from the films. Read the books if you wish to learn more about specific logistics on this topic. I hear a great place to start is the Republic Commando novels. I swear, most prequel criticisms come from an inability to pay attention to the movies. Also, the way people whinge about this bullshit is that it always sounds like they wanted an hour-long exposition dump explaining the specific logistics on a certain thing when that's not realistic for any movie. But at the same time, they whinge about exposition dumps, so it's impossible to tell what people actually dislike about the movies. I'm just saying that prequel hate has a lot of contradictory criticisms, but I also wanted to talk about this some more. People blissfully unaware of history also seem to be unaware that stuff like Order 66 has happened in real life, with similar setups and outcomes. The Lore Master actually has an interesting video discussing this. Also, I think it's clear from one line from Revenge of the Sith that basically confirms that the clones were expecting Order 66 at some point, and also that they were in on it from the start. The time has come. Execute Order 66. Yes, my lord. We'll be done, my lord. We'll be done, my lord. So yeah, the clones from a film-only perspective were just waiting for Order 66, hence why they obeyed it instantly. It's small lines and details that really destroy stupid complaints, doesn't it? This is why George put way more thought into the prequel trilogy than even general prequel fans give him credit for. I hate that people fucking sleep on these details. The expanded universe also expands on this. Given the name Order 66, there were 150 contingency orders that the clones had to memorize. One of which was actually Order 65, which called for the Chancellor to be removed from power. Even in the episode, they refer to it as Clone Contingency 66, meaning that it's the 66 Contingency Order out of an unknown amount in Filoni canon. Why is it Order 66 that was the specific Contingency Order that was activated? I don't get it. That's a massive and ridiculous coincidence, and it's not like it's the Force wills, it's just bad writing. Also, didn't the Jedi know about Order 66 in a context where they knew about all the other contingency orders, including Order 65? Also, also, the inhibitor chips are something that definitely would have been in the films if that is what George had in mind for the clones. Nothing about these chips makes sense. So why the fuck did Filoni include them? Well, actually, I have a probable answer to that. Season 6 was made in the age of peak prequel hate, where the ignorant, unattentive criticism about why the clones turned on their Jedi generals were made. And Filoni 
wanting to look like a hero, crammed the inhibitor chips where they absolutely did not belong to get praise for explaining a supposed plot hole. It's extremely sleazy. If he wanted to really do the right thing, he would have clarified details in the films. Just give the same explanations the film gave, and then some. Do it in a way where you're clarifying the films, not overriding them. But nah, Filoni wanted to look like a hero, so he feeds into the false criticism. Some prequel fan. Also, this is a writing decision that is perfectly engineered for Filoni's agenda. You see, if it's possible through the inhibited chips for clones to disobey Order 66, then that means he can write any clone from the show, particularly his favourites, to avoid obeying Order 66 through having their inhibited chips removed. Well, congratulations, Filoni. You found a loophole in your own writing, and in the process, you missed the fucking point of Order 66. Unless you're a specialty clone like an ARC Trooper or a Commando, every clone obeyed Order 66. But I also want to point out how even then, a lot of ARC Troopers and Commandos, because of brainwashing, did so anyways. Commander Bakara of the Galactic Marines, under Kiandi Mundi, just could not wait to execute Order 66. He hated Kiandi Mundi, and always wanted to shoot him in the back. Order 66 translates to much more than just kill the Jedi. It's also a short way of Palpatine saying that Jedi tried to overthrow the Republic, they've committed high treason, and must be eliminated. So yeah, the Clone Wars series explains nothing. It just creates plot holes with the films. Inhibitor chips would have been in the films if that was the case. Filoni introducing the inhibitor chips could only come from subscribing to this utterly stupid criticism. Is Filoni really a prequel fan, or is he just trying to bend that shit to his will. I mean, he's convinced numerous people that he created Star Wars instead of George Lucas. Anyways, there's other stuff in episode 2 that makes zero sense. For example, Fives while he's being quarantined is coincidentally put in a room right next to Tups and he's able to convince a droid, AZ-3, to disobey its programming and help him break into Tups' room to figure out what's going on with him. Man, are things just made way too easy for the good guys in the show. How many times have I said that, I wonder? Fives uses the loophole that not helping him will result in Tup's death, and since the droid's purpose is to save lives, it would be against his functions. Okay? I also want to mention that Fives also gets the droid to disobey orders again without a loophole given. So it's clear they wanted a droid to help Fives, but at the same time have him break his programming twice. What bullshit is this? The second time the droid breaks its basic programming, it sets off a false alarm to Shark T and the Kaminoans to buy Fives time to extract the tumor from Tup, which in turn is the inhibitor chip. Unfortunately, Shark T realizes the ruse on Rush is back, and Five says that he's got the answer to the solution to why Tup was in a trance. But in the process, Tup slowly passes away shortly after his inhibited chip extraction. And it's gone. Palpatine and the Kaminoans convince Shark T to bring the tumor to the Grand Republic medical facility instead of the Jedi Temple. Seems here like Shark T is too trusting, hence her incompetence. There's clearly more going on. Well, in the next episode, Shakti does intend to analyze it at the Jedi Temple, then hand it over to the Chancellor. So Fives is escorted back out to the front lines. Secretly, the Kaminoans plan to erase his memory and put him on sanitation for the rest of the war. And you want to know how Fives finds out what's really going to happen to him? He stumbles into AZ-3, who informs him that he is awaiting a similar fate in droid standards. That's where Fives finds out what the Kaminoans plan to do with him. Wow. So if Fives hadn't bumped into AZ-3, the arc just would have been over? A strange coincidence. The thing that solidifies this as poor writing is the fact that AZ-3 tells Fives this. Why would he know about the incoming fate of Fives? He's going to deal with his own memory wipe. Seriously, I am not trying to find as many problems with this show as possible. It's just while watching this that I constantly kept on going, wait, what? So yeah, Fives overpowers the Kaminoans and the Clone Guards, and as well as this, he goes back and takes the case. As it turned out, the Kaminoans switched cases with the tumor. Then, Fives easily makes his way to a hangar. 
The reason this is a problem is wouldn't Camino be on alert for a clone of his description with a specific haircut and outfit? Again, things are just made way too easy for the good guys. Also, there's no reason for AZ-3 to disobey its programming for the third damn time. I don't care if it didn't want to be mind wiped. It was a droid programmed with compliance. Why is it when you stop to think about how the Clone Wars is written, does it make no sense? Also, another clone sees Fives and doesn't recognize him as the clone gone rogue. That's why Fives is easily able to knock him out and dump his body nearby. Well, eventually, Shark T and the Kamino guards show up, and Fives and AZ-3 escape on a small ball-shaped ship, which looks like it belongs in Star Trek than anything Star Warsian. It's like the flying saucers Hondo and the pirates had. Anyways, while escaping, Fives puts the ship on autopilot, and he and AZ-3 jump off, intending to swim back while the Kamino and guard chase the empty ship. AZ-3 has a vehicle function that allows him a smaller droid to be ridden. Ugh, this makes no sense. That's a convenience level of 3720 to 1. So after making it back to Kamino and making it to the higher levels without being detected, which they kind of just skip over, AZ-3 tricks another clone guard to come with him. So you're telling me that there are no reports of AZ-3 helping the rogue clone either. This just makes it extremely convenient for Fives to ambush him and knock him out, and taking his armor. Also, wouldn't this go against AZ-3's programming too, to lead a clone into harm's way? Well, anyways, they go to the Genetic Records Hall and access the Jango Fett template, where they discover that the tumor was not organic. Someone put it there. Then, of course, their activity is somehow discovered by Shark T and the Kaminoans because they're told that someone accessed the files on Django Fett. Uh, okay. Wouldn't that happen every day? I don't get it. Well, anyways, despite this making no sense, they put two and two together and determine that Fives and AZ-3 are there. So Shark T and the clones barge in, and I love how Shark T just stands there and doesn't use the force or anything while Fives is avoiding stun shots. So believable, isn't it? Another reason why Shark T is such a garbage Jedi in this arc. Like, come on, you could at least try to contribute to the team effort to capture Fives. Well, Fives and AZ-3 go through a hatch and seal it behind them so it cannot be opened. They eventually talk about removing Fives' chip if he has one, and so they go through an empty hallway, which is super convenient. Again, things are just made way too easy for the good guys, aren't they? Anyways... AZ-3 dissects Five's brain and finds an identical chip after a few minutes. So what happens next? Fives decides he wants to know if other clones have this chip. So they are going to the growing tanks to see if the clones still being grown have the chip. And well, they find it in all the clones being grown in around stage 3. For some reason, one of the Kaminoans confronts Fives alone, and this results in her becoming a hostage when Shark T and the Kamino guards show up. Well, anyways, they show the evidence, but after being told by the Kaminoan that Sifo Dyas, a Jedi, put this in, Shark T listens and decides to bring him straight to the Chancellor to tell his story. The show wants to go, uh-oh, but the thing is, I'm just annoyed at this show for how little sense it made. Shark T is, of course, incompetent. Shark T has been fucking useless. The Kaminoans' constant protest must mean something is up, but Shark T just never suspects the Kaminoans who are very clearly hiding something. It doesn't take Grand Admiral Thrawn to figure this out. Now, I'm still trying to keep in mind that the Jedi don't know the whole story, but come on. This is a massive red fucking flag. I think it would have been preferable if something else be done with a Clone Wars story instead of this. But at the same time, Filoni could have easily come up with something more retconny than inhibited chips. In fact, maybe I should do a list of the top 10 retcons in this show. Because I hate this a lot. Fuck the Clone Wars series. Anyways, let's talk about the fourth and final episode in this dreaded inhibited chips arc. So anyways, this episode starts with a tied up fives being injected by the Kaminoan when no one's watching. Wow. Zero supervision on the clone with the suspicious Kaminoan. Could it be any more convenient? Come on! Well, anyways, Palpatine meets with Fives and Shark T and the Kaminoan. Anyways, out loud, 
Five says that he's been drugged before he magically loses memory of being drugged, and then he meets the Chancellor firsthand. The Kaminoan says that it's to make the clones less aggressive, blah blah blah, but what really instigates this plot is Palpatine requesting an audience alone with Fives. Since we know that Palps is the Sith Lord who is behind this, he tells Fives everything off screen, and when Shark T comes in, hearing commotion, they see Fives grabbing a gun to execute the Chancellor. Shark T, unlike the last episode, narrowly saves Palps and pushes Fives away, and Fives runs away. Palps basically did this to ensure the illusion that Fives was crazy, and that's what the inhibited chips do, they keep you sane. And well, Fives escapes. This is where the Jedi independently decided to find the clone in question. Anakin says that he'll bring Captain Rex with them. Meanwhile, Fives basically walks around Coruscant in his armor undetected, in which he takes a cab to a clone bar, intending to essentially blend in amongst other clones. Okay, that's the first thing I'll actually give the episode credit for. That's good thinking. Hiding amongst other clones, especially drunk clones, will make him be able to hide for a while. Yeah. So that's the first main story thing that makes sense. In episode 4 of 4 of this arc, we're like 40% through the episode. I looked at the time on screen. Essentially, he goes to Kix, I believe, and tells him to set up a secret meeting with Rex and General Skywalker. So Fives meets Anakin and Rex at the hidden off location, while the probe droid is tracking Fives on behalf of the Chancellor. For some reason, Fives just doesn't get to the fucking point, and just goes on and on, and he doesn't just tell them. Yeah, I know he's drugged, but it can't be that fucking hard to get to the point, right? I was incredibly annoyed at the show for just going on and on. Just get to the fucking point! This is so frustrating to watch, and maybe that's the point, but this is the kind of frustrated where I'm just scoffing at the screen. Fuck this. Well anyways, Commander Fox comes in and shoots Fives when he tries to resist. And it's gone. Yeah, that thing wasn't on stun. Point is though, Rex leans down by Fives' side as he dies and they try to make a big deal out of it. And to be honest, it kind of got a hint of emotion out of me because the music is pretty good actually. So that's something, but my god is mostly everything leading up to this fucking stupid. Well anyways, Palpatine feeds the Jedi more bullshit and Count Dooku and Sidious cackle about how their plan that almost got exposed, being covered up, and then another inappropriate credits roll. Fuck off. Well, at least the dreaded inhibitor chips arc is behind us. Although Filoni reinforced this in shows like The Sad Batch. The second arc is more of a continuation of a certain other arc from season 2. Padme is sent to Scipio, which is apparently the headquarters of the intergalactic banking clan. Uh, no. Moonalist is the headquarters, you fucking morons. The Moons are from Moonalist, and they're the main players behind the intergalactic banking clan. Well, here Filoni's just making up a planet because he was too lazy to read Wikipedia. It's ridiculous to see how much Filoni got away with. Anyways, Padme goes to meet the five heads of the banking clan, who I guarantee are characters the show made up, to discuss a loan to the Republic as Padme wishes to spend money on domestic issues. We see that the recurring bounty hunter Embo with the shield hat is observing her, presumably to assassinate her. Once inside, they go to a neutral zone, in which we see that the Moon's representative is Rush Clovis. He meets Padme, but Padme refuses to negotiate with him, calling him a separatist traitor and storms out. At night, as Padme and her assistant, I presume, are doing shit, Rush Clovis climbs over the balcony into Padme's room. So yeah, Padme's assistant spots Clovis and Padme instantly pulls a gun on him. Clovis says that the banking clan's gone broke, and when asked for evidence, Clovis says that there are records in the main vault, but only the core five moons have access to it. Padme reluctantly decides to trust Clovis for some reason. 
which I'm calling bullshit. The episode mostly consists on an elaborate plan to sneak into the vault and find evidence, and other stuff that doesn't interest me at all. I dislike this episode heavily for that. The only coherent stuff that's easy to follow is the tension between Clovis and Padme. There's this one part where during the vault raid, in which the moons grant Padme temporary access, Padme's assistant easily cuts off the power, so that Padme can scan records. Quick question. If you can cut off the power, then why can Padme scan something that runs on power? A major oversight in the writing, I presume. As well as this, later that night, Padme is arrested for espionage, but who should show up but Anakin Skywalker? Well, coming to pick up Padme as her release is secured, he very quickly learns about Clovis, and the same range of jealousy falls upon him. They go to Clovis' place, and this is where Embo comes in again. He snipes the three of them, and they get away in the speeder that is quickly shot down. And to be fair, we get a pretty cool set piece where they slide down a mountain as Embo chases him with his helmet, almost as if it's a snowboard. It's pretty cool if I'm being honest, but it leads to them escaping, and we see that Darth Sidious hired the bounty hunter. So yeah, a crappy episode, but the action scene kind of redeemed it a bit. Also, before we go any further, Clovis' voice isn't as shady sounding as it was in Season 2. That's a definite improvement. Now, it's unclear whether or not Clovis is to be trusted. With that being said, let's move on to Episode 6, The Rise of Clovis. Basically, Clovis takes his request to Chancellor Palpatine. Bail Organa doesn't trust him much, but Clovis assures that he only has the integrity of the banks in mind. Again, this stuff didn't personally interest me, but this all eventually leads to several discussions Padme and Anakin have about Clovis. Padme tells him to trust her, but jealous Anakin can't help himself. Padme and Clovis spend some time alone, while Padme's wearing a revealing outfit. And unlike Attack of the Clones where Padme is wearing it in a context of sexual tension, Padme is doing this where she's already married, and Clovis pretty much figures out that she and Anakin are together, with the same lie that they're just friends. So, Clovis tries to force himself onto Padme to make a point that if they are merely friends, that they should, and... Oh, oh thank god. Anakin shows up, and proceeds to beat the shit out of Clovis for trying to smooch his wife. I'll actually give the show points for suggestive content. Don't know how this would have passed through Cartoon Network if the Disney acquisition didn't happen, but hey, worse has happened, like Bo-Katan spaking Ahsoka's ass. So anyways, when Captain Typho comes in, Clovis and Anakin just lie that they were attacked by an external threat before they flew off and whatnot. Basically the point of all of this is to have Padme and Anakin separate potentially. Padme says that they are living a lie and they shouldn't see each other for a while. This scene I actually think is pretty good. Only problem is, there was hardly any build-up. I don't remember in any other arc besides when Rush Clovis was around, having Anakin and Padme struggle in their relationship, whether it be keeping it secret or getting along without problems. So yeah, good scene without context, but with context, it ain't very effective. Anyways, Count Dooku contacts Clovis and convinces him to do corrupt shit. I know I should probably describe what it was, but we'll be here forever. So let's just wrap this arc up. Despite Clovis' treachery, he is majorly nominated to become the head of the intergalactic banking clan. So basically in Season 6, Episode 7, Clovis and Padme travel to Scipio to see through Clovis as head of the banking clan. Along with the head of the CIS Senate, they both approve Clovis' ascension to power. Since Dooku assisted Clovis' rise to power, he demands that he alleviate all debt to the Separatists and charge no interest on them while the Republic gets unfair treatment. Clovis of course initially refuses, until Dooku reminds him that if he wants to keep his position, he's going to have to play dirty under Dooku. So Clovis does what he's told and obeys Dooku, and the Republic is pissed. All of this results in a Republic invasion of Scipio. Now apparently Sidious wanted this to happen, so the Republic would take over the banks, and it's all a part of the Sith Grand Plan. Makes sense I suppose, but I still have no idea where we are in the war. Who the hell is winning? I don't know, 
and I suppose I won't know until Revenge of the Sith. Man, do I really wish I knew the state of the war? Because it feels like it's the most paper-thin fictional war I've ever seen. I couldn't tell you the history of the war. The Republic just wins all the time, hence the formula of all of it. This all eventually leads to Anakin showing up, and to make a long story short, Anakin comes to have both Padme and Clovis in his grip, but he can't hold on to both of them. That's where Clovis makes Anakin drop him, and he falls to his death. And it's gone. And then Anakin and Padme instantly reconcile just in time for Revenge of the Sith. With that being said, the show makes a point that history will remember Clovis as a deceptive villain, even though he probably did nothing wrong in that regard. I don't know about you, but this seems really simple. They make the message pretty overt, and aside from that, that's the end of Rush Clovis. He was a small retcon, as Padme clearly said that the last person she had a crush on was a boy named Polo before she and Anakin started to fall in love. Not to mention that this arc has them resolve their marriage issues in an instant, just in time for them to bang so Padme can be pregnant in Revenge of the Sith. Fuck me. Well that's the end of the arc, and hey, we're roughly halfway through the season. I guess thank god that season 6 and 7 are shorter than the rest of the series, just 13 episodes in this season. Well anyways, the next arc is a two-parter, in which it pairs two unlikely characters together as a duo, Mace Windu and Jar Jar Binks. It starts with one Queen Julia, a near Gungan alien requesting assistance from the Senate, but only from one of them, a very specific character, Representative Jar Jar Binks. The Queen of the Planet Bardotta has several Dago Yin masters that have gone missing. Palps contacts the Jedi Council about this, and after discussing that the Bardottans don't like the Jedi, they still decide that someone with skill needs to accompany Jar Jar. As I've discussed about the premise, the bad motherfucker accompanies Jar Jar on this mission. Watching this episode, I was wondering how Mace Windu and Jar Jar's chemistry exclusive to this two-parter would hold up. To describe how I felt about their dynamic, I'd say it's decent. Mace Windu and Jar Jar are totally different, and they at best might have seen each other once or twice in the movies. So anyways, Mace Windu and Jar Jar's relationship, to put it bluntly, doesn't start off the best. It seems that Mace Windu is mildly annoyed by Jar Jar's antics and how he's constantly screwing something up. When they land at Bar Dota, Mace has to hand over his lightsaber, and it's quickly established that Jar Jar actually managed to find a girlfriend in the form of Queen Julia. <laughs> Alright, I gotta hand it to the show. You did our boy some extra respect. Completely unlike Chuck Wendig in the Aftermath trilogy. I also happened to learn that it was the late J.W. Rinsler who wrote this two-parter episode, and that was his only contribution to the show. To see that our mad lad is getting respect handed to him in the age of peak prequel hate is just glorious. Really makes you question how high prequel hate is really. Like Jar Jar's presence is fairly mitigated in the Clone Wars and I can imagine that is because of prequel hate, but this here may manage to be his best appearance in this show. I always wanted to see Jar Jar accomplish things and increase his intelligence level and learn things. Give the comic relief kid appeal character an arc or something, and here it is. Well actually it's only a taste, but it tastes like creamy chocolate ice cream. It's a good taste in other words. Yeah, so this Jar Jar and Mace Windu team up is ironically the best arc in season 2. It's a pretty low bar, since the Rush Clovis continuation thing is essentially number 2 on my ranking. I wouldn't say it's as good as the Reiko Hardeen arc, but still, this arc is pretty cool. I mean, this arc doesn't progress the war at all, but neither do any of the other episodes, even those directly related to certain battles like Umbara. So the plot surrounds a prophecy that's coming into effect. First the Dago Yin masters disappear, and soon afterwards, the queen magically vanishes. So Mace Windu and Jar Jar gotta save her. They're told that there's an abandoned temple down below, and that's where they gotta rescue the queen. This all results in what I think is a reference to Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. A cult intends to suck the life force out of the queen and the Dago Yin masters. Jar Jar 2 gets captured, though from no fault of his own, as he magically gets teleported. I will criticize that I'm pretty sure you can't do that, 
but at least it wasn't overtly universe-breaking. Jar Jar disappearing was enough for him to reappear in a cage. There's a pretty cool action sequence with Mace Windu beating the shit out of all the cultists. At the end, I'm sure that enough was enough. He's had it with these motherfucking cultists in that motherfucking temple. This eventually leads to all but one cultist getting away with a queen in captivity to another world. The end scene is Jar Jar swearing on behalf of the Bardozan Council that he will find his bitch with his trusty sidekick, the Jedi Mace Windu. So yeah, this is an episode that tries to have fun and succeeds mostly at doing so. It doesn't progress the war, it probably counts as filler, but it's an interesting experiment making Jar Jar Binks and Mace Windu the main characters. Made me consider if we should have any more of that stuff that combines two or more unlikely characters. We learn that the cultists, once they land on a random planet, intend to suck the living force out of Queen Julia in order for the cult leader to restore themselves to the living force. I think this stuff kind of broads on questionable lore-wise, but I'm going to stop since I don't know enough. Point is though, the Queen is in trouble. Mace and Jar Jar chase after the cultists, and the episode decently shows the teamwork between Mace Windu and Jar Jar Binks. Jar Jar, like always, is very clumsy and keeps attracting the cultists, but still, he is trying his hardest. The cultists get away in a tram, and Mace and Jar Jar pursue them in rideable animals. They travel across the desert and find the queen about to have the living force sacrificed out of her. Then we see who is behind the cult. It's Mother Talzin. <laughs> With that being said, the climax is pretty cool, and Mother Talzin is defeated. I don't have much to say about part 2, it's mostly what I described. Mace Windu and Jar Jar working together as an unlikely duo. It's simple, it doesn't add anything to the show again, but despite all that, it's pretty decent. Thank you J.W. Rinsler for writing an arc that didn't suck, because I disliked much of the show. Now I believe it's time to talk about the big one. Yes, of course, we're talking about the closing arc of season 6. If you remember the show, you'll remember that a lot of things happened in it. And well, let's get to it. So the next episode is called The Lost One. The setup for this episode is pretty much as iffy as the inhibited chip one. It starts right off the bat by explaining that randomly during the war, a distress signal is received by the Jedi Council at random, which is convenient, and also conveniently, the distress signal belongs to the ship of... Sifo Dyas. Despite fighting a war, Plo Koon and his entire clone battalion are sent to investigate. I don't know about you, but wouldn't the Council send like two Jedi at most to investigate, not a Jedi and a whole clone legion? I'm just saying, you guys gotta fight a war. Although given the Separatists lost every battle in the show, I guess you could spare a legion to do a task only a handful of Jedi would do. Anyways, they find the ship and decide to transport everything back to Coruscant. Plo Koon presents the Council with Dyas' lost lightsaber, which was never found. Is it just me? Well, do I feel like they're retconning a lot of lore around Sifo Dyas? I read the Wikipedia article and, yep, got pretty messy. I hate when the show goes too much into the Sith Grand Plan. I think it misses the point that the war is supposed to be a distraction for the Jedi. General Grievous, who was intended to be a blatant threat, doesn't even appear in this season. Instead, it's Admiral Trench. You gotta give competent moments to other Separatist commanders show? Anyways, after going over records, they find out that Sifo Dyas died on a mission to negotiate with natives on Volusia, but details about the end of the mission are locked out by the Chancellor's office. So Yoda goes to talk with Palps, who tells him that he had nothing to do with that, and that his predecessor, Chancellor Valorum, dealt with that. And this is where the trail goes cold, since canonically Valorum is dead. He was killed in an attack earlier in the war from what was presumed to be CIS T-words, and who am I kidding, of course they retcon that. So while Anakin and Obi-Wan are sent to Felucia to talk to the natives, Yoda speaks to Valorum, who again is supposed to be dead, but isn't because Filoni just does whatever the fuck he wants. They skip over a scene of Anakin and Obi-Wan talking to the natives, and they cut straight to them telling Yoda that the natives said that they cremated Sifo Dyas, which of course isn't law accurate, but on top of that, 
there was another Jedi accompanying him. Valorum says that there was no second Jedi. He actually sent his personal aide, Silman, to accompany Sifo Dyas. Valorum, though, says that Sifo Dyas was sent to negotiate with the Pikes concerning a gang war or something. So that's where Obi-Wan and Anakin go to speak with the Pikes. They are given an audience when they arrive, and they question the leader, Lom Pike. Quick question. Didn't the Pikes join Maul or something? Why the hell is that never referenced? What follows is a scene where Anakin and Obi-Wan question Lom. Anakin notices that Lom is wearing the Republic A necklace of Silman and grabs it. Okay, so he's been wearing that necklace specifically for over a decade? This is literally done so they can make things easier for the good guys to put two and two together and find out that the Pikes had something to do with Sifo Dyas and Silman's disappearance. This is incredibly lazy writing. I also want to remind the writers that it's been over 10 years. Has Lom been wearing that same necklace for that long? Do you want to know what possessions I had 10 years ago that I still do that isn't stuffed away somewhere? My wallet. I got it on my 8th birthday, I believe, and I've been using it ever since. I haven't found a need to replace it, and I imagine in any other universe, I would have replaced it by now. There's no way he'd still be wearing that necklace. He realistically would have had it hidden away somewhere, like a collection or something. I don't fucking know. This is so ridiculous. They only did this to progress the plot. Couldn't they find another way, perhaps? Also, you gotta love how no other Jedi ever in those 10 years ever met the Pike leader and noticed he was wearing that necklace. Well, Lom decides to tell them everything. The man that Jango mentioned, Tyrannus, hired the Pikes to shoot down Sifo Dyas' ship. And when retrieving the body, they only found Silman, and they've been keeping him ever since. Anakin and Obi-Wan discover that the man is locked away and insane. They tried to extract information out of him, but who should show up but Dooku? He was contacted by Lord Sidious to tie up this loose end. So Dooku confronts Anakin and Obi-Wan, and it's here where they break canon again, having the three fight again. My god, do you have zero regard for the films, Filoni, or what? How loose could your continuity be? Well, on the upside, the dueling music is pretty cool. I think it's way too intense for the context, but hey, it's still cool. The Pikes back up Anakin and Obi-Wan and slip out information that Dooku is Tyrannus. Really, guys? And then Dooku kills the Pike leader. And it's gone. Then Dooku escapes. What a way to ruin an entire episode. With that information that Dooku orchestrated the clone army, the Jedi still trust the clones and in fact, they don't seem to go any further into it. And then the episode closes. What the fuck? This is the dumbest revelation that the Jedi decided not to act on. They don't dive deeper into the clones. They of course reason that Dooku ordering the clones would lower Republic morale, but also decide to keep it a secret from other Republic officials. Oh, but just wait though, they learn so much more in this arc that just hoists the red flag above everything incoming. Like seriously, Jedi premonitions be damned in that case. That's how red flaggy it is. Well, fortunately, episode 11 managed to be way better, only ruined by a terrible ending. So let's get into it. This is the episode where Yoda hears the voice of Qui-Gon Jinn for the first time in years. Liam Neeson reprises his role from the Mortis arc. All of this deeply troubles Yoda. For once, he actually shows vulnerability and weakness. I thought this was really interesting. Yoda is pretty much never a protagonist, unless it was the comic or novel specifically about him, but aside that, Yoda is not traditional protagonist material. Well here, they actually managed to do that. They lean more towards his cheeky nature in The Empire Strikes Back, but that's still Yoda, even if it's much later in the timeline. Yoda did have slight, subtle quips in Revenge of the Sith, I recall. Well, anyways, only he can hear the voices. No one else on the council can. He's sent up on a checkup, where he's found physically and mentally fine. So he decides to be put on a chamber with low oxygen to better communicate with Qui-Gon, and with that, Qui-Gon tells him to travel to Dagobah. Yoda is in concern for the other Jedi, and so Yoda looks for an unlikely source of help. Anakin Skywalker, someone who always disobeys the council. And that moment I was just like, oh ha ha, you got me there show, that's clever. 
Anakin assigns R2 as Yoda's pilot as he leaves the Jedi Temple. And with that being said, he makes his way to Dagobah. Now, I thought it was kind of iffy to have R2 visit Dagobah before the Empire Strikes Back. It can be argued that R2 is just letting Luke figure things out on his own, so I guess I can overlook it. But soon, it's overshadowed by something else. Qui-Gon tells Yoda to follow a bright light into the dark side cave. And Yoda proceeds to see a vision of the future. And it's here where I was immediately taken out of the episode when I was so invested. They ruin all the build up to present us with Yoda being banged straight in the head hard and getting the clearest warning that Order 66 is coming. Way to ruin that plot point from Yoda's perspective. On top of that, he didn't tell the council ever before it happens. What the fuck? There have been attempts to explain this plot hole from channels such as Geesley's and Generation Tech, but neither could come up with satisfactory explanations. They always explained it off as Yoda seeing the writing on the wall, and what difference would it make? That still doesn't explain why he didn't warn the Jedi. Even if the event was inevitable, you'd still want to see the best outcome possible. AKA, as much Jedi survive Order 66 as possible. This, I really hate. Also, if you want to point out another retcon, if Shark T getting impaled like in Revenge of the Sith's deleted scene is to be taken at face value, then that contradicts the Force Unleashed, as Shark T canonically died on Felucia after being defeated by Starkiller. Not even a mainstream video game released only a few years ago when this episode came out was safe from Filoni. Worst cowboy in the world. To be honest, Nothing was. The show could contradict the films and Filoni wouldn't bat an eye. But anyways, let's get on with the next episode. My feelings on the next episode was actually pretty good. But like the last episode, it was ruined by something. The episode is called Destiny and it concerns Master Yoda going to an uncharted planet powerful in the Force. This place is interesting from the get-go. The design is pretty reminiscent of what you would expect with something that is pretty much the embodiment of the Force. He gets R2 to stay somewhere nearby once he lands, and comes across a mystical Force before meeting four others, identified as the Force Priestesses. The Force Priestesses basically embody different emotions, and opt to teach Yoda the secrets of manifesting himself after death. According to the behind the scenes stuff, apparently Qui-Gon Jinn learnt from these priestesses too, but was unable to complete his training, as he was called with his apprentice Obi-Wan to the planet of Naboo and the Phantom Menace happened. Well basically here, Yoda encounters two tests. The first is facing the dark side within him, in the form of an evil version of himself or something, and Yoda quite easily conquers it though. A bit too easy. But then I remembered that Yoda would understand a lot about the Force and adhering to its will. The second test is much more interesting, and this is the one episode where it gets more and more interesting. The other good episodes in the Clone Wars may have good consistent quality, but this is actually surprisingly good in the sense that it draws you in more and more. So basically, Yoda sees an illusion of the temple in ruins and takes the hand from one of the students from the Younglings arc, where he's taken to a utopian version of the Jedi Temple, where he sees everyone is alive and well. He sees Count Dooku and Qui-Gon and other background characters like Barriss Offee before the Clone Wars fucked her over. Yoda realizes the trick and tells the illusions that this is all an illusion, a future Yoda wanted but will never get. I like how straightforward this is. What I hated about the Mortis arc is that there is no clear meaning. And on top of that, they didn't seem to understand the Force as that, as they literally took the balance the light with a dark misconception at its extreme. Well, at least in this episode, I didn't pick up on anything that was contradictory. To be honest, the Force Priestesses were a bit iffy, but if they're beings that are anchors to the will of the Force, then they can kind of get away with existing? Maybe. The thing that ruined this episode was them getting a certain planet's name wrong. The Force Priestesses tell Yoda to go to the homeworld of the Sith for the final test, but they call it Moraband. What the fuck? Everyone knows that in every other story ever, it's called Korriban. Well, apparently Dave Filoni has a 
really dumb explanation for the name change. He says that if Carban was cornered off and made obscure for a thousand years, then the name would change in that time, right? Wrong. Stories before, during, and after the Clone Wars as a time period refer to the planet as Carban always. Dark Empire takes place six years after Return of the Jedi, and the planet is briefly featured as Carban. I think it's clear that Filoni played some Knights of the Old Republic at the surface level. Maybe, and assumes that Carban was never visited in anything after, even in the general time period of the films, and he was dead wrong. Seriously, did no one tell him anything? Well, the good news is that we're almost done with season 6, so let's look at the final episode and see if there's anything else they fucked up. Well, Yoda heads to Carban, and that's what I'll call it since that's his actual name. Well, Yoda goes onto the surface, and presumably goes to the Valley of the Dark Lords, but let's be honest, would Filoni actually know what that is? Of course not. It's shown that Darth Sidious and Darth Tyrannus opt to trick Master Yoda and attempt to break him elsewhere, and the episode makes it clear that this part is not an illusion. But for illusions, there's plenty of them. Some shadows of the Sith or something pester Yoda, and then comes a really stupid cameo. In what turns out to be another Sith illusion, Yoda meets Darth Bane. As someone who read the entirety of the Darth Bane trilogy recently, I can tell you all that's wrong with this cameo. First, his appearance. Darth Bane never wore anything like that. From the moment he became a Sith, he was either a simple robe or the orbalisk armor made up of parasites that attached to his skin. But never anything resembling generic armor like that. What's funny is that they actually designed a Darth Bane model for the Mortis arc that resembled the Orbalisk armor. So what the fuck happened to that? Why did you create a new model that completely fucks over his design? Two, this is meant to be Darth Bane's tomb on Korriban, although it is extremely unlikely that he would have a tomb on Korriban, as Darth Bane died on a planet called Ambria, and I presume his apprentice Xana would have buried his body there after she killed him. I don't imagine she would be nice enough to go to Korriban, build a tomb for him, and then bury him there. The Valley of the Dark Lords were reserved for mostly the original reigning Sith Lords who were buried by their followers, and Darth Bane was a very secretive Dark Lord. Information about him only leaked to the Jedi once, and even then, information on him was limited. Thirdly, Based on information given in the Darth Bane trilogy, I doubt the Jedi would have ever known that Darth Bane was the creator of the Rule of Two. The reason I say this is because, again, he was a secretive Dark Lord with his existence only slipping once to the Jedi. Now, apparently, Bane is mentioned in the Phantom Menace novelization, but I don't know the context of his mention, and after reading the Darth Bane trilogy, I always presume that the Jedi learned of the Rule of Two through rumors from when the Sith was still in hiding, and not during Darth Bane's lifetime. Well, point is, they got a bunch of stuff wrong, and it's clear Filoni never read the Darth Bane trilogy. He doesn't mention anything specific. Maybe only as much as what George Lucas wrote for the outlines of the Phantom Menace backstory. So I was immediately taken out of the story with Darth Bane's quote-unquote cameo in this show. The Orbalisk armor appearance, or anything actually resembling him would have worked, but I guess Filoni just went with generic armor, and here we are with this dumbass that nowhere near resembles Bane. All he talks about are the basics, how the Sith destroyed themselves, and he created the rule of two. Nothing about his former identity as Death Soul, nothing about serving in the Sith army, nothing specifically mentioning the Brotherhood of Darkness by name, nothing about why he destroyed the Sith to reform it, or anything else covered in the Darth Bane trilogy. Like Filoni, EU law buffs are right there listening and waiting for you to make the references, but you gave us as much information as a filthy casual would know. So I'm sorry, Filoni, it's going to take a lot more than that to convince me you know your Star Wars shit. But let's be frank, he doesn't. Well, Yoda overcomes the illusion, and then is given passage to the stairs underneath Bane's non-existent coffin if Filoni actually read the damn Darth Bane trilogy. Yoda is then faced with the final task, 
facing Sidious through an illusion alone. At first, an illusion of Cypher Dias tries to tempt Yoda, and then when that doesn't work, Yoda is placed into a scenario where he and Anakin take on Sidious and Dooku. Yoda refuses to compromise his morals and whatnot, and so Sidious and Dooku fail to break him. The action sequence was pretty cool and whatnot, and Yoda acts as a Jedi while still taking on Sidious, so that's good writing. Aside from that, the fight was straightforward and decent. With all that done, the Force Priestesses tell Yoda that Qui-Gon will contact him and be his mentor. Yoda returns to the ship and goes back to the Jedi Temple, where again, he neglects to mention anything he just did in detail, dooming the Jedi Order. So that's a rather weak ending. And that's Season 6. Man, these reviews are killing me. Filoni just further and further descends into breaking more rules, and it's extremely annoying how little regard he has. The inhibitor chits were there so he could just pretend to give an explanation to a non-existent plot hole. The Clover shit, I don't even know what the point of that was. Mace Windu and Jar Jar didn't progress the war, but it was fun and easily the best arc. And the one where Yoda learns to become a Force Ghost had its moments, but ruined by awful story decisions and continuity errors every so often. The following episodes were an improvement, but failed to completely save the arc. All of them had weak endings that killed my investment at the end, obviously. This is actually the last part of Filoni's work that can be considered a part of the George Lucas era. We all know that the show after this was cancelled, and Filoni moved on to Rebels, using one of his terrible ideas for the Clone Wars for Rebels, and butchering the original trilogy more than the prequel trilogy. I still intend to get to Season 7 next, and then I'll do Rebels. I know demand is high for me to do Rebels, and believe me when I say it's almost ready. I just need to do Season 7, and then we'll be set. For now, Season 6 was... Bleh. It's probably one of the better seasons. I guess I'll give it a 4.8 out of 10. There are some things to enjoy in Season 6, but the continuity is just as bad as ever. The inclusion of Darth Bane specifically was absolutely pointless, as they only brush over what everybody fucking knows about him. He founded the Rule of Two. Yeah, we know Filoni. Give us something more specific. Well, at least we know that if Filoni had gone deeper, he would have cocked up his actual backstory and made a crappy replacement story that's nowhere near as compelling as the Drew Carbishan novels. That's the best that Filoni can do to be accurate. Well, get ready, as for next time, it'll be the last time I'll shit on Filoni in relation to the Clone Wars. His best show I hear, but still not that good. Be ready. With that being said, that is my complete review of the Clone Wars Season 6. I'm Ginger Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories about mystery boxes? Season 7 is the final season of the highly overrated Star Wars The Clone Wars. We all know about how the show was cancelled by Disney, and then they brought it back just to wrap things up years later. But Disney just did the bare minimum. Extend the show to one final season, make one arc to set up a crappy spin-off show based on characters created by Dave Filoni and George Lucas, who really needed some more pre-planning and revisions to them. The second arc is considered to be the worst in the entire series by even people who like the show, and the third and final arc is the one arc everybody cared about for a while, but aged like piss when you stop to think about what actually happened and how. It's been a long journey from the Clone Wars movie, all the way to each season individually reviewed. I kinda generalized my Clone Wars movie in Season 1 reviews, and my mindset on the show certainly has dramatically changed. I intend to recap my general recurring points throughout this series, and pinpoint why the Clone Wars is the most overrated thing in the Star Wars franchise. Even before I turned on the Clone Wars show as a whole, I considered this the worst season. Whether that's still the case, I intend to find out through a rewatch. Dave Filoni has taken the number one spot for my most hated Star Wars consultant since Ryan Johnson. I commonly call him the overrated cowboy. 
That stupid hat he wears, his trope of always pointing to George Lucas whenever he does something wrong, the fact that he cares more about making his own story than adhering to George's or anyone else's are the main points to why I hate him. I remember back when I was still expanding my knowledge on Star Wars, and I didn't know the extent of Filoni's antics. I said in terms of candidates to take over Kathleen Kennedy, Filoni seemed like a cool guy. I regret ever saying that. Filoni isn't cool, he's a pretentious, uncaring, overrated hack, and he's been given way too much control over Star Wars. Filoni has a massive advantage over other authors who have contributed to Star Wars because he was given control over something way more mainstream than a novel or a comic, a television series that aired on Cartoon Network. The final season of The Clone Wars was distributed on Disney+, Plus, so that's the only exception. How convenient that the shittiest season is also the one made under Disney. Like, The Clone Wars is commonly thought to be Disney Star Wars before Disney Star Wars, but this being made while Disney was in charge is just icing on the shit cake. So with that being said, are you ready to find out how much this season blows dick? You might be thinking that since this is the only season that isn't an official part of the Expanded Universe, that I won't be complaining about retcons. To that, I say... WRONG, SIR! WRONG! So let's check out The Clone Wars Season 7 at last. The first arc is dedicated to the Bad Batch. As I said, the Bad Batch were conceptualized by Dave Filoni and George Lucas, and I think they really needed some improvement. But we'll get to that. So episode 1 of this season is called The Bad Batch, which further emphasizes the incoming presence of those cop-outs. Alright, so the setup for this arc, via the narrator, explains how we're in another battle with no context. If there's anything The Clone Wars doesn't change, it's poorly mapping out the war. The show just drops us into a scenario, and it's impossible to tell who is winning. Anyways, the attack is led by Anakin Skywalker and Mace Windu. We see that for continuity, Anakin's got his new hairstyle. Now, this might sound incredibly nitpicky, but how convenient that Anakin changed his haircut in the final season. They literally only did this to line up with Revenge of the Sith, but face it guys, you have misrepresented the films so many times. I wouldn't be surprised if you changed the movies itself. Oh boy, we'll get to that. Probably the first yet only praise this season will get for me in a while is the improved animation. I wouldn't have minded if the quality was the same from season 6, but the fact that the animators and whoever rendered all this did their damnedest to aim for peak quality is amazing. It's no modern Pixar movie, but it's the best I can imagine this show being, given its art style. My criticism is given this is the shortest season, this seems like the bare minimum to wrap up the show. Season 6's end still felt like there was a lot left to go over. Plenty of battles and important stuff to happen. This is probably because the amount of unfinished episodes outnumbered the release Season 7 episodes, but it shows in Season 7 feeling rushed in this regard. This is a general criticism. So I'm going to say that it feels like we get some Anakin and the Clones time, then Ahsoka, then combines the three in the final arc with Ahsoka as the main character. As much as I don't like this show, it doesn't feel like enough. With that being said though, let's see what this episode has in store for us. On the planet of Anaxus, which is where the battle takes place, our first scene is dialogue with Mace Windu and Anakin Skywalker in the general vicinity, which is extremely iffy since they did not get along in the movies. Commander Cody and Captain Rex come in, and it's established that the Republic is losing the battle, which is laughable to me, given they won every single battle in the show. So to try and convince me they might lose this battle is utterly ridiculous. Apparently, the enemy is adapting to the clone army's tactics and can effectively counter them. Apparently, losses on Anaxus are high, which I don't recall ever seeing. I just realized that we're dropped into the battle. It would be nice to see the whole battle, but I guess that's just too hard to write. It reminds me of how with Ahsoka, for example, she didn't get any on-screen character development. They just switched her personality a bit in between seasons to give you the illusion of good character development. This is absolutely lazy, but since this is a season with the shortest amount of episodes, what the hell do you expect? So, Rex proposes bringing in a squad behind 
enemy lines and attacking a cyber center to disobey relay orders, blah, 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 blah. And Anakin and Mace Windu approve. We see a scene of Rex in the barracks reflecting on the war, given it's nearly over. I wouldn't be able to tell who was winning unless I was told, given the show's simplistic writing when it comes to battles and events. So Cody walks in and discusses how Rex seems troubled. And he talks about the tactics the Separatists are using are based on the battle plans he and Echo, remember him, drew up when he was still around, and he flaunts the possibility that Echo survived. I hate this scene, because it actively just teases the return of Echo, presumed to have died on the Citadel, actively announcing ahead of time that Echo survived. I've commonly said that this show has the worst plot twists and reveals, because you can always see them coming from a mile away, and this show just never surprises you. It's pathetically predictable. This is not how you build up to something like this. The way this is presented, it's so easy to guess that this isn't false hope. Now, I know this is based on an unfinished Clone Wars episode, which also would have introduced the Bad Batch. I have not seen those unfinished episodes, but I have heard a synopsis of what happened in them, and I was far from impressed. Echo was a mediocre character. To me, he was the same as Fives, as they both became ARC Troopers. I could not tell the two apart if my life depended on it. Also, I find it weird that there were zero hints towards Echo being alive prior to this point. Especially since Admiral Trench, the puppeteer I presume, was in Season 6. Well anyways, when Rex... Cody and two others named Kix and Jesse, who I couldn't give two fucks about get out of the barracks, they finally talk about the squad that's going to assist them on the mission. The squad in question flies recklessly into a landing pad, causing chaos. So that's the first thing in the long line that contributed to me hating the group that is called the Bad Batch. First impressions mean a lot. And the first on-screen appearance they ever have is them recklessly landing a shuttle. Cody explains that they're defective clones with desirable mutations. Basically what this means is that we get the most cliche, stereotypical, and tropish assholes in the history of fiction. Just by looking at them, you automatically assign a certain stereotype to them. So yeah, there being four of them, they are the most unlikable clones in the whole series. I found other clones to be mediocre, but these clones I actively despised. So yeah, we've got the Rambo clone, the Brainiac clone, the dumb brute clone, but Last, but certainly least, there's the one I like to call... The fucking sniper! Yeah, you guys knew I was gonna do that joke. It's my favorite recurring gags alongside Bobby Fat and Saw Gerrera in the Partisans. This episode moving forward had little of value, aside from being season zero for the Bad Batch spin-off show. Like, think about it. They only introduced the Bad Batch here, where they have nothing important story-wise, aside from a group of narcissistic, arrogant assholes who show off constantly. Then they immediately announce a Bad Batch spin-off show. I'd like to imagine what Dave Filoni would have done if the Bad Batch were received as poorly as those twin sisters will get into in a bit. The way they did this was so lazy and poorly written. Like seriously, only one arc in the season is actually important, and that's the final arc. Believe me, I was extremely tempted to just skip to the end for the sake of it. The two arcs preceding the last one are just filler. The first was just a spin-off that nobody fucking cared about when it was first announced. The second happened to be one of, if not the worst arc in the entire show, and that's saying something given the low bar this show has all the time. This is what I mean when the Clone Wars Season 7 was the bare minimum Disney did to wrap up this show. And there are still plot lines that are incomplete, given they only made 12 episodes, less than season 6. The most blatant example is what happened to Asajj Ventress. Ventress took up a decent chunk of the show as an antagonist, so what the fuck happened to her? Who knows? 
I doubt Dark Disciple is even a valid answer, given Filoni's tendency to retcon stuff, even if they're based on his own outlines. Plenty of stuff fails to come full circle by the end. Well anyways, the more the Bad Batch are on screen, the more I come to hate them. One of the many things they get wrong in this introduction is telling rather than showing. To give you a rundown of how they introduce the Bad Batch, they banter about their names and abilities, and they tell us that, for example, Tech is the brains of the team. And then they give us the most stereotypical display of intelligence. A character like Peter Parker was always more interesting because that wasn't all there was to his character. Tech just comes across as some emotionless scientist. Rekka as a Another example is touted out as the big and tough one. There is zero subtlety. It's easy to explain why these characters don't work, but for some reason, they have their defenders, and I couldn't tell you why. Their douchey behavior in this episode is always passed off by fans of the Bad Batch as just phase one, and that their flat out unlikable nature was to show their transition when they transfer into clones without a purpose, blah 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 blah. When Omega is thrown into the mixer, it becomes a lot worse. But for now, I hate the Bad Batch as they appear in this episode. Arrogant, narcissistic, disrespectful characters that give characters intended to be hated like Micah Bell or run for his money. Every time they open their mouths, I wish I could just slap them in the face and tell them to shut up as they agonizingly just open their annoying mouths and I got sick of them. The briefing doesn't improve these characters. It's very clearly established that the Bad Batch looked down on non-mutated clones, calling them regs. Doesn't sound too bad, but the way they say it is the most douchey, pretentious name I've heard anyone call anyone in this show. Further adding to how much I hate these idiots, we also get the classic, we're on the same sideline from Cody. Well anyways, the gunship is shot down and crashes on the surface on an axis. And it's here where we see Rekka be the most annoying of the lot. He cheers that the transport is going down. Seriously, are the Bad Batch so much intentionally trying to relieve tension or something? Because the tension was so lacking in this episode. It feels like a run-of-the-mill clones do a mission episode. Wrecker again complains about how much regular clones suck. Cody is trapped underneath the gunship, so Wrecker moves in and lifts the gunship over to save Cody. This is perhaps the first even remotely likable thing the Sad Batch do in this entire entire episode. Shame that we're almost a third through the episode, and putting up with them was insufferable. Seriously, who the hell approved a spin-off show with these characters? They were thrown in, just to tease a spin-off show, and they do the bare minimum with making us like them. I also want to point out how Rekka says boom, and then a split second later the gunship explodes. Seriously? So anyways, a small legion of droids marches in to attack, and the Bad Batch literally runs towards them and goes ape shit on them. I suppose this part is just to show the overconfident, show-off nature of the Bad Batch. Yeah, just because they know they can do things, doesn't mean their narcissism is okay. I just want to mention how Rex earlier in this episode reflects on all the brothers he's lost as the war is coming to a close. Then the feeling is ruined when the Bad Batch come in and treat war like a game. This reminds me about how one of my primary school teachers teaching us about World War I, and she made a point to mention how in the real world, soldiers who came back from war wouldn't come back talking about how cool the explosions and the guns were. they come back talking about their horrific experience, talking about lost friends, the terrible conditions in the trenches, and having to shoot at their fellow man, that sort of stuff. Now obviously the clones are conditioned to take a lot, but I always found it annoying how casual they treat war in whatever situation. I don't know, it seems off. Now toning down the violence is fine, but I'm starting to wonder why the Clone Wars is regarded by its fans as a deep, non kitty show or whatever when you have crap like the Sad Batch. It boggles the mind. So anyways, the team heads out to the location of the Cyber Center, presumably, 
after the battle. They set up a camp at night, and it's here where I come to hate the Sad Batch even more. That being that they pick a fight with the clones that aren't them. The only remotely likable one is Hunter for trying to defuse the fight. I somewhat suspect that the Sad Batch are knockoffs of Delta Squad. Key difference here is that Delta Squad weren't a bunch of narcissists who thought that they were hot shit just because. They had common tropes about them, but they weren't stereotypes. They had actual character and chemistry with each other. Last of all, they did not talk talked down to their allies. Republic Commando was mostly focused on the team, with the only real supporting character being the advisor that gave orders. Plus the loss of Sev at the end was infinitely more compelling than what the Sad Batch did with Crosshair, but that's a discussion for another time. In this same sequence, it's established that Hunter has heightened senses. I think it's kinda convenient that the desirable mutations all happen to be something different, yet useful. Maybe that's nitpicking, but I started wondering why they all end up like cliche stereotypes. So anyways, the team hikes out an outpost near the cyber center and ambushes the droid forces there. The action sequence to take the outpost is meh. There's no tension here. But then again, this is supposed to be a casual sequence, so I don't blame them. Brain Clone says once he checks out the outpost's terminal, that the Cyber Center has minimal guards. When I heard that, I fucking knew that would just be so it can be easier for the clones to get in. Well, fortunately, they make up for that by saying that there's a legion of droids coming into the area. And so we see another meh action sequence of the clones fighting the droids. And here, this feels exactly like a video game. There's one long shot of the Sad Batch barging in and taking out the droids. It resembles a co-op video game. Let me say firsthand that the Sad Batch would have made a better video game than a TV series. And maybe that's because they ripped off Republic Commando, but still. Basically, Brain Clone and Rex get into the terminal at the Cyber Center, and what do you know? We get confirmation that Echo is alive, as he signals his number. Well, I'll be damned. Just kidding. Them announcing this earlier on the episode spoiled any potential surprises. This is literally only the setup for the next episode. So after escaping, that's the episode. Poorly written, only existed to set up a spin-off show, and the only improvement for a season pilot is the improved animation. So with that lackluster start, what comes next? The following episode starts with Anakin Skywalker getting briefed on the intel. Then we get a scene where Anakin tells Rex that he needs to do the thing. What's the thing? Well, it's a horror movie directed by John Carpenter and I'm just kidding. He's talking about contacting Padme. Wow. Classic example of having little regard for the films. It's clear Padme in Revenge of the Sith had no contact with Anakin while he was out fighting the battle droids and leading armies. There were whispers that you've been killed. I'm alright. This is around the hundredth time this show doesn't abide by the movies very well. Filoni just makes up his own canon because he feels like he's the one who created Star Wars. At this point, I wouldn't be surprised if he's convinced himself that he created it and it's his story. Also, Padme is visibly pregnant and Anakin doesn't notice. Further dampening continuity. They so badly wanted Padme and Anakin to have their moment. They wanted emotion first and continuity second. Too bad the conversation Anakin and Padme have is possibly okay, and not worth sacrificing continuity. Rex serves as a lookout for Anakin, and Obi-Wan approaches the barracks, and Rex has to improvise and make an excuse for why he can't let Obi-Wan in the barracks. This wingman shit doesn't even work, because as soon as Anakin's done talking, Obi-Wan knows exactly what's going on, expressing that he hopes that at the very least, he told Padme that he said hello. Anyways, on the mission to Skako Minor, because apparently that's where Echo is, as referenced in the last episode. So the crew land on the planet, and are immediately ambushed by the natives. And like a magpie's aggressive nature, a flying reptile controlled by natives swoop in and take Anakin for a ride. Hunter grapples onto the reptile, and follows them into their village, and this all leads to them negotiating with the natives. Of course, tech can translate what they're saying, because of 
course they can. And they're able to get a scout escort to the Separatist facility under Wat Tambor. Yeah, this show puts Wat Tambor back into the show after who knows how long. All I have to say about this opening sequence is that it's fine. Certainly nothing special. The Sad Batch also managed to be less annoying than in episode 1. Oh, at least until our debate about whether Echo's alive, given the signal is fading. Crosshair provokes Rex, calling his friend just another reg, and deservedly gets the shit beaten out of him. The Sad Batch were asking for this fight. I'm wondering if the conflict is supposed to be the Sad Batch and the other clones working together, but it's done in the most lazy way, by having them actively pick fights. A difference in strategy or thinking would have made a better dynamic, but this shit is just forced. Anyways, Anakin and Rex have a private discussion, and it's another pointless attempt to plant the seed of doubt of Echo personally being dead. Sorry, show, you're not fooling me, or anyone for that matter. You pushed Echo's survival so much that you failed to create a plausible fake-out. So they go to under the facility, and they aren't detected for some reason. I know it's a sandstorm or whatever, but I think it's problematic that the Separatists don't have sensors or heat scanners or anything. We also hear that dumb brute wrecker is afraid of heights. Seriously? Well anyways, a lot of them storm the facility taking out droids, which look nothing like the standard B1 units, and I have no idea why these droids look so different, but whatever. They trace the signal after a lot of searching, which, let me just say, this all feels like a video game. To be honest, a lot of stuff with the Sad Batch in it feels like a video game. The show is animated that way. It feels too much like a combo shooter brawler spammy video game whenever the Batch destroy droids. Eventually though, Tech and Rex slice into the area of Echo's signal, and predictably, they find Echo alive, but not well. Echo last recalls being at the Citadel, and it's here where they close Episode 2. Episode 3 focuses on the escape. Echo is shown to be underweight and lacking an arm, replaced with a slicing thingy. The group here are cornered by the Techno Union, and it's here where Echo, despite not knowing where he is, somehow knows the way out of this situation. Which is a case of the writers forgetting what they previously set up in the last episode, as that is why Echo asked Rex where he is. Despite the fact that Echo should be utterly clueless, they open up the exit, and the solution to getting up there is Wrecker throwing up the other clones with no warning, adding to the reckless stupidity of Wrecker, which makes me dislike him even more. Anyways, they blow the lab on their way out. Echo tells them about a way to escape, where they balance across a pipe of sorts, all the way to the other side. Since Wrecker is afraid of heights, we get some painfully unfunny dialogue from him. Since they tried so hard to make him a tough guy, his performance by D. Bradley Baker isn't convincing enough to persuade me he's actually terrified. It's mostly just played for laughs. This episode doesn't have much substance though. Since they are cornered on both sides and jump onto the reptiles the natives tamed, going back to the village and easily convincing the natives to fight with them, despite them wanting nothing to do with the war. So they repel the invaders. They even take out two spider droids at that. And well, I think that's pretty much it. Anakin and the natives shake hands, and we're expected to believe the Techno Union won't wipe out the village later as revenge. They just ignore realistic implications, which is something the show does often, just wrap stuff up without substantial conclusions. And that's episode 3! The spectacle was okay, but again, it felt too much like a video game. The way this show is animated has that problem a lot, doesn't it? That's why I keep saying that this would make a better video game than a TV series. So episode 4 starts up by recapping prior events, but at the same time, lazily sets up a fake out conflict. The episode tries to get us to question Echo's loyalty before the episode even started. Like seriously, the narrator says this, and for that, it's pretty lazy. 
This is something the episode is pulling out of its ass. Because I suppose with Echo now back in Republic hands, the Republic is pretty much guaranteed to win and turn the battle in their favor. I already knew the Republic was going to win because they always win in this damn show. Especially now since this is at the war's end. Also, this is probably nitpicking, but why did the Separatists equip Echo with a slicer arm if he was intended to be closed in a stasis pod? Especially since later in the episode, he can pretty much slice into everything. It was only his mind they needed, correct? So why the arm? That seems really gimmicky. Almost like... Hmm... I wonder where they are taking Echo. Anyways, they board the Sad Batch's ship, and Echo tries to trick the Separatist fleet that it's an allied ship trying to dock. What infuriates me is that the droid can clearly see it's not an allied ship, but as soon as Echo changes the ship's signal, it thinks it's an allied ship. The droid doesn't even question it. This is literally only done to make things extremely easy for the good guys. As now I wonder how many times I've said that. In parallel to this, Mace Windu and Obi-Wan plan to take the assembly plant or whatever on an axis. Mace Windu pointlessly tries to reason with the droids, telling them to surrender and they'll be reprogrammed to do something more domestic. I don't even understand why Mace Windu did this. It's not funny or clever from a presentation standpoint. They skip over a scene of Anakin and the clone sneaking around the ship, and they cut right to making it to the comm vault, where Echo gets to spread the pain around. Of course, at this point, they're still trying to make us question Echo's allegiance, and I hated this. This was the most pointless fake out I've ever seen. Like I said, it's an artificially inserted conflict the writers pulled out of their asses, because let's face it, episodes like this have zero tension. There's a bunch of bullshit where Echo and Tech fake their signal to appear from Skako Minor when Trench decides to contact the Techno Union for a strategy. I love how we don't even see the Techno Union respond to Trench. They decided not to inform Trench that they lost Echo because profits and avoiding looking bad at all costs. But this is just negligence. This episode just became really annoying to watch. Echo continues to be ambiguous with his allegiance on purpose instead of immediately assuring everyone that he's Republic, through and through. Well anyways, Echo shuts down all the droids on Anaxis before Mace Windu and Obi-Wan have to fight the next legion of them. So Trench goes for a backup plan. He tries to activate a bomb at the assembly plan. Mace Windu goes to defuse it, and Echo tells him the combination. But conveniently, he is stunned before Mace can tell him the last number. So Anakin storms the bridge quite easily, and forces Trench to give him the final number. Trench gives Anakin the final number, which isn't a lie, and then he tries to trick shot Anakin when he isn't looking, and Anakin impales him. And it's gone. Trench's death barely got any emotion out of me. He was a villain the show threw around around season 6 after he was presumed dead. I suppose this show has Anakin execute an unarmed prisoner, but I was just thinking about how conflicted he was after deciding to kill Dooku, someone he'd hate way more than Trench. I don't know, there's no self-reflection. Trench just dies and that's the end. He's never brought up in any relevant sense. Nothing would change if you replaced Trench with some other Separatist commander. When the crew get around to escaping the ship, they push the suspension of disbelief too far, with Crosshair quick shotting the droids with utmost precision. This is kind of the reason I hate the Sad Bat show. Even if they lost Crosshair, these guys are just great at what they do, and they've got no problems. Wrecker gets the button to blow up the Separatist fleet, and the Republic wins again. As if there was any suspense, which there wasn't. It's another episode of the Republic winning Fire the Show's formula. So after distrust from the Sad Batch, they offer Echo a place on their team, and Echo laughably decides to join them, despite the amount of disrespect he faced from all of them. This was literally only done so that the Bad Batch show wouldn't flop, because now Echo is joining the team, and he's the only character fans actually care about. Not Rambo, not Dumb Brute, not clone, and certainly not the fucking sniper! Before the Bad Batch came out, it sparked a little bit of hope in me, which dropped quickly as I saw that Echo was just there for group activities. But that's a discussion for another time. So hopefully, I've explained why the Sad Batch arc was utter crap, underwhelming, 
undercooked characters that only existed to have their own spin-off. You know, they should have just followed the formula the Clone Wars had of having several characters during the Republic Imperial transition period, instead of focusing it all on the Sad Batch. For the record, that seems to be something Rebels should have done too, but that's a discussion for another time. So the Sad Batch arc sucked, but you know what? It's fucking Oscar worthy compared to the following arc. Let me say firsthand that after watching the first episode of the Martez sisters arc, that I just knew I was in for a drag. Seriously, people say that the arc with the droids and that small frog dude was bad. Ironically for me, that was a passable arc, which is saying something given the low bar the show has. This arc, as a matter of fact, is one of the worst arcs in the entire show. Let's start with the premise. This is the aftermath of Ahsoka getting kicked out of the Jedi Order. The episode starts with a whole load of shenanigans, with Ahsoka's speeder busting up, and her crash landing into the repair shop of one of the most insufferable characters in the show. Apparently, I looked into it, and the character in question was based on a character from the unfinished episodes of Star Wars The Clone Wars before the show was cancelled. It was an Asian dude that was supposed to serve the same story purpose as the dreaded Trace Martez. One thing I have to say is that when you're given one final foray into the show, but you've only got 12 episodes, you chose a story arc no one would give a shit about. You could have chosen from a variety of arcs from scrapped ideas, but you chose this. This is utterly ridiculous. Looking at credits, this is one of the arcs Dave Filoni himself personally wrote. Very talented if I do say so myself. Anyways, the entire episode is Ahsoka and shenanigans with the Martez sisters. Let's talk about it. After Ahsoka crashes, she meets Trace, who is very on and off about charging her for help. This episode is filled with a whole load of nothing. For a couple of minutes, it's just Ahsoka and Trace talking about random bullshit. Something I questioned is how the Martez sisters don't recognize Ahsoka. For someone who was accused of bombing the Jedi Temple before being acquitted, and being put on trial in front of the whole Republic at that, I'm asking why Ahsoka isn't all over the news. Like seriously, you have no idea who Ahsoka is when she introduces herself? The Jedi Temple bombing was a big deal. But aside from the opening of that episode, in which the narrator talks about it, it's never mentioned. Maybe that's why events are so poorly mapped out. Never does one event lead to another like a domino cause and effect, so nobody knows who Ahsoka is. Great. A dude and his two goons barge in to collect a debt that Trace's sister Rafa owns them. There's this dumb sequence where Trace gets the shit beaten out of her and Ahsoka steps in, acting like an absolute kung fu master. There's even a certain move where she kicks a certain goon in the nuts. Afterwards, we're introduced to Rafa, who seems to be a bad influence on her younger sister. Trace in particular, you'll realize is a bumbling idiot, and unlike Jar Jar, it's a detriment to the plot. Rafa is contracted to build three droids, and so Ahsoka and Trace get to work on building the droids. I'd like to mention that we're over the halfway point in this episode, and so far not much has happened. The real meat and message of the episode seems to be a reflection on Ahsoka leaving the Jedi Order and finding her place in the world and blah blah. But in the first episode, there doesn't seem to be really any commentary on it, and ultimately proves uninteresting. Well anyways, one of the droids go rogue and rampages across the lower levels of Coruscant. Pretty much the only compliment I'll give this episode is that the droid is well animated actually. Well eventually, after a moderate chase sequence, they turn the droid off, and Ahsoka saves Trace from falling to her death and other people witness Ahsoka use the force. So yeah, that's the episode. With what little conflict there was being resolved as apparently, Rafa paid off the one she owes money to. Yet the second episode managed to be much, much worse. There's literally no conflict in it until the final minutes of the episode. Plus, this episode is full of stuff we've already seen. So basically the opening of this episode has Rafa says that she hired a pilot who bailed out. So now she has to look for her sister for help, since she built a ship from scratch. 
even though she has no experience with starships. It's kind of like when Rey rebuilds the Millennium Falcon, even though she have no idea how to. And if she did, why stay on Jakku? Why not go look for your parents from out from the stars? Well, anyways, they take off. And Trace makes her first mistake by flying towards the Republic ship. Even though Ahsoka tells her to steer clear from that, and she doesn't listen. We even get a cameo from Anakin, who senses his apprentice on that ship, and orders Yolara not to arrest those on the ship. Aside from that, this episode is a slow drag. That goes on and on and on. Again, the middle arc of season 7 could have been anything. But they chose this. Disappointing as always when it comes to the show. So as it turns out, Rafa's high job is to quote unquote pick up medicine. And the episode is very on the nose with the fact that Rafa is just leading all three of them into trouble. At this point, the Martez sisters make up reckless and stupid. One gets them into a problem, another makes a problem worse through poor decisions. If you know the episode, you know we're building up to that moment. So yeah, a royal family on Kessel or whatever contracts the three to carry unrefined spice from Kessel to where the Pikes live. We've got some more slavery undertones, which I've established season 4 didn't really do justice to. Plus we see a Zygerian, which pretty much confirms the slaves of the Republic arc definitely did not have the happy ending despite them trying to frame it as such. It's a lack of the show earning anything. Throughout this episode Ahsoka was referencing the risk of pirates. And it's here where I wish Hondo Anaka made an appearance as he's one of the few characters in the show I love. But the show couldn't even give us that. An opportunity wasted. Especially since this episode is so dull. I was just sick of it. Seriously, writing this part of the script was so hard. Maybe even the hardest parts I was forced to write about this show in this whole review series. At this point, season 7 may very well be the worst season of this show. And it's only got one chance to redeem itself. Well, back to the episode, when Ahsoka learns they're delivering to the Pikes, she and Rafa have an argument, and Trace, because she's an idiot, and hearing that the Pikes will probably take her ship, decides to eject the cargo out mid-hyperspace. You have got to be fucking shitting me, show. Trace, because she's an indecisive bitch, just doomed all three of them. All three characters at this point I just hated with a burning passion. Ahsoka I hated for a while before, but the Martez sisters are just straight up garbage. All three become even more hateable. For some reason, they decide to confront the Pikes instead of hightailing the fuck out of Pike space. Also again, I gotta wonder, I thought the Pikes joined Darth Maul. Maul won't show up until the final arc, but it confused me on why Maul's criminal syndicate wasn't mentioned. Well, I knew where this was going. Ahsoka tries to mind trick the Pike into letting them leave with the money, but of course they're figured out and imprisoned. So yeah, for the following episode that could have been skipped entirely, but since they want to waste our fucking time, they instead have them be captured due to all three characters being incompetent. Seriously, as dumb as Trace is, I don't know who's even more stupid this time around. Well, anyways, we see the trio naturally go to prison. There's actually some action and some spectacle, and unlike the first two episodes, it actually doesn't take forever to get started, if the previous episodes even got started at all. Trace escapes on her own from the torture chamber, which given how stupid she was prior, I'm surprised she managed to trick the guards. Ahsoka uses the force on the locks to escape, which makes me go, wait, why didn't you do that earlier? So yeah, the trio meet up, and baffingly, despite the Martez sisters not being established as being trained with blasters, they decently take on pikes, as well as Han Solo takes on stormtroopers. This is so lazy, with power level inconsistencies. But hey, we've got a worse one coming eventually. I should also mention how the Martez sisters have a sob story, in which they say the Jedi wronged them, and blah 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 blah. It's clearly done to tie into the arc where Zero the Hutt was freed. Since I don't care about any of that stuff, especially since that arc did characters like Quinlan Voss dirty. It reminds me of The Last of Us Part 2 actually. I haven't played that game, 
game, but from what I hear, the character of Abby was an afterthought inserted in the second game to be the daughter of the nameless Dr. Joel killed in the first game, so that we could have the plot that Neil Druckmann wanted. Now obviously you can introduce stuff that wasn't alluded to in a previous story when making a sequel, but you can't make it a forced part of your sequel. The Last of Us Part 2 tried too hard to make a deep philosophical statement to one-up the first game that other games have done better. You know, since people consider The Last of Us Part 2 parallel to The Last Jedi in gaming, I'm considering doing a review on those games. I've got a PS5, so I know I can. Let me know if you'd like me to talk about The Last of Us on the Forgotten Games channel, or maybe the HBO show. I haven't done any reviews on that in a while. Anyways, the trio run all over the place, fighting pikes, and when they're almost home free, Trace still has an obsession with getting a ship back that they get captured at the end. Spectacular stunt, my friends. But all for naught. They end up exactly where they started, and the episode ends there. This might have been their only opportunity to escape, and the Pikes would definitely ensure that they won't escape again. I hope. I'd also like to mention that they had some setup for the final arc by having Bo-Katan of all characters see Ahsoka. Oh great, now she's gonna play a role in the show again. Let me guess, she's going to slap Ahsoka's butt cheeks again. Fuck off, show. You are beyond trying to convince me that Bo-Katan doesn't deserve to end up anywhere but prison. Let's just get on with it. At least we have one more episode with the Martez sisters before we get into the really juicy stuff. So after being captured like a bunch of buffoons, Ahsoka bargains for the sisters to leave and get the spice while she stays behind, where she'll be executed if they fail to turn up the spice. So the Pikes literally let the Martez sisters go on their ship and leave, which I think is really stupid. I'm pretty sure if they can come up with one plan to escape that maybe almost worked, they can come up with another. Ahsoka because she has the force and goes onto a weapon storage room and grabs some thermal detonators, intending to blow everything the Pikes have, or at least part of what they have. And it's here where Ahsoka learns about Maul, as she spies on him talking with the Pikes. Oh, so there's Maul finally. I was wondering where you were during season 6 and the previous episodes when the Pikes appeared. Now I'm really confused. Kenobi along with Anakin visited the Pikes last season. Why didn't Maul call for them to be captured? By season 6, I assume the Pikes broke off with Maul's criminal empire or something. Because there's no way- Oh, forget it. This show has sloppy continuity, not just with external material like the Expanded Universe, but also with itself. You also want to know what the Martez sisters do? They go back for Ahsoka. But first, they intend to steal Spice from the Pikes, with the intent of bringing it back to the Pikes for them to let Ahsoka go. This is a plan so stupid that thankfully it doesn't work, but in the meantime, they harass a bunch of cargo workers. The poor dudes are forced to load the Martez sister's ship, and when the manager comes by, a Trandoshan, with the intent of beating the shit out of the sisters, and they unintentionally made the workers who are just doing their jobs more likable than the Martez sisters. Man, I hate this show a lot, don't I? Ahsoka also looks at a communication log and finds out Maul is on Mandalore before being captured by the Pikes who find out she's a Jedi. Despite the display of Kung Fu mastery, she essentially stops the flow and gets stunned and knocked out. By the way, Ahsoka gets knocked out so many times in the show, it's not even funny. The Martez sisters return, but the Pikes just decide to execute all three of them. But then the devices blow up, conveniently giving the trio an opportunity to escape, and the trio easily escapes at that. This is a scene where the sisters find out Ahsoka is a Jedi, but the revelation for the sisters doesn't go anywhere. They just make up once they do escape, and then Bo-Katan shows up, requesting help from Ahsoka. Ahsoka decides to help her after encouragement from the sisters, and so on and so forth. That's the Martez sisters arc. There was pretty much nothing about this arc I liked, at least stuff that I was supposed to like. The characters were the worst part. 
Fuck the Martez sisters to hell and back. They were a detriment to the story, and they should have had massive rewrites. Even then, this arc was a massive waste of space that no one liked. Even the most hardcore defenders of this show don't like this arc. Maybe some will have excuses for its existence, but other than that, Nobody cares about this arc. Some say you should just watch The Siege of Mandalore, and I agree. But will The Siege of Mandalore be that much better? In my rewatch, I was nervous, because back when I liked this show, the final arc was amazing. But then immediately after, people say the season is overrated, and the cracks start to form immediately. It's sort of like The Force Awakens for me. It takes other people pointing out problems, and me rewatching it, that the whole thing just falls apart so easily. I wonder what I liked about it in the first place. The Siege of Mandalore is pretty much the only noteworthy thing in Season 7, aside from setting up the Sad Batch. Because let's face it, I'm betting a lot of people just skipped to the Siege of Mandalore. I actually skipped the Martez sisters arc just to get to the good stuff. Oh how poorly that aged. I am sweating bullets for this arc. This is the finale to Star Wars The Clone Wars. I've rewatched every episode and season plus The Clone Wars movie. Now without further ado, prepare yourself for the Siege of Mandalore. The episode starts with Anakin and Obi-Wan in the midst of Outer Rim sieges. Originally it's just Obi-Wan and his legion fighting the droid army on what looks like the Golden Gate Bridge. Seriously, that's what it looks like, until the cocky Anakin shows up, intending to turn the tide of the battle, with a passing line that he and Captain Rex already finished their battle elsewhere. So Anakin comes up with a plan to defeat the Separatists. You want to know what that plan is? Why it's committing another war crime, of course. False surrender. The droids a second ago were ready to blast Anakin. But they held their fire when Anakin told them to, which is convenient. Also, given the amount of war crimes Anakin and Obi-Wan had pulled during the Clone Wars, it's strange to see their tactics don't turn against them. Like, wouldn't it be nice to see the more they break the conduct of war, the less the Separatists fall for their schemes and they have to improvise? This might actually show that the pair have to tactically innovate and stuff. Because tell me, What's the difference between how the war went in Season 1 versus this very moment in Season 7? There's very little. This is a very cookie cutter war because of poorly mapping it out. But this is just the cherry on top of lackluster writing. This doesn't feel like a war at all. Anyways, Rex and the 501st ambush the droid army and the Republic wins again. That's probably the last time I say that and I'm probably gonna miss saying that. So let's have a heartfelt goodbye to the last time I say that. So yeah, after turning the tide, Anakin and Obi-Wan are called back into orbit because Yolaren has a surprise for them. Of course, Yolaren doesn't tell them who it is because they wanted a dramatic reveal. But let's be real, who else could it be but Ahsoka? When I saw her again, I just fucking cringed. To be honest, what was the point of the start? Anakin and Obi-Wan are pretty much minor characters in the Siege of Mandalore arc. I understand that they're off doing Revenge of the Sith, but what's the point of the start if they're barely in it? Also, before we go any further, I want to tell you a very fun fact. Dave Filoni is the sole writer for this arc. That's right. He came up with a story all by himself. He had no help from anyone else. It shows too. Filoni usually has a co-writer or two in the other stuff he's written in relation to the show, but here, he's wrote this solo. I think that's interesting because it contextualizes the failure that is this arc. Let's rip into Filoni's crap. So yeah, Anakin and Ahsoka reunite again. I want to bring up that pretty much everything in this arc contradicts the Ahsoka novel, written by E.K. Johnson to tie into Rebels. That novel was released in 2016 and was retconned nearly four years later in this damn arc. Just like a bunch of things, this novel was based on Filoni's own outlines, reading Wikipedia to get a grasp for the retcons, and there's quite a bit of them. I just looked into how little regard Filoni has for other creators' work. If it wasn't made by him, it isn't canon. Not even the films, because Ahsoka gotta have some relevance to them, and her vocal cameo in Rise of Skywalker 
isn't enough. People have debated what the unofficial canon hierarchy is, given Disney having kept their promise of all content being equal with each other. At this point, I'll tell you what the canon hierarchy is, especially in the mind of Dave Filoni. At the top, we've got Filoni canon, which is everything Filoni made, plus his warped perspective of the films. Not even the films in their pure state, rather just how Filoni sees the films. Then below we have everything else that is non-canon. If Filoni didn't make that, then it doesn't exist to him and is open to retconning. That's the Disney canon hierarchy. Anyways, Ahsoka and Anakin meet. And I just love how Anakin is the excited one and Ahsoka is the calm and controlled one in this interaction. So basically Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, Anakin and Obi-Wan discuss how the Republic can give aid to Mandalore. Obi-Wan naturally rejects the offer because all it's going to do is start another war. And Bo-Katan being the T-word that she is doesn't care and selfishly is like, sure, let's have another one. Yeah, that adds to my point about Bo-Katan not earning the good gal status Dave Filoni so desperately wanted her to have. I also love how Bo-Katan uses her sister to grandstand Obi-Wan. So far, Bo-Katan is acting like a manipulative villain and it further adds to my distaste for the character. They're not even trying to distance us from when she was in league with Osama bin Vizsla. Thankfully, Obi-Wan's judgement is not clouded by his grief. Good. He says that it's all up to the council. Then Bo-Katan turns to Ahsoka and says, I told you this was a waste of time. What a fucking bitch. As if she wasn't hateable enough. There's a brief exchange between Anakin and Ahsoka, where Anakin has a surprise for her. Something he prepared for her in advance. There's a small exchange where the clones salute Ahsoka, and Anakin tells her that it's out of respect, despite her being a civilian now. Then we see the weirdest scene in this episode, where a detachment of the 501st Legion apparently painted their armor after Ahsoka. Like seriously, Rex and the troopers' helmets have the same color scheme as Ahsoka, that being orange and blue and white and stuff. The first time I saw this, I was like, what the hell? It's just a gripe, but who paints their helmets after the skin color and anatomy of their soon-to-be commander? I almost imagine this was a felony decision. Just have clone troopers who fetish over Ahsoka as much as he does, because we have the status quo to fulfill. Alarms blare off in the ship, and Obi-Wan comes in, informing Anakin that Coruscant is under attack, pretty much kicking off the plot of Revenge of the Sith. We all know Anakin and Obi-Wan are going out to kick ass and have their tragic journey loved by many. As Obi-Wan prepares to go to Coruscant, Ahsoka interrupts and attempts to grandstand Obi-Wan for abandoning Bo-Katan and the Mandalorians. Obi-Wan objects that it's the Republic capital under attack, and that people on Coruscant need them. But Ahsoka, because she's an inconsiderate little bitch, rudely tells Obi-Wan that he's playing politics. This isn't about the people on Coruscant, this is about the Chancellor. Yeah, as so many people pointed out, this scene frames Ahsoka as the correct one for calling out Obi-Wan, and that Obi-Wan in turn is just mansplaining. But Obi-Wan is actually correct. Going to Coruscant instead of Mandalore is the right call. The people of Mandalore are not under any immediate danger, and Coruscant is full of countless people. Over two trillion in fact, plus... Something weird about Ahsoka's remarks here is that she doesn't care about the Martez sisters, who are very likely on Coruscant during this attack. Ahsoka is incredibly selfish to just brush off the attack as, oh, you're just saving the Chancellor. Also, something I want to point out, it's only now that we know Ahsoka's personal distaste towards the Chancellor, which will immediately be contradicted in a later scene. Obi-Wan points out that she's not being fair, and Ahsoka responds that she ain't trying to be. Yeah, so the scene of Ahsoka grandstanding Obi-Wan fails. Ahsoka always has to be right even when she's dead wrong. So immediately after, Anakin proposes promoting Rex to commander and getting him in a division of the 501st to accompany Ahsoka. Oh great. You know, before Star Wars Rebels, I always assumed Rex was one of those unnamed clones storming the Jedi Temple with Anakin. That headcanon of mine made the most sense. Then of course I saw the inhibitor chips bullshit and realized where Filoni was going with this. Rex is pretty much a commander in anything but name. Seriously, what did Captain Rex do that identified him as a captain during the show? Absolutely nothing! Why didn't they call him Commander Rex? Did Filoni just think Captain Rex sounded cooler? 
I don't know. It's something that always confused me about the show. I also want to point out that they haven't even figured out the logistics of what is essentially a Republic takeover. In one scene, they're talking about how it could start a war, but now they skip over the plot thread and Ahsoka gets the troopers she needs. So yeah, they just ignore all that. The show is always fails to earn anything. So the last present Anakin has for Ahsoka is her old lightsabers, now with the color blue. Wikipedia points out how the Ahsoka novel describes their final exchange as completely different, with Anakin warning Ahsoka about Maul's merciless and crafty nature. Here, we get no such thing. All Anakin says is a good luck, and so that's where Ahsoka and Rex go with Bo-Katan to do their raid on Mandalore. To be honest, where this arc peaks is in the music and spectacle. Seriously, both of these are excellent actually, and prevent the finale of the show from being unwatchable. Maybe that's why I liked it the first time. They're actually a good distraction from the piss poor writing. So I guess the presentation too was pretty good. It's just that when you stop to think about it, does it make zero sense? Sometimes bad writing flies over my head because the presentation is good. JJ Abrams is very good at disguising his poor writing on the first watch. But eventually, the poor writing was going to come out on further observations. Well, anyways, on the way to Mandalore, they are contacted by Prime Minister Almac. Almac, of course, points out how Bo-Katan is invading the planet and violating a treaty. Bo-Katan, of course, says that she doesn't care, and hence the invasion commences. Something about this scene gives the vibe that Almac is in the right somehow. Also, the way they talk to each other, wouldn't Bo-Katan already know that Almac is a puppet of Maul, given he accompanied Maul in that confrontation with Osama bin Vizsla? I also hate the line where Ahsoka tells Bo-Katan that she's nothing like her sister. It's the way she says it that takes me out of the story. So as they aim to fly straight to the capital of Sundari, Ahsoka does the most overpowered moves I've ever seen and kicks everyone's ass. Seriously, the way she just breezes through the Mandalorians, slicing and dicing is ridiculous. Let me remind you that Ahsoka is 17 years old. Well, aside from that, the spectacle is pretty cool. It's still baffling that Ahsoka can take on a dozen plus Mandalorians by herself before reinforcements show up. After securing their position, Bo-Katan intends to face the Prime Minister, while Ahsoka intends to find more. There's a trace to him in the Undercity apparently, and so Ahsoka and the troopers go across the tunnels. Meanwhile, Bo-Katan overwhelms and captures the Prime Minister who, despite his age, actually puts up a decent fight. Almec, when questioned, tells Bo-Katan that Maul intended for them to come, but they brought the wrong Jedi. Yeah, so Maul was banking on Kenobi showing up. Despite a clone trooper being able to contact Ahsoka from the Undercity, apparently Ahsoka's comms are jammed now that she's in the Undercity. Let's just assume going into the tunnels is what made her lose the signal. They of course get ambushed, and Ahsoka is the sole survivor, now surrounded by the Mandalorian commandos, or whatever the hell they're called. In comes Maul, where he says that he wanted Kenobi, and then the cliffhanger to the episode. He actually says, and I quote, I was hoping for Kenobi. So it seemed like his plan backfired. Looking at how this plan was set up, it seems like it would be a one in a million chance that Kenobi would actually show up, given the amount of Jedi there are. The episode doesn't really make it clear what Maul's specific plan actually was, other than drawing Kenobi out. Well, anyways, in the next episode, Ahsoka and Maul have a sort of standoff. Ahsoka secretly sends a signal to Captain Rex, which is a contradiction because earlier Bo-Katan couldn't connect with Ahsoka through the comms. Also, this is an extremely easy way out of this confrontation. Ahsoka being trapped and alone was the cliffhanger to the first part of this final arc. But now it turns out she can call for help. Ahsoka's plot armor is through the roof. Also, Maul contradicts his earlier line about hoping for Kenobi by saying that he was certain that Kenobi would have come. I love how unintimidated Ahsoka is at that. She's cornered and surrounded and staring death in the face and she remains calm and stoic. We also get extremely iffy writing when Maul seems to know a lot more about the Sith Grand Plan than he should. 
He also spills the name Darth Sidious to Ahsoka, and oh, this is why Maul spent his time monologuing. It's so Rex and the other troopers could show up and save the day. Seriously, this is worse as when Savage was a foil for Maul to express his evil plans to. At least he was Maul's brother and ally. Ahsoka is not. Maul should have just killed her, but since we got to delay the plot for this epic confrontation that they save for later, he spills a bunch of beans he shouldn't even be carrying. Maul was an assassin who was supposed to obey the Emperor's bidding, nothing more. I'm surprised that he knows anything about the grand plan. Sidious probably would have just sent him on missions and expect Maul to follow blindly. Well now Maul is on the run. They search for Maul in the tunnels for less than a minute, and Ahsoka just gives up the search on a whim. I'd like to see Ahsoka in a corn maze going for the give up gate. Anyways, Ahsoka returns to the main hall or whatever in the city. Apparently the clones have effectively eliminated major threats on the planet, but Maul still must be captured. Ahsoka mentions Darth Sidious, and Obi-Wan literally shares the whole story behind that name with everyone in the room. Not just Ahsoka. So Bo-Katan and Rex listen in too. Then Kenobi, despite revealing Jedi affairs to a neutral party, decides to speak with Ahsoka alone when she asks for what Anakin is doing. Ahsoka shouldn't be allowed to know any of this since she's now a civilian, but Obi-Wan gives her the information anyways. Like seriously, Filoni. Pretty much the only point of Ahsoka leaving the Jedi was so that you can make her even cooler without any of the drawbacks. Ahsoka's just that perfect Mary Sue, isn't she? So Obi-Wan tells Ahsoka about Anakin's secret mission to spy on the Chancellor. Despite Ahsoka not liking the Chancellor in the first part, she objects. Also, I noticed that Ahsoka has practically no response to Anakin killing Count Dooku. They're just brushed aside because fuck it. I also hate how Ahsoka's being forced into the plot of Revenge of the Sith. That movie was fine without her, and I'm despising that she's just this character who narrowly avoids being seen or mentioned in the films. It's clear in that movie that not once was Anakin and Obi-Wan or anyone thinking about her, because she didn't exist. Seriously, this almost feels like Ahsoka is some sort of Black Ops agent who can't be alluded to once. Like, apparently she tells Obi-Wan to tell Anakin something, which I'm guessing leads to the scene from Revenge of the Sith where Anakin and Obi-Wan say their goodbyes before Obi-Wan leaves to face General Grievous. Anyways, Ahsoka is called back to the tunnels, and apparently Ark Trooper Jesse has been captured by Maul. We see, meanwhile, that Maul is mind-probing Jesse because he wants to know who Ahsoka Tano is. Is. Wait, so you don't know who Ahsoka Tano is? Then why did you recognize her earlier? Could this plot get any more confusing? Well anyways, Ahsoka and bo go to question the Prime Minister. Apparently, and for a reason I can't come up with, Maul told Armak a lot more than he should have. Armak reveals that it wasn't just Obi-Wan he wanted, but also another. Before he can talk, Maul's commando leader, Gar Saxon, snipes Almac, and in his final moments, he gives the name Skywalker to Ahsoka before succumbing to his wounds. And it's gone. Gar Saxon escapes during a brief chase sequence. We cut to Saxon returning from his mission, and we see Dryden Voss make a cameo through a hologram. As Maul tells the syndicates to go into hiding, this was pretty much done to tie into Solo, and probably Rebels too. Maul does an inspirational speech for the Mandalorians to keep fighting or whatever, and we cut to the people of Mandalore being escorted into a civilian shelter. Bo-Katan, Ahsoka, and Rex return to the throne room to see Maul there. Bo-Katan in particular tries to blast Maul, but he deflects the attacks and has her in a grip. But instead of crushing her and being done with her, he spares her. I presume this is a case of poorly written plot armor, so she can be around for Rebels and the Mandalorian. He also sets free Jesse. And I was super confused on why Maul would do all this. But apparently, once the explosions conveniently happen, and Bo-Katan leaves the room, having Ahsoka be in there alone with Maul, and Ahsoka doesn't call in any backup, because how else would there be tension? Maul and Ahsoka have that discussion. Yeah, this is the discussion where Maul admits he knows far more than he should. He confirms he knows about Anakin being his old master's new apprentice, in which he shouldn't know in the slightest, because he was a disposable assassin. 
Also, apparently, Maul had clear as day visions of it and wanted to prevent it by luring Kenobi along with Anakin so he could kill both of them. Maul also mentions Sidious grooming Anakin. Speaking of that, it's a shame we didn't see any of that in this show. You're going to need to watch the films for that. So much for the Clone Wars saving or redeeming the prequels. With that being said, Maul and Ahsoka have their fight while the clones and Mandalorians battle each other. It's supposed to be this big epic fight. There's just one problem. Maul should easily be able to kick Ahsoka's ass. Does he? No! Ahsoka is so overpowered to the point she can take on the Sith Assassin Obi-Wan struggled to defeat in The Phantom Menace and only won by exploiting the Sith's greatest weakness. Well, the fight begins, and the choreography is a big improvement actually, because apparently Ray Park himself did the mocap for Maul's fighting moves. Problem is though, it looks too much like mocap, and it looks out of place to how the show is usually animated. I also fucking hate the line after Ahsoka somehow holds his own by telling Maul, quote, you're lucky Attica did show up. The way you're fighting, you wouldn't have lasted too long. In the most pretentious smug voice I've ever heard from Ahsoka thus far. Maul is finding Ahsoka to be a challenge and I'm just taken out of the story. Maul and Ahsoka in their next direct engagement has Maul pin Ahsoka with his lightsaber. And right here, Ahsoka for real is able to kick Maul so hard that he flies out the window. It wasn't even a hard kick. It's like a light kick you might do to a soccer ball when you're bored. What is this? We actually see Ahsoka panting despite easily kicking Maul out the window. Yeah, you're not fooling me, show. Ahsoka makes it look so easy. I also especially hate when the clones are finishing up on the Mandalorians, and Maul denies Gar Saxon reinforcements. Maul and Ahsoka fight for the third time, and Ahsoka doesn't struggle in the slightest, and she actually manages to beat him after a tussle on the beams, and Maul is unable to catch his transport. What in the fuck is this? I love how despite Ahsoka gripping Maul with the Force, he doesn't even try to break free. Even as he tells Ahsoka to let him die. Then the Republic gunships show up to tie up and capture Maul. Maul begs for them to listen, in which Sam Witwer actually gives a pretty convincing and intense performance actually. But it's no use, and he's captured, and that's the end of the episode. So far we've got a lot of problems. Maul absolutely should have won this fight. This also contradicts the Ahsoka novel. In the novel, Maul was encased in a ray shield, and there was no fight that extended onto the beams on top of the city. But don't worry, there's only going to be even more contradictions if there wasn't already. Now, you can make excuses that Filoni had the right to do the final arc after it was cancelled or whatever, but this shatters the illusion of Disney canon being consistent. It's not. But with that, I think we should pretty much get into the next episode. In part 3, they're pretty much wrapping up the battle. Bo-Katan mentions how so many have failed to defeat Maul, which makes his defeat even more ridiculous given Darth Maul was defeated by a 17-year-old girl. That is pathetic. So anyways, Ahsoka goes to contact the Jedi Council. They literally play out that scene with, I sense a plot to destroy the Jedi. And right where it would cut away in the movie, we of course have Ahsoka walk into the transmission room, or whatever, to speak with them, further pushing the suspension of disbelief that Ahsoka narrowly avoided being in the movie. It's basically just more talking about Maul being captured, and Ahsoka doesn't mention what Maul said about Anakin. This scene does have Mace Windu tell Ahsoka that some matters are for the Council to discuss, us, unlike Obi-Wan earlier in the last episode. So Windu is doing the sensible thing, and Obi-Wan isn't. The next scene has Bo-Katan deliver Maul in case inside something a Force user would find difficult to escape. I criticized in Season 5 how this device would have been useful for Osama Bin Vizsla, but apparently Bo-Katan says this device is the last one. Extremely convenient. Bo-Katan and Ahsoka say their goodbyes, blah blah, and Ahsoka and the clones go to board the ship. The following sequence doesn't actually have a lot of complaints from me. They do the sensible thing and transport Maul to the Republic capital ship with Maul in a detention cell. 
the music and atmosphere is actually pretty good. It's pretty much the only time it feels natural to what this finale is building up to. There is minimal dialogue. Ahsoka and Rex talk about the war in a sort of self-reflection way. Like he wouldn't be here if not for the war. He owes his existence to the war starting. Keep in mind this is probably the closest this finale has to being deep on an emotional level. Well, immediately after, as Ahsoka is out on the bridge meditating in her mind, she hears this scene from Revenge of the Sith play out. They use archived audio from that movie, but then immediately after, but they had to ruin it with Matt Landis saying, What have I done? Yeah, I guess Hayden Christensen wasn't enough. Well, anyways, this is the Order 66 part of this episode. The show creates new rules. By having Captain Rex resist the inhibited ship somehow, he tells Ahsoka that she needs to find out about fights before shooting her. Two of the nameless clone goons blasted Ahsoka and Ahsoka deflects their shots and kills them. Keep this in mind for later. So Ahsoka despite being wholly unprepared and outnumbered somehow escapes through creating an entrance through the ceiling. I've already spoken about the big problems with the inhibitor chips and how many plot holes they create so I'm not repeating myself. I explained everything in my Clone Wars Season 7 review. Rex announces that the Jedi are to be terminated for treason, yada yada. And of course, I wanted to go back to the Ahsoka novel. This pretty much contradicts everything. Order 66 in the novel was issued on Mandalore, and that's where Maul escaped. And then Ahsoka and Rex faked their deaths after escaping. I've also heard that a line in Rebels pretty much says that Rex already removed his inhibited chip. So it's clear that's how Rex helped Ahsoka escape. I have not read the novel, and I probably never will given Ahsoka has now rendered that an utter waste of time. Well, since Filoni ignored continuity, he went for emotion first and continuity second. And he pretty much failed at the emotion at that. Well, anyways... During the search for Ahsoka, Rex orders that Maul be executed, and the two clones aim to do just that, until Ahsoka steps in and force pushes the clones, and then she does the most reckless and selfish thing I've ever seen Ahsoka do thus far. She releases Maul, as she intends for him to be a distraction and to cause chaos. Yeah. She's letting this scumbag go with the potential to escape because she wanted to avoid Order 66. Obviously they wanted an excuse for Maul to be alive because Rebels exist, but since Filoni wrote the story into a corner, he couldn't come up with an intelligent way for Maul to escape. You know, this is why contradicting the Ahsoka novel was a grand mistake. I hear that novel only did a bunch of flashbacks to the Siege of Mandalore and didn't specifically describe a lot of things, but what it did describe was different to this arc. How embarrassing is it that another writer who didn't even prioritize the Siege of Mandalore in her novel does the Siege of Mandalore better than your series finale specifically about it? Keep in mind that the novel too was based on Filoni's outlines. Anything Maul does from here on out is Ahsoka's fault because she let him go. She also literally says, go cause some chaos, that's what you're good at. Yeah, so the reckless Ahsoka is basically doing what she can to save her own skin. Well, since she let Maul go, Maul proceeds to go on a rampage, killing a ridiculous amount of clones. He even severs an arm of one of them on a closing door. Ahsoka takes her opportunity to find out about Fies, and then she finds out about the inhibitor chips. So she goes over and knocks out Rex, intending to remove his chip. Yeah, again, Filoni is going to completely miss the point of Order 66. It's to be expected that he doesn't understand the films. Ahsoka locks the doors where the droid she paired up with locate and remove the chip, to where Rex with his chip removed fends off the clones and shoots a few of them. Rex after being brought back to normal tells Ahsoka when asked that the entire Grand Army of the Republic has the chip inside them. I've spoken about how lazy the inhibitor chips are, how they're a convenient plot device for Filoni to avoid having his favorite clones obey Order 66. I don't care if Rex initially obeyed it, 
He should have obeyed it to the end. Oh boy, the Sad Batch series already created new convoluted rules to all this. But for now, just know that this is all poorly thought out and written. So in the next episode, Ahsoka tells Rex to set his gun to stun. I'm wondering what the point is by now. You let Maul go free. It always bothered me how it was only Rex that Ahsoka saved from the influence of the inhibited ship. That's all I'm gonna say, because the arc becomes even more ridiculous. Maul enters the hyperdrive room, and after killing all of the clones, he destroys the generator powering the hyperdrive. This, of course, causes the ship to go out of hyperspace and go into orbit on a random world. Ahsoka, I would also like to mention, told Rex that she let Maul go. And of course, Ahsoka's recklessness isn't even addressed here. They go to the hangar controls or whatever, and they plan to make their escape. Well, it turns out the clones were waiting for them, and now they have them completely surrounded. This is where the utterly stupid exchange between Ahsoka and Rex happens. Ahsoka says that she doesn't want to hurt them, and Rex goes on about how these clones are his brothers. Ahsoka takes off Rex's helmet and talks about how he's a good soldier, and so is every clone down there, but she isn't going to kill them directly. Yeah, I'm sorry Ahsoka, but you let more go. So the clones he killed and the ship going down is on you. Well, Ahsoka comes up with a plan. What's the plan you say? Well, it's the dumbest one. Rex goes down with Ahsoka as a hostage and uses the loophole that since Ahsoka is no longer a Jedi, she's exempt from Order 66 on a technicality. Of course, the clones don't listen and a fight ensues. Maul in the chaos takes this as an opportunity to escape, and despite some resistance from Ahsoka with the Force, the overwhelming amount of clones forces her to let Maul go. It's still your fault that Maul escaped Ahsoka, I hope you remember that. Ahsoka make it down to the maintenance area of the hangar and find a working ship. They narrowly escape the capital ship and it's here where we've got our final scene. This is supposed to be what the finale was building up to. And given the amount of crap we had to go through, none of it is earned. Everyone on board the capital ship died in an instant. And it's gone. Ahsoka and Rex decide to bury the bodies of the clones who died. Ahsoka looks at the greys, and it's never hinted that she realized it was her fault. Because once again, she was the one who let Maul to escape to begin with. This is framed as if Ahsoka is only grieving for all the troopers lost, and not the fact that she is responsible for their deaths. I'm just thinking back to Sam Raimi's Spider-Man, and how Peter realizing it's his fault that his Uncle Ben was killed, actually affected the story in a pivotal way. It's a lesson he needed to learn that with great power, Power comes great responsibility. Here, there's nothing, and I doubt there's anything in Rebels, given Filoni retconned a small bit from Rebels and a lot from the Ahsoka novel to get here. We see a final scene where Vader and the Imperials show up, and the scene is meant to show Vader discovering Ahsoka's lightsaber, given she left them earlier, and that's the Clone Wars Season 7, the absolute finale to the Clone Wars. I could not be more disappointed at this whole show. I started thinking it was going to get better after season 1, but then the show just declined in quality and it got worse and worse. Season 7 is the worst season of the show in my opinion. One arc was nothing but set up for another show, another one was filler, and the last one was the only one of value, but it's too bad Filoni didn't put any value into it. It's been a long journey from where I started this series. I started with the Clone Wars movie, and I reviewed all 7 seasons. Now that this show I generally dislike is over, I never have to review it again. Many recommend I watch the series in chronological order for the best experience, but honestly, I'm done with this show. I'm not watching it ever again. I thought I would enjoy the rewatch. This was a show I really liked and binge watched the first time, but after widening my Star Wars range, reading comics and novels, and looking at how The Clone Wars was made, this show has aged terribly. Let's go over the main problems. First, continuity errors, either with the films or the expanded universe. Second, changing characters to appeal to prequel haters. Third, a poor roadmap of the war. We're just dropped into a scenario all the time with no context. Fourth, bad writing. The only arc that comes the closest to holding up was the Reiko Hardeen one. Fifth, Dave Filoni. I think you know what I mean by that. As I've said many times, the Clone Wars being some of the best Star Wars content is false. 
It's nowhere close as a matter of fact. I've played Knights of the Old Republic, read the Darth Bane trilogy, seen Revenge of the Sith, read a bunch of the comics, including Tales of the Jedi. The Clone Wars to me is probably low on the list, but it's not that low. This show is practically Disney Star Wars before Disney Star Wars. This show only succeeded because George was willing to invest in it because he didn't mind that he was losing money. That never would have passed under Disney. If it's not making money, they'll can it. In fact, they'll sometimes can things that do make money. Remember how Disney originally cancelled this show? The show has aged extremely poorly. If you didn't understand why I grew to dislike this show when I started this, well, hopefully you do now. The Clone Wars is the most overrated Star Wars content in the franchise. The difference between this and Empire Strikes Back is that I actually like The Empire Strikes Back. I do not like The Clone Wars. This show in general seems to be mutually liked by prequel fans and haters alike, but I suppose the category that doesn't like it is the hardcore expanded universe fan. I attribute my reassessment to reading more content. That's probably what made me realize that other content is Eon superior to the Clone Wars. I know I have a stereotype about less experienced fans tending to grow misconceptions about Star Wars, but it's true. A movie and TV shows fan will probably think the Clone Wars is the best. I used to be in that camp. When I was younger, I was mostly into the Star Wars games. Knights of the Old Republic, Republic Commando, Battlefront, Jedi Knight, etc. Those were my jam when it came to Star Wars. But video games are still on the casual level in my opinion. Novels and comics is where you go deeper. Learning about how much continuity Clone Wars broke, and how hard it was for those like Leel and Chi to explain all the retcons, was heartbreaking. I've heard it was also because of a planned continuity reboot, but I've said that they should have just left the expanded universe alone and make a new Star Wars universe, also based on the films. That would have been so much easier. As for Dave Filoni, he's pretty much the dominator at Lucasfilm nowadays. He's the go-to guy for continuity even though he's terrible at it and he always gets away scot-free. I hope he's mitigated and they get someone better soon because all he's doing is turning Star Wars into the Ahsoka Tano story. There are many who think Filoni's gonna save Star Wars and that he would never just make Star Wars his thing instead of George Lucas's. That's what he does! That's all he does! You can't stop him! So that is my complete review of The Clone Wars Season 7 and my reflection of the show in general. Now, obviously, this isn't all of the Clone Wars. I should probably also talk about Star Wars Legacy, consisting of cancelled episodes, as well as the comic Son of Dathomir and the novel Dark Disciple. If there's a high enough demand, I'll do them, but I'm not very interested in doing them, given my distaste for the show, so keep that in mind. There's also a bunch of crappy video games like Republic Heroes, which will probably come at a later date. For now, this is my complete overview of The Clone Wars. All seven seasons, plus the movie, I hope that's substantial enough. Also, I would like to mention how I'm planning to do both Star Wars Rebels and The Sad Batch at the same time. I'll be watching both and doing my review on both at the same time. I suspect The Bad Batch will come first, but just keep in mind that Rebels won't be far behind. There's been a lot of demand for me to do Rebels, and all I can say now is that I'm open, but please remain patient. Watching and reviewing episodes in detail takes a while. I'm probably going to work on Crimson Empire or Darth Bane immediately after this, though. That's my complete review of The Clone Wars Season 7, and the conclusion to the entirety of this show. I'm JJ Plagiarisms, and until next time, what are stories for mystery boxes? Rocking a mountain.